9. I want to visit the sanctuary, Anda abruptly declared, just as Keisha set her plate and cup down and joined the little group around the table he shared with Shandi and Darion. Shandi smiled at her sister and shrugged slightly. Darion kept eating. How do I go about doing that? Catch a disease, Darion offered. Anda was looking at Darion, but it was Keisha who answered seriously, ignoring her breakfast for the moment to shoot Darion a look of disdain. The meal was too hot to dig into immediately anyway. She might as well deal with Anda. She wasn't at all certain that he had learned the lesson of impatience. If he's going to the sanctuary, though, I'm going along. I suppose I can take you there, she said. When do you want to go? She already knew the answer, of course. Anda had been running at full speed since the moment he arrived, and not even the exhausting welcome week had kept him from what he saw as his duty to integrate himself into the life of vale, village, and tribe. Today, if possible, Anda had taken a frugal breakfast of fruit and bread. Keisha wondered how he could accomplish so much on so little food. Her heartiest meal was breakfast. Are there any new patients there at the moment? There are always new patients there, Keisha sighed, but with envy rather than weariness. Except in the dead of winter, the sanctuary gets a new group roughly every fortnight. If what you want to see is northerners fresh from the wilds and tired to the bone, that's exactly what you're going to get. She took an experimental bite of her own breakfast of stuffed mushrooms. They were cool enough to eat, and she didn't want them to grow cold. She gave Darion a glance. He took the hint and picked up where she left off. He's almost done with his breakfast anyway. If I don't get something to eat soon, I'm going to start tearing out throats. The ghost cat people sent up a couple of messengers to the tribes they were related to, Darion explained, fully aware of how irritable morning hunger made Keisha. His meal was all made up of things that wouldn't be spoiled by getting cold, and he had no problem talking around bites of food. Those tribes have been spreading the word that there's a place of healing down here, but they are being careful the word doesn't get to tribes like Blood Bear. Those were the barbarians that overran Erald's Grove. Either we were lucky or very careful. Those tribes seem to have gotten a lot of strange diseases out of the change circles up north. We were careful, Anda said, after swallowing the last of his own breakfast. After the scholars at Haven figured out the pattern for where the circles would pop up, people were told. No one went near them until they'd been checked over. Sometimes they were sterilized by fire if need be. But things still got away, Darion pointed out. Animals, insects, some creatures we never could identify. We know that, and it happened here in Valdemar. My parents hunted all kinds of bizarre things that came out of those circles. I'd have to say we were lucky, Anda. We could have ended up with the summer fever and wasting sickness as readily as Ghost Cat did. And bless poor Justin, but he would have been the first to admit to this. The healer we had at the time wouldn't have had the power to cure it. But he would have the power to call those who did, Anda said firmly. Furthermore, those he called would know the right steps to take, not only to cure the disease, but how to keep it from spreading further. Keisha, when can we go to the sanctuary? Will this be an overnight trip? Keisha hastily swallowed the last of her mushrooms, Overnight, yes, but longer than that, no, and we won't have to pack anything, but I think we ought to go first to Ghost Cat, so they can explain how they deal with the pilgrims. They are the ones who are most involved, after all. You ought to see how this is benefiting all of us, not just the Northerners. If we leave now, we can go there, then to the sanctuary, then be back by nightfall tomorrow. Then I'm ready, Anda stood up. 
Shandi. Ready enough, Shandi followed her senior's example. Carlos says he and Iran will meet us at the Vale entrance. He'll have Tercel send a Dihili for Keisha. Keisha could have allowed the two heralds to go on their own. There was no reason why she had to come along. One of the Dihili at the Ghost Cat Enclave could readily guide them to the sanctuary without Keisha's help. She didn't want to do that. She didn't want to take the chance that there was some serious illness, even a plague, in the early stages at the sanctuary. Anda was perfectly confident in the abilities of the sanctuary healers to deal with such a thing, but the sanctuary healers would not be paying a great deal of attention to the healthy heralds. All of their interest was bound up in their current patients, and it might not occur to them that the heralds were exposing themselves to danger. She, above all, knew just how focused healers could be. When dealing with an incipient crisis, they concentrated on the problem in front of them to the exclusion of all else. Whatever ills were being treated at the sanctuary, Keisha would be there to note the symptoms and the cure, and if Shandi or Anda, or both, showed any signs of illness, she would be able to treat them before either of them sickened too far. She would have the sense to get them isolated and keep them from the rest of the Vale with the help of the Hertasi, who could not catch human illnesses, she could get them through whatever they caught. Besides, I want to see what's going on there. For that chance, she was willing to make the trip. She hadn't been to the sanctuary in person for well over a year. When they reached the Vale entrance, both companions were waiting for them, already saddled with their lightest tack. With them was a single Dihili for Keisha. There was no need to pack anything, as they would be spending the night at the sanctuary, which was more than prepared to host visitors. It wasn't as if they hadn't had healthy people there before. They'll probably be glad to see someone who doesn't need help, and healers are even more implacable than heralds. If Anda's in the way, they won't hesitate to push him aside. Shandi and Anda were in the saddle before Keisha had gotten her foot into the Dihili's stirrup. She was getting used to the way that heralds and their companions worked so incredibly smoothly together, but it took the Dihili's amused comment of show-offs to make her realize that some of that was a deliberate, if somewhat automatic, attempt to impress. Oh, she thought at her mount, not wanting to elaborate lest the rest of her thought leak over to the others. The Dihili flicked her ears back delicately. Yes, they didn't have to link so tightly just to get into the saddle, and there's no real reason to try to impress us, is there? They're doing it to create an image, but is it an image they have to project all of the time? The irony in her tone colored every nuance. Keisha always appreciated the Dihili's dry sense of humor, and never more so than now, but she was inclined to be charitable. Maybe they're practicing, she suggested. You know, they haven't been together for all that long, and it's not easy to get a coordinated link that's natural and easy. The doe flicked her ears forward. Perhaps was all she would say. The journey to the Ghost Cat Village took place without incident, and in a very short period of time. Sentries hailed them from posts among the trees without asking them to stop. The heralds and their companions were instantly recognizable, even at a distance. By the time they reached the village, Vorden and Selen were waiting for them, the shaman was in his ordinary working clothes, not his talisman-bedecked ritual garb, and bits of bark caught in his beard and hair betrayed the fact that he'd been splitting wood when he was apprised of their imminent arrival. Ha! Keisha! Vorden hailed Keisha first, which rather pleased her. And has our new brother recovered from his birthing? What brings you here on this bright morning? 
More or less, Chief, she laughed. He is certainly up and at all of his duties again, rather than sleeping like a man-shaped pile of rocks. My friends wish to know of the arrangements that Ghost Cat has with the pilgrims. That is correct, Chief, Anda said immediately, as the chief and shaman turned to the heralds with faces full of lively interest. If you will be so kind as to explain it to us and show what you can. The chief, who himself had only dared to learn Taledras with the help of Tercel, nodded to hear Anda salute him in his own tongue. So, you have braved the pain of teaching, eh? Well, this is good. I have begun to think such a thing is equal to the death of a bear in counting toward manhood. Anda rubbed his head ruefully. I could not find it in me to argue with that, he agreed, and dismounted. It's good to know you consider me a man. Shandi and Keisha followed his example, but Shandi had to add to her senior statement, Harold Anda must surely qualify for more than just manhood, she told Vorton, for he has taken five tongues of Tercel at once. I am not sure if that was bravery or foolishness, Anda added hastily. It looked to Keisha as if Vorden agreed with that statement. They chatted about gardens, roots, new babies, and leaf blight as they followed the chief and the shaman farther into the village, which had grown, indeed doubled in size, in the past year. There had been more additions than simple births or marriages— some of the pilgrims had petitioned for adoption into Ghost Cat, as their own tribes were so severely decimated by war or disease that they were effectively non-existent, and Ghost Cat usually agreed to take them in. Darion was not the only outsider to have been formally adopted by a Ghost Cat family as an adult. He was just the only one thus far who was not a northerner. Many of those in Erold's Grove and Kevaldemar had been surprised to learn, once the tribesmen began to build, that they were capable of a great deal of sophistication in their dwellings. In fact, their village was as neatly laid out as any Valdemarin village. The northerners built large, one-room, circular houses, with an enormous common room in the center, and small cubicles built against the outer walls for privacy. Each extended family lived in one house. Married children moved in with the bride's parents until the birth of their third child. It usually took that long for a young man to gather the resources to construct his own dwelling. Those who did not wed remained with their families as additional hands and suffered no decrease in status for doing so. The chief had told Keisha that grandparents often bequeathed their homes to a favored young couple, then moved in with the oldest daughter's family. There was often much competition among married daughters to lure grandmother and grandfather to their home. There was an increase in status for those who sheltered such valuable repositories of wisdom as grandparents. The northerners used wood to build their homes, but no stone, with wooden roofs supported by four great pillars, rather than slate or thatch. The buildings were made of squared-off logs, with the chinks closed with moss and mud mixed, and the roof of rough planks laid over a radial pattern of rafters, which were then topped with rough wooden shakes. The houses were odd to Valdemar and eyes, but it was the art decorating them that was so startling to those who were not out of the north. The thick plank door of each house was carved and painted with the totem animal of the particular family in a kind of high-relief style. These were not realistic portrayals, but very stylistic and colorful, featuring patterns in red, white, and black. 
In good weather, beautiful blankets made of pieced fur were hung on the outer walls, both as a precaution to chase out any vermin and odors, and to display the handiwork of the women of the house. Now that Ghost Cat had access to woolen fabric, they were making similar blankets of wool in bright primary colors. Each blanket was a representation of the totem of the person it belonged to. There were always two poles outside each house, carved and painted with all of the totems of the family, and topped with the ghost cat. Totem animals played a huge part in the lives of the northerners. Each tribe had a special totem, usually a very powerful predator. Each family also had a totem related to the totem of the tribe, and when each family member reached adulthood, he or she also got a totem, or as they put it, were embraced by one in a special dream ceremony presided over by the shaman. Darion was an exception. Ghost Cat judged he already had his totem in the form of Kuari. Rafter ends that protruded beyond the edge of the roof were similarly carved and painted, but this time with the heads of spirits and ancestors. Inside each house, the four great roof pillars were identical to the poles outside the front door. The floor of a house was not exactly of earth, although the central hearth was a pit dug in the ground and lined with stones, with the smoke hole through the center of the roof above and stones laid to some distance on the floor in case of sparks jumping from the fire. The floor of each of these dwellings was made of grass mats, many layers thick, laid over the pounded earth of the floor and added to on a daily basis. It was the duty of every member of the family, old enough to do so, to weave one grass mat in the morning and lay it over a place where the mats were looking shabby. As the mats below disintegrated, they were replaced from above. Pine needles and herbs layered between the mats drove off insects. Crude but adequate oil lamps placed on little shelves around the inside wall gave the place a fair amount of light, considering that there were no windows of any sort. But Keisha figured that was only to be expected, since these buildings were intended for much colder climes and a window was just one more place for cold wind to come through. The little cubicles that family members retreated to for privacy were also used for storage. Basically, partitions were set against the wall with a distance of about six to eight paces between them, extending six to eight paces into the main room. A rope across the front made a place to hang a curtain for privacy. Shelves built across the back and sides made a place for storage. People kept their personal possessions in the cubicles during the day. At night, they had the option of sleeping beside the fire or in their cubicles with blankets over the rope to block out the main room. Circular shelters, like the family houses but without walls, stood beside each house, providing a solution to the warmer weather that Ghost Cat had encountered in Valdemar. From spring until fall, this was where most of the work and living took place for each family. On the hottest nights, sometimes the entire family even slept in their shelters. Smoke from smoldering herbs in pots around the periphery kept insects somewhat at bay, and even those pots were decorated with painted decorations. The longer that Ghost Cat remained here, the more of their village was decorated with painted carvings. Keisha expected that before long, even the blank walls of the houses might start to sport their stylized artworks. No one had anticipated that, and a few traders had been eyeing the carvings and pieced work with interest, wondering if there was any profit to be made from northern art. The houses were arranged in circles around a central building that was not the chief's house, but rather was the storehouse for the entire tribe. 
As such, it was decorated only with ghost cat, repeated over and over in an endless variety of poses. Each family had a cubicle within for the storage of raw materials of their own, and the center was reserved for common storage. So ho! You come in good time to see how we deal with the pilgrims come for healing, Valdemar Herald, Chief Vorden was saying as they neared the central storehouse. We have just sent on a family that came with riches, so you will see what we have had of them. While Keisha had been admiring the newest carvings, the chief had explained to Anda that Ghost Cat, in return for feeding and sheltering the pilgrims during their initial week of quarantine and continuing to shelter and feed those who were not injured or ill, received a toll of whatever the pilgrims brought with them. Being that some pilgrims came with little but desperation and hope, this was a very flexible toll. From the poorest, Ghost Cat often took nothing but a little labor, mat weaving, wood cutting, help in building, or carving if there were skilled artists among them. But there were plenty of pilgrims who had come laden with goods, and those made up for the ones that arrived with empty hands. See here, this was a tribe I do not know, but vouched for by those I do and they are wealthy in fur and amber. The chief gestured to the piles of goods laid out in front of the storehouse, and indeed there was enough heaped there to make even Anda's eyes widen. They have only lately been touched by the summer fever and wasting sickness, and are eager to pay for a cure that they do not lose any of their children. The chief pointed to the piles of glossy furs, there is bear, there beaver, there fox, that white is snow fox, the small furs are what we call Goshon, very soft and good, you have no name for it. Indeed, even though Keisha knew the ghost cat language and got a mental image of the Goshon, which was obviously in the weasel family, it was with the disorienting sensation that told her she had never seen one of these creatures with her own eyes. Imagine what the senior Harold must be feeling. He has a skill I never thought of before. This Harold has the ability to act completely undisturbed by whatever he encounters, even though it is so alien to him. He must have thousands of new concepts and images in his mind, from tunnel spar designs of the Hertasi to thirty names for how a leaf tastes from the Daihili to... Who knows? And yet he still manages to travel and carry on a conversation without letting it overwhelm him. Incredible. And here is amber, both the amber of the sun and the amber of scent. These are Sishan tribe, another new word, and this one without any kind of mental picture of the live animal, but only the totemic rendering so Ghost Cat knew the name and the carving that represented it. And they live upon the bitter water where these things are found along the shore. The amber of the sun was the yellow, golden-brown, and red, rough amber that Keisha knew was used in jewelry. These pieces ranged from the size of the end of the little finger to the size of a fist, but this amber of scent was an odd, gray-white substance with a faintly greasy look to it. There wasn't much of it, but from the way Vorden regarded the stuff, it was even more valuable than real amber. He held up a little piece and indicated that they should sniff it. Keisha did so and was delighted with the fragrance, very sweet, heavy, and musky. A bit of this used in perfume, no bigger than a seed, and the scent will last for years, Vorden said with satisfaction. Your traders will give us much gold for this, for there are those among the Kelesia who know the use of it. I can see how you are raising the wealth of your tribe, Anda said with admiration. Not just of Ghost Cat, but of Kevaldemar and the Sanctuary as well. 
The Daihili of Kevaldemar have a share of this for their part, as does the sanctuary. Vorden canted his head over, looking at them shrewdly. We trade with the village for grain for the Daihili, and the goods going to the sanctuary are taken there with each new lot of pilgrims. It is good trade all around, and trade is how we of Ghost Cat have always prospered. As opposed to war? Shandi asked, and Vorden nodded. That is why, if we did not wish someone to see us, then like the cat, we would not be seen. He led them away from the piles of furs. Keisha cast a wistful glance back and decided that she would try to bargain for some of those Goshon furs, so glossy and soft, and a wonderful dark brown. They would be a joy against the face and so warm lining the hood of her winter cloak. And here is the camp of the tribe, Vorden was saying. We hold them here until the healers send the holy Daihili with the last group, making room for the new pilgrims. Those who are not ill remain, while the rest go to the sanctuary. Here was an encampment very like the one that Ghost Cat had first made when they arrived at this place, the difference being that the people here looked healthy and hopeful, perfectly at their ease. There was a distinct difference in their artwork, which was displayed on their clothing and carved on their wagons. This was, so far as Keisha could tell, some sort of fish with a large top fin. She wondered what on earth the real creature looked like. They lived in the tents that Ghost Cat supplied, but unlike Ghost Cat, these folk had no herds. They were hunters, fishers, and gathered what foodstuffs they did not hunt or fish. Keisha wondered what they were making of the strange foods that Ghost Cat had learned to prepare from foodstuffs bartered from Erald's Grove. All of the sick ones that we sent to the sanctuary were children. Their mothers went with them to help tend them, Vorden finished. So now, are you ready to journey onward? There is really nothing more to see here, unless you wish to watch the division of the goods. Anda smiled. Not really. How you share your profits is your business, not mine. I would like to get to the sanctuary before nightfall, if that is possible. It was not only possible, it was easily accomplished. The shaman called one of the Daihili in the ghost cat herd to escort them, and off they went. Keisha had been this way before, but it was new to Shandi and to Anda. The Daihili took no one path. In fact, he made several detours through untracked forest from one game trail to another. This was all intended to confuse, and it succeeded admirably. I give up, Anda said to Keisha, after they had been traveling for half the afternoon. Where are we? Three-fourths of the way there, Keisha told him, unable to hold back a grin. This is only one of the ways that pilgrims are brought to the sanctuary. There must be at least a dozen, maybe more by now. All right, Anda replied, as Iran looked back over his shoulder at Keisha. Why? It was Shandi who answered. We want the northerners to believe that the sanctuary is a special and holy place, and that only the Daihili know the way there. We hope that will keep any renegades from getting the bright notion to come kidnap a healer for themselves. I would say it works, since I've been trying to keep track of our route, and I'm hopelessly lost, and aside, looking about at the forest surrounding them. There was no sign of any sort of landmark, no rocks, no particularly large trees, and no trace of a trail. There wasn't enough light filtering down through the trees to help either. What happens when you climb a tree and look around? Anda wanted to know. Nothing, Keisha answered with surety, as their mounts continued to follow the Daihili, who moved on his own secret path. All you'll see is trees— the sanctuary is in a pocket valley, and they use some clever contrivances to disperse smoke from their fires, 
so you can't see that either. Indeed, when they came upon the sanctuary, they did so suddenly. One moment there was nothing but trees and brush, the next the outer walls of the sanctuary loomed up in front of them, walls of natural stone topped with slatted wood. They followed the wall around to the entrance. It wound around and through the forest in a most peculiar fashion, but it appeared as if it had been built without disturbing a single tree. They passed inside the open gates to find themselves in one of the oddest complexes Anda had ever seen, because once again very few trees had been cut to make way for the buildings of the sanctuary. Keeping the integrity of the forest canopy was important to keeping the sanctuary secret, so instead of one big building, the sanctuary was a complex of tiny ones, all of stone, linked by covered, raised wooden walkways, like tiny covered footbridges. All of the buildings were raised above the forest floor as well, in order to keep out vermin and insects. This was a precaution to keep illness from spreading further. Anda took a wide-eyed look around and suddenly grinned. This is marvelous, he exclaimed. How ingenious! One of the trainees, in the pale green of one who was still a student of healing, came hurrying toward them, his face anxious, as he realized that the resident heralds had arrived, all unlooked for. Heralds! the boy exclaimed, shaking a shaggy brown forelock out of his eyes. We weren't expecting you. Please, come this way. I'll take you to our senior... Anda smiled down at the boy, then he and Shandi dismounted. Keisha did the same, while Anda spoke to the boy in a casual and off-handed manner, conveying the idea that he hadn't wanted any special fuss or preparations. It's quite all right. This is just meant to be a friendly visit, so I didn't send any notice ahead. Can you take us on a little tour, rather than interrupting your senior? Let him finish whatever he's doing and join us at his leisure. Keisha already knew her way around the sanctuary, and let the trainee lead the other two off while she led her own Daihili and the two companions to the sanctuary stabling. Since it was intended for intelligent Daihili, it would serve the companions equally well. It was essentially nothing more than a large shed, open and airy, with thick straw on the floor and mangers and water buckets for food and drink. It was always left open so that the Daihili could come and go. Like the rest of the buildings, it was made of stone with a thick roof of thatch. When she had removed the tack, left it piled neatly in a corner, and given all three a brief brush-down, she headed for the heart of the sanctuary, the infirmary buildings, where new patients were kept. Each tiny building held no more than four patients. This mimicked the pattern of the usual sort of structure, where the patients were kept in separate rooms— in this case, the healers tried to keep as many family members together as possible. It was already traumatic enough to find themselves depending on total strangers for a cure. To separate sick family members would have put too much stress on them. Now that the weather was warm, there was no need to heat the buildings, but in the winter, charcoal braziers or tiny fireplaces filled that requirement. Although the walkways connecting them were all of wood, the buildings themselves were not. They had been built partly of stone, the better to keep them clean. Their thick walls kept heat in during the winter and out in the summer, windows covered with netting and flawed silk to prevent insects from entering were closed by glass windows and wooden shutters in the worst weather. At the moment, the windows were propped open, and the shutters open wide to let in the fresh air. Keisha found one of the healers working in the third building she checked. It was Candace. Someone Keisha knew quite well, a healer with a great deal of experience and expertise with children. 
Her middle-aged, motherly face and figure tended to make children relax and trust her. She looked as if she had at least a dozen of her own, though, in fact, she was single and childless. With brown eyes and hair and a medium complexion, she could have passed as almost anyone's relative. This made her perfect to deal with frightened, wary northerners. Keisha stood just outside and caught Candace's eye, then waited outside, rocking on her heels just beside the ladder leading down from the walkway. Candace must have been nearly finished anyway, as it wasn't long before she came out and jumped down to give Keisha a welcome hug. It's been too long, Candace exclaimed. I didn't get nearly as much time to talk to you at the celebration as I would have liked. Neither did I, Keisha replied warmly. It was impossible not to like the exuberant, outgoing healer. She treated every child like her own, every adult like a friend. Furthermore, everyone in her family was the same way. Keisha had met them all over the course of a year as they came to visit. All but one of Candace's siblings were healers, as was her father. Her mother and one of her sisters were skilled cabinet makers. I came with the new heralds, Keisha continued. They wanted to see the sanctuary. That... And uh, wanted to see the sanctuary, you mean? Candace laughed. I have never seen anyone so determined to find out everything in the shortest possible time. She shook her head in disbelief. If he wasn't so healthy, I'd be worried about him. That sort tends to drive themselves into heart trouble by working too hard. She and Keisha shared a conspiratorial look. I think you can depend on Nightwind to see he doesn't, was all Keisha said, but they both knew what she meant. Since Anda wouldn't hear of not coming, I thought I'd better go along in case your current crop had anything different this time. Candace brushed her short hair back with one hand. No, nothing different this time, just the wasting sickness that comes with summer fever, and thank the gods, the mild form. Now they knew that the wasting sickness came in two forms, one that sickened and weakened and sometimes left a victim with paralysis of a limb, and one that killed or left the victim totally paralyzed. With help, the victims of the weak form could recover much of what they had lost, but unless the disease was caught in its early stages, victims of the strong form could not return to their former healthy selves. Keisha relaxed. Shandi, who was now immune to the wasting sickness, and even if Anda caught it, which was less likely as it tended to attack children rather than adults, she and Nightwind could cure it in a few days. I've got one more set of patients to see. Want to help? Candace offered, knowing that Keisha would. Without waiting for her answer, Candace skipped up the stairs and headed along the walkway, looking behind once to see if Keisha was following. She didn't see a case of wasting sickness at all anymore, and she was right on Candace's heels. They walked in single file with their footsteps sounding hollow as they headed toward the next building— Hung as decorations beneath the shelter of the roof were all manner of little talismans. There was no end to the variety of materials they had been made of. Wood, bone, fabric, fur, stone. There were even some made of dried grasses or pine needles and twigs. They all portrayed a single creature, the Dihili, and each one had been made as a thanks token for a successful recovery— some, made by the children, were crude indeed, but it was the thought that counted, not the skill. All of the walkways were hung with these totems, which were never taken down or replaced, though wind and weather had rendered some of them pretty battered. The patients worked on their talismans as they recovered and hung them themselves from the rafters of the bridges around the building they had stayed in. Ready? Candace asked, pausing on the threshold and looking back at Keisha. Always, Keisha said eagerly as Candace reached for the door to open it. Now, 
if only I could be so certain about the rest of my life. 10. Darion was agreeably pleased when Keisha and the Heralds decided to head for Ghost Cat and the Sanctuary right after breakfast. He had a plan of his own, and if Winter Sky turned out to be free for a day or two, all the better. He finished his own breakfast in a leisurely fashion, knowing that Winter Sky was a late riser, and hoping to see his friend come into the eating hall before he left. His patience was rewarded as he lingered over a mug of cooling tea. Winter Sky did appear in the door, looking damp and cheerful from his morning swim. Darion waved at him. Winter Sky acknowledged the wave with one of his own, then went over to the tables to fix himself a plate. Winter Sky was only gifted with a trace of mage talent. No more than half of all Hawk Brothers had enough of the mage gift to perform more than the barest of magical tasks. As a consequence, Winter Sky's black hair had only gone silver in streaks, and his eyes were still the intense blue of a Taledras who hasn't meddled much with magic. Lean and wiry, with a generous grin and a long jaw, he was one of Darion's oldest friends. He joined Darion shortly, his plate heaped with hot flat cakes and fruit. What stirs you this morning, my friend? Winter Sky asked genially, as he set down his mug and plate and took a seat across from Darion. Actually, I was waiting for you, Darion replied, as Winter Sky applied himself to his food with a good appetite. Did you have any plans for the next day or two? Not really. Winter Sky ate a few more bites before continuing. I take it that you do, and you'd like my company? Your company and your help. You're an expert at cold tracking, and this track is ten years cold. He waited for Winter Sky's reaction, which was just what he'd expected. Winter Sky gave him a long look, ate a bit more, and put down his knife and fork. He steepled his fingers over his plate, his eyes fixed on Darion's. You want to see if you can figure out what happened to your parents. Winter Sky was good at deducing a great deal from a small amount of evidence. That was what made him such a good cold tracker. If I can, if there are any traces left at all, Darion shrugged. I'm not deluding myself. I don't expect much. But if there is anything to be found, I'd like to know I looked for it. They wouldn't let me look while the trail was still hot. Now, though, anything that was left after a few years will still be there. Perhaps. I can understand that reasoning. Winter Sky picked up his fork again and applied himself to his food. Yes, I can understand that. He said nothing more as he finished his plate, returned to the tables for a second helping, and finished that as well. Darion didn't say anything about the subject either. He knew Winter Sky and knew that his friend was thinking the project over, weighing prospects for success against those of wasting his time for two days and finding nothing. If there's anything to be found, Darion added, I can use magic to find it. After that, it'll be up to you to make what you can of it. All right, he said at last. I'm your man. Between my tracking and your magic, if there's anything to be found, we'll find it in two days and figure out where it leads. And if we don't find anything, we'll know there's nothing to be found. Darion hated to say that, but he knew that it was only the truth. I want answers, but sometimes there aren't any. Much as I hate that... The more he had thought about his general feelings of unease, the more he was convinced that they all had something to do with that sense of not knowing. If he just had some notion what had happened, he might feel better. Let's find a couple of restless Daihili and our camping gear and see what's to be found. Winter Sky pushed away from the table and paused again. 
Is Kel likely to be useful on this trip? He asked, narrowing his eyes at the sudden thought. Darion shook his head. Our birds will be good enough scouts to keep an eye out for trouble. Any tracking will be by small signs on the ground. I doubt that anything will be visible from the air. Right enough. I'll meet you at the Vale entrance with my gear and food. You get your gear and the Daihili. When Winter Sky made up his mind to do something, he got to it at once, and went at it with all his focus on the task. Another thing that made him such an outstanding tracker. He was already out the door by the time Darion got to his feet. He went first to the Daihili Meadow, where he paused and sent out a general thought to the herd, which was divided pretty equally between those who were grazing and those who were taking their ease. Does had young at their heels, sometimes twins. Young Daihili had all the wide-eyed innocence of any young thing, but were not much more intelligent at this stage than a human baby. Their bodies were capable of a great deal, but not their minds. When danger threatened, a doe would literally take over the mind and body of her baby to get it out of harm's way, controlling it so that it ran swiftly and surely at her side. And if the entire herd panicked, the king stag assumed control of all of them. Darion did not leave the does out of his general message, although he knew that at this time of year no female would leave the herd, not even a young or old one with no youngster of her own. Females were instinctively attracted to the babies, and willingly served as nannies and surrogate mothers, giving the blood mothers time to graze in lush pastures on their own. There was no such thing as an orphaned Daihili. A youngster whose mother died was immediately adopted by one or more childless females, and any female with a baby of her own would allow the orphan to nurse. The youngsters stayed with their mothers for up to fifteen years, nursing for the first two, then continuing to learn as they grazed for the next ten to fourteen years. Darion sent the equivalent of polite throat-clearing to get the herd's attention, then mind-spoke. Winter Sky and I are going to do some cold tracking for the next two days. We would like two friends to help us with this. Is anyone interested? Young adult Daihili were always restless and ready for an adventure, and at least nine heads popped up at that. He waited. There was some silent conferencing among the would-be volunteers, and with Tercel, who had the last word, and then two young stags separated from the herd and trotted eagerly toward him. Their large eyes were bright with excitement, and they made no pretense of being anything but enthusiastic. "'I am Jonti,' said one. "'This is my twin, Larak.' We have not been far outside the Vale before, and we hope that will not cause a difficulty. Then you should enjoy this, Darion said aloud. We'll be off in a place where I don't think any of the herd has been before. You'll be first to scout it. The stags switched their stubby tails with excitement and followed behind Darion as he led them toward his ekele, heads bobbing with every step. On the way, he encountered a Herr Tassi and requested it to bring riding gear for him. It nodded and continued on its way. Darion had long since decided that the Herr Tassi were constantly in mental contact with each other. What other explanation could there be? This Herr Tassi probably would not be the one to bring the tack, but someone would show up with saddles before he'd finished packing. His camping gear was ready. It was always ready, since Mirren took it away as soon as he returned from a trip, cleaned, repaired, or replaced whatever needed tending to, and repacked it for him. He got the packs out of the storage chest where they stayed until he needed them, then rummaged through his closet for his oldest scouting clothes. He didn't think he'd need more than one change of clothing, but he packed three— because accidents happened, and wet clothing was an invitation to serious illness. 
It didn't take him long to gather his things, but when he walked out of his front door, there was Tack waiting beside the young Daihili, and no sign of the Herr Tassi who had brought it. Daihili Tack consisted of a saddle with belly, chest, and rump girths, stirrups, and a very thick saddle pad. It didn't take long to get the two stags harnessed up and his packs fastened to the saddle. He mounted up, and all three of them headed for the Vale entrance. As promised, Winter Sky was waiting, with his own packs and a waterproof pair of saddlebags containing their provisions. In no time at all, he too was ready and in the saddle, and they were on their way. So, where are we going? Winter Sky asked curiously. North of the village, almost directly north, Darion replied. It's part Pelagiris forest, part meadowlands with the river running along one side, a couple of ponds and some streams. That's where my parents had their trap lines. My thought is that we'll see if we can find anything left of the traps first. If we can, we'll know that, whatever happened, nobody worked the lines and collected the traps. This time, both Winter Sky and his Daihili turned their heads to look at him. You think perhaps someone took them captive, then harvested their traps and everything in them? That's one among many possibilities, Darion pointed out. One of the more remote ones, I'll admit, but if that was what happened, I think it's important to know that. Blood Bear might not be the only pack of hunters who know where the village is. That was Jonti, who sounded curiously unmoved by the observation. That's entirely true, said Darion, and left it at that. They rode past the village without going into it. Darion didn't comment on that openly, but he felt that seeing the village and calling up all of its memories would unfocus his concentration on the task at hand. According to Darion's best recollection, his parents worked an area that was several days' distance from Erald's Grove, but they had traveled on foot in the winter. He and Winter Sky were going by Daihili back at a lope in the spring. They should reach the area where his parents had last been well before nightfall. They stopped at a stream around noon for a brief rest and lunch, and in late afternoon, when they were close to the area where Darion expected to find things, if there was anything to be found, they stopped to set up for the night. It was time for Darion to try his luck. Darion got down off Jaunty and stood quietly, closing his eyes, blocking out the world bit by bit. Winter Sky went straight to work, dismounting and taking care of the Daihili stags and setting up camp. It might seem as if he was the one doing all the work, but that was not the case, and he knew it very well. Darion's search would take as much energy as he was using, perhaps more. That is how the Hawk brothers were. As long as one did equal work in one's own way, there were no complaints from others of the clan. Darion did not open his eyes, since he would be exploring the forest for some distance around, perhaps a distance of a league or two, and the night was still young. He himself had worked this area as a child. Now he had to bring those childhood memories up from the back of his mind, superimpose them onto their current surroundings, and then, then he would invoke mage sight. But he would be looking for two things. First, he would search for objects that did not belong in the forest naturally, such as refined and forged metals. Such things, even in a state of decay, might hold the traces of the humans that had made or owned them. Second, he hoped that his kinship with his parents would draw him to anything that they had once used. It was not always easy to keep an objective pursuit as the hours of sifting went by. When he dredged through his memories for physical references to the landscape, he would come across one image after another of his mother's smile, 
or of his father trimming away a loose branch, or of him bending a trap wire carefully while explaining to his young son how the spring worked. Darion would get such memories brought back to him, lit with intensely bright sun, in that way that only fond recollections seem to have. It was fortunate for him, he knew, that the visions of Mage Sight could not be blurred by tears. Mage Sight showed him the world as it was, for those who could see the energies of life. On the surface, the living animals and plants were each enveloped in a faint, emerald glow, a mist of verdant power, thin but very real. This, rather than the deeper layer where the ley lines were, was the stratum he wanted to examine. His emotions were suppressed through practiced discipline just enough to be able to work safely. He existed in a detached and analytical state for this exercise in receptivity to power. At least, that was the ideal intent. The pace of his search was slowed by periodic pauses, while he collected his thoughts from the effects of one family memory or other. In the intervening times of emotional control, he searched for holes in the overlying mist, places where the non-living intruded through the living at certain relative depths. He concentrated on each of those places, usually discovering that the hole represented a rock or a place scorched bare by fire or lightning. Meanwhile, Winter Sky worked quietly around him as he painstakingly sifted through each area he thought he remembered. With all of his concentration centered on his task, he was not aware of time passing. He was not aware of anything except the next pattern of radiant energy from the next hand's breadth of ground. He felt the glare of someone approaching, seeming to his magical vision much like someone was walking closer bearing a torch while his eyes were adjusted to night and starlight. Winter Sky touched his elbow, getting his attention without disturbing his search. Like a sleepwalker, Darion allowed Winter Sky to guide him to a place to sit, allotting just enough of his attention to keep from stumbling over his own feet. He continued his search without a moment's pause. He sensed, albeit remotely, the sun setting. He felt it as an overwhelming, nurturing presence, slowly sinking away. In addition to searching out gaps in the fabric of life energy, he used a more subtle sense in his examination, the earth sense that made him a healing mage. It was more like a sense than a skill, since it was not always consciously directed. As he examined each bit of ground, he let the earth tell him about itself— had it been injured? Had it been contaminated in the past? Was it under some sort of pressure, other than the normal pressures of life and change? Was there anything different about it? The more he listened to the earth, the farther that sense extended, and the easier it was to read the earth ways. He expected to find at least one change circle this way. This area had not been checked for mage storm damage or interference, except in a very cursory fashion, because the change creatures that had come out of it had long since been dealt with, and whatever had happened here during the storms had not been grave enough to disrupt the flow of magic to Kevaldemar. Eventually, every finger length of land would be gone over with the same painful care that he was using now, but such a detailed examination would take decades, even centuries. For now, only specific strategically important areas of the land closest to Kevaldemar had undergone such intense scrutiny. He sensed a fire crackling nearby, sensed the cool of evening on his back and the warmth of the fire on his face and chest. Winter Sky made the ideal partner in a situation like this one. Quiet and unobtrusive, he kept his presence from impinging upon Darion's concentration, allowing the mage to do what he needed to do. It was late 
very late, and Darion was just about ready to give up for the night when a distant hint of other distracted him from the area he was in the process of examining. His earth sense, running out ahead of the conscious examination, had found something that didn't fit. Thirty-some degrees off from his current focus, there was another sort of glare, more akin to a reversed shadow, and it wasn't subtle either. It was not an impulsive decision to abandon his examination and switch his focus. He was tired, yes, but this was something that needed to be looked at. The nearer he drew to the place, the more obvious it became that whatever was here, it didn't belong. There was nothing wrong as such, nothing that a healing mage needed to put right, but this thing that had caught his attention was as obvious as a cabbage in a flower bed. It was out of place. It had neither been born of this soil, nor had it been brought here long enough ago that some of the sense of it permeated the land around it. It was rawly new, stubbornly unintegrated. He drew near enough to see its shape and form clearly. Ah, now, what is this? It was a change circle, all right, but the kind where territory was transported whole. What made it stand out was its sterility, and it was nothing but bare rock, so bare that not even moss grew on it. It had been planted in a scooped-out area of Pelagiris forest, Tree roots did not penetrate it, though surface vegetation had spilled over onto it from erosion of the surrounding soil. Its surface was not level. In fact, it tilted slightly as a whole, like the side of a shallow hill scooped out by a massive ladle and dropped. The curvature of the stone carried true into the softer ground it had sunken into, and for the first time Darion had evidence that the change circles were not circles at all, but spheres. Huh, I wonder what those theory builders back in Haven will make of this. He was about to leave the search altogether when something else caught his attention, very like the glint of sun on something small but shiny and glittering amidst dark tangles of ground and greenery. Only in this case it was a faint calling of like to like, or more accurately, of blood to blood. His blood, answering the faint call of blood that he shared, weak, old, but unmistakable, so faint that he had to clear his senses again and refocus. He fed it a wisp of power to re-energize it and make it more easily recognizable for what it was. He had just found a possible first trace, the first sign of his parents' fate. He hardly slept at all that night. Only good sense and the need to replenish the energy he'd spent kept him quiet after he'd burst out with his news to his traveling companions. Knowing he would not sleep, he simply kept quiet and allowed his body to rest, although his mind refused to. He carefully catalogued all the possible things he could find and made a simple plan for what he would do for each possibility. It was the equivalent of counting sheep, the only equivalent his emotions would tolerate at this point. At least he had the illusion of accomplishing something to comfort him. He dropped off to sleep from sheer exhaustion at some point, for the next thing he knew, winter sky was shaking him awake and the stars were fading in the first light of pre-dawn. They packed up the camp together and saddled Jonti and Larak, whose tails were twitching with suppressed energy and excitement. He and Wintersky planned to eat in the saddle, for Wintersky had brought journey rolls for just that purpose. So they were on their way to the spot he had marked out, riding the Daihili and followed in the trees by their birds before the first hint of sun appeared in the sky. He rode in a kind of fever, a fire to be there, that very moment, wanting to hope, afraid to do anything of the sort. 
He couldn't even think, not really. His mind jumped from one thought to another without any real coherence. Kuari picked up his agitation and flew back and forth, surging ahead of them, then swooping to the rear to check on their back trail. If it had been remotely possible to gate there, Darion would have tried. During the entire interminable journey, his stomach churned, the muscles in his shoulders and neck were in knots, and his mouth was as dry as sand. Their goal was as clear to outward eyes as it was to his inward senses. It loomed up, enfolded in the white haze of early morning low fog around its base, as if it had shrugged off a mantle of clouds. A huge, perfectly spherical piece of grey-white rock, easily the size of his ekele or larger, reared up between the trunks of the trees ahead of them. The moment they spotted it, the Daihili went from their lope into a full-out gallop, leaving Darion and Wintersky to hang on to the handles built into the saddles and stay on as best they could. The Daihili skidded to a halt as they reached the artifact, hips slewing a little sideways with the momentum of their run as they dug in their hooves, and Darion leaped from the saddle the moment they came to a halt. The surface of the rock was perfectly smooth. Darion tentatively put out his hand to touch it, and the rock beneath his hand might as well have been perfectly polished by a jeweler. It's amazing. Look at this winter sky. Have you ever seen anything like it? But he had no thought for how that unusually smooth finish might have happened. What he wanted was on the opposite side of the boulder. He hurried around it to search in the grass at the junction of forest floor and rock. It's near here, Darion murmured. I felt the sign from near here on the northwest side of the rock formation. In the soil. Winter Sky joined him, the two of them kneeling side by side and carefully parting the grass stems, pulling apart the leaf litter and dead vegetation of so many years, sifting through decayed grasses and earth for some tiny artifact. Then Darion's fingers tingled as he touched something small and hard under the surface. He stopped dead for a moment, then slowly, carefully, probed at the object, fishing it up out of the moist, crumbling soil. His breath caught. It was a bone, a tiny bone, no larger than a thimble. Now Winter Sky took over, pushing Darion aside gently and hunting carefully and methodically through the loam. Darion went to the Daihili who had followed them to this side of the rock. He pulled his ground cloth out of his pack and spread it out beside Winter Sky, numbly taking what Winter Sky dug up, cleaning it meticulously with spit and a handkerchief, and laying it out on the ground cloth. Of all the things that he had imagined last night, this was not one of them. Lay them out in the order I give them to you, Winter Sky ordered after the third tiny bone emerged from the soil. He excavated the site meticulously, using the tip of his knife as well as his fingers, after cutting a square of turf going back to the rock and pulling it up. Darion obeyed him, and piece by piece, bone by bone, a pattern began to emerge. Bones flared at each tiny joint, then nestled into the larger ones of the same general shape. Bones gone gray-white from weathering, the surface cracked and pitted. Winter Sky worked more slowly now, and there was a pattern to his excavation as he worked out the direction that the bones lay. They were toes, the heel, the ankle bones, then... Right against the rock, flush with it, the joint end of the lower leg bones. But the rest of the bone had been sheared off cleanly, leaving only the rounded ends with the cuts lying flat against the surface of the rock. Slowly, Winter Sky picked up the two bone fragments, cleaned them off, and handed them to Darion, cut end first, so that Darion could see for himself that the ends had not been crushed, as they would have been had the boulder landed after a fall upon the unfortunate owner of the foot. 
Another few minutes, and the remains of a hard boot heel and sole were excavated from rotted tatters of thick canvas. Father, he knew that must be whose foot they had found. He had somehow known it the moment he touched the first bone. He knew it from the lurch in his heart, the dryness of his mouth, the surge in his blood. His father always wore his boots to sleep in, in case there was trouble in the night. He wore canvas-bodied boots, coated in the same neutral wax as his leggings, so he would not leave scent marks to warn the game. The waxing had to be restored every few weeks, or it would let the canvas rot. This had to be his father's. But the ends of the bone were shiny, polished, as if they had been cut by a fine saw, then polished by a jeweler. Check with mage sight. Is there any more sign? Wintersky asked diffidently, laying the two bones down with the rest when Darion did not take them. Darion closed his eyes, extended his senses, and shook his head. Nothing, he said hoarsely, surprised at the sound of his own voice. Together they looked at the bones, at the incontrovertible evidence that lay before them. There was only one possible interpretation. They must have been caught in the change circle, Darion whispered. He did not for a moment doubt that his mother had been with his father, otherwise she would have made her way back to him. They were caught in the circle and sent... where? Winter Sky could only shake his head. I don't know, Darion, he replied. I just... Don't know. A few hours later, Darion had cause to bless the caution with which Winter Sky had worked, for he had managed to preserve the very few representatives of non native vegetation that had taken root around the boulder. How they had come there, Darion had no idea, but they were not part of the normal flora of the Pelagiris forest. Perhaps seeds had drifted in with the air that had come with the rock. Perhaps they had been caught in a crack at the top of the boulder, for he had discovered by climbing up on top of it that it wasn't perfectly sheared off. The top, flattened and cracked, looked like normally aged rock surface. He carefully and reverently folded away the bones in one of his shirts in the saddlebag. He wasn't altogether certain how they could be of use, but Firesong would know. Surely we can use them to tell me whether Father is dead or alive. That would be some sort of closure. He could weep for them and know they hadn't come back to him because they couldn't. It was a disconcerting feeling to almost hope they were dead just so he would know at last, one way or the other. It was sobering and distressing at the same time, so he pushed it away from his thoughts through force of will, as he had become accustomed to doing by his training. The Daihili were as excited over their own finds as Darion was, with all four of them equally eager to return to Kevaldemar. The young stags alternated their easy, distance-eating lope with bursts of full-out gallop. Darion had only to hang on. They would get him home faster than any other means except by air, though now he was regretting that he had not brought Kel along. Kel couldn't have carried him home, but he could have taken those precious bones to fire song. He didn't dare send Kuari ahead with the bones. For one thing, Kuari wasn't that fast a flyer. For another, they needed his eyes when the sun set which was going to be very shortly. The Daihili could see fairly well in the dark, but not at the breakneck pace they were setting now, and Darion was not willing to waste the power it would take to set mage lights above and ahead of them. He preferred to use it to augment the Daihili's strength. They needed Kuari's night sight, and the owl was happy to oblige. Darkness gradually crept over the forest, and the Daihili linked their minds to Kuari's. The owl swooped down from among the branches and flew a little ahead of the racing riders, about an arm's length higher than their heads. 
From this position, he could see anything that would trip the Daihili in any way, and so could they through his eyes. Winter Sky's bird had already come down and was riding his shoulder, gripping the padding and hunched down with his wings held close to his body. Darion guessed that it was just about midnight when the first light of Kevaldemar glimmered through the trees in the distance. The weary Daihili found an untapped reservoir of strength and broke into a last, tired gallop. They stumbled through the veil and into the waiting hands of the Herr Tassi. Winter Sky had turned his own attention to notifying the Herr Tassi, and thus the veil, of what they had discovered as soon as they were within range. With Darion occupied in keeping up the stag's energy, he had no attention to spare for that particular job. But thanks to Winter Sky, not only were Herr Tassi waiting, but so were Firesong, Silverfox, and Snowfire. The latter took charge of Winter Sky, who was just as exhausted as Darion, and ushered him away for congratulations, food, and rest. Firesong took one look at Darion's fever-filled eyes and simply took charge of the bones and his pupil. You won't rest until we know something, Firesong said wisely and with unusual gentleness. Come along. I think I can at least tell you whether your father is alive or dead. He took Darion by the elbow and guided him in the direction of his ekele and workroom. Darion didn't resist. He felt as if he was consumed by the need to know. It was a fire in his blood, a blinding light in his mind. They went straight to the workroom, where Firesong already had shields cast, and the room prepared for what they would do. When all three of them were inside, Firesong motioned for Darion to sit, and closed up the shields, sealing them inside. He collapsed onto a stool, and stared hungrily at Firesong, who took the bones and carefully unwrapped them. Darion couldn't look away from the tiny white fragments. They drew his gaze and held it. Firesong placed them down on the floor and sat cross-legged on a cushion beside them. Then he contemplated them for a moment while Darion's heart pounded. First thing, I think, the adept broke off what he was saying and closed his eyes, holding his hands palm down over the bones. Link with me, Darion, he ordered, but in a half-absent voice. Darion didn't question whether he had the strength available. He linked first with a ley line and then with his teacher, clutching the stool with both hands. There was a moment of double disorientation, as the raw power from the line rushed into him, then as he melded with fire song. When he got himself straightened out again, Firesong was setting up a complicated relational field in closing the bones. This was once part of a greater whole, the adept said to him, quite dispassionately, but it was vitally important to be dispassionate when handling magic. You see what I am setting up here. I'm re-establishing a connection with the rest of the body this once belonged to. The plane of power doesn't care about distance in our world. That's why we can gate when things there are stable enough. By reconnecting in that plane what used to be connected there and here, I can learn something about the state of the rest of the body." Darion watched with fascination that was not quite as dispassionate as fire songs. The adept was literally weaving a web of power between the artifacts here and, and something somewhere else, a web that was possible only because they had once been connected. When the last thread was in place, Firesong gathered up a little more power, surprisingly little, and gave it a command in effect, saying to it wordlessly, Show me what you would be like if you were still one object. The power settled over the bones in a tenuous, visible mist, while all three of them watched with varying degrees of hope and fear. 
If Darion's father was dead, there would be no change, or the change would show conditions even less pleasant than a handful of dry bones. The mist took on a pinkish tinge, swirled a little, then took on the ghostly outlines of a healthy, whole foot. Darion hadn't realized that he'd made a sound until he heard it in his own ears, half a strangled sob, half a choked-off gasp, but he certainly felt the tears suddenly fill his eyes and blur the scene in front of him, then pour down his cheeks in an outpouring of the emotions he would not give in to while he was still linked in with the line. Silverfox rested a calming hand on his shoulder, a comfort and warmth that released some of the tension that had been building in him. Right, well, that's the main thing, Firesong muttered, and played a bit more with the relational field. He got no changes, however, and finally dismissed it with a sigh of frustration. Darion blinked burning eyes and told himself fiercely not to be disappointed. This was more, much, much more than he had known yesterday at this time. I tried to get a sense of direction and distance, but I didn't get much, Firesong said, as Darion let go his own hold on the ley line. This time Darion did not try to replenish anything. He needed the energy himself too much. All I got was that it is north and to the west, and so far away that I couldn't get any reading on distance. But he is alive, Darion said, his own voice sounding forlorn, even in his own ears. He is alive, Firesong replied, and smiled, patting Darion's knee, adding his comfort to his partner's. Very much alive, and I think it far more likely than not that your mother is alive and well and with him. If he survived with the loss of a foot, then she likely did, still intact. The sudden outburst of tears surprised him, though it didn't appear to surprise either Firesong or Silver Fox. It was over in just a few moments, but he felt as drained as if he'd just done his entire mastery trial all over again. Silver Fox helped him to his feet, as Firesong handed him a square of gauze cloth to wipe his eyes and nose with. "'You've been through more than enough for one day,' the Kestra churn said, "'and since Kisha is off with the heralds, why don't you stay with us overnight? I think you need company. I think I do too, Darion confessed, and followed both of them up the staircase to the Ekele above, his legs leaden weights, his head full of confused bits of thought that refused to come together into anything coherent. They sat him down on a low sling couch, Silver Fox went out briefly and came back with food and something hot to drink. Numbly, Darion ate and drank without tasting anything, and listened while the two of them talked lightly of utter commonplaces. The longer he sat, the heavier his head seemed, until at length it felt as if it was easier to lie down than remain seated upright. Silver Fox stepped over to him, uncapped a small brown bottle from a nearby shelf, and gently touched two fingertips to Darion's forehead just between his eyebrows. Darion focused on the unusual touch, and Silver Fox waved the open bottle under Darion's nose while he was distracted. Then, in spite of his certainty that he wouldn't be able to sleep the entire night, he closed his eyes for a moment and knew nothing more until morning. Eleven. Sleeping in the tiny, austere isolation hut, with the windows wide open to the night air, was very like sleeping in a hard-sided tent. Keisha enjoyed it as a change from Darion's Ekele. Out here, where the weather wasn't controlled, it still got quite cool at night, and she needed to use the blankets left folded up on her pallet. 
She woke up once or twice during the night at an unexpected sound, and smiled sleepily as she listened to the life of the sanctuary go on around her in the darkness, while she snuggled under the weighty warmth of her blankets. Helping out on the rounds had made her pleasantly tired, and she had gone to bed while Shandi and Anda were still deep in conversation with the healers. In the morning, they showed their lack of sleep with yawns and puffy eyes, but neither had lost an iota of enthusiasm. When we get back to Kevaldemar, you can tell everyone that I've got enough to think about for a while, Anda told Keisha as they mounted into their saddles with a cheerful wink that told her he knew very well that he had been driving some of the others to distraction with his incessant questions. I shan't be pestering anyone for at least a week, and then it will probably be to find out who can help me arrange to build our headquarters. You won't have to pester anyone, since I can already tell you it's the Herr Tassi chief, Aishan. He schedules all the work in the Vale, Keisha told him as she polished off the last drops of her tea. You are building in the Vale, aren't you? What are you going to call this establishment of yours? An embassy? Yes, we're building in the Vale, and I think I'll let this Aishan fellow pick a good spot, Anda told her. As for what we're calling it, well, it's not a way station, and it isn't exactly an embassy, so I thought I'd just call it Kevaldemar Station. That'll work, Keisha acknowledged with hidden amusement. So... And uh, didn't think it was an embassy, did he? Wait until he's been here a year. The Daihili got them back to Ghost Cat in good time. And uh, wanted to speak further with Chief Vorden and Shaman Selen, so Keisha decided to have a look at those fascinating goods that the northern tribes had brought in. Since she had spotted her old friend Highwell in the crowd gathering to greet them, now Warrior Highwell, a fact he was burstingly proud of, she waved to him and got his attention as Anda and Shandi walked off with the chief. He waved back, face full of delight, for the fact that he was great friends with healer Keisha and owl warrior Darion gave quite a boost to his status. She walked over to him as he waited for her. No man of the northern tribes would come to a woman for a casual conversation, not even so high status a woman as a healer. It was nonsense, of course, and these attitudes were gradually changing even among the most recalcitrant of tribesmen. For this once, Keisha was willing to bow before custom. "'Greetings to you, healer Keisha,' Highwell said solemnly. He was trying very, very hard to look mature and warrior-like. He had shot up another hand's breath in the last six months and was wearing a new leather shirt made from the skins of his own kills. The impression he was trying to make was utterly spoiled by the obvious youth of the face behind the new beard and mustache. He still looked to her exactly like the boy who'd been frantic to save the life of his brother and willing to brave anything to do so. "'Greetings to you, warrior Highwell,' she replied, just as soberly, though it was all she could do to keep from chuckling. "'Could you tell me who I would speak to if I were to wish to barter for some of the goods held in trust for Ghost Cat, Kevaldemar, and the Sanctuary?' Nothing easier, he said, brightening at the idea that he would be able to do so high status an individual a good turn. My mother, Lane, has the authority to barter for those goods for the tribe. I am sure she will be happy to bargain with you. That was not in the least surprising. Lane was known to cut a shrewd bargain herself, quite as well as glassmaker Herod's wife. The only reason that she was not in charge of Ghost Cat's dealings with the village was that she had not dared try the language exchange with a Daihili. In part, that was because she was strongly averse to any meddling with magic and holy things for herself, and in part it was because she didn't want to court the horrid headache that always followed such an exchange. 
not that Keisha blamed her. Lane was learning Valdemarin the old-fashioned way, bit by bit, from her sons, who had gotten the tongues the easy way. This would not matter to Keisha, who spoke Lane's tongue with the fluency of her own. Come, Highwell said, gesturing grandly. I will take you to her. Keisha repressed another chuckle at that. She didn't need Hywell to show her to his own house. She knew quite well where it was, but conducting her there raised his status another minute increment. The saying she had heard about the Northerners did seem to be true. You are known by who you know. Not long after that, the two women were going over the goods in the storehouse with all the pleasure of any two women anywhere in the lustrous furs, the warmth of the amber. His job done, Hywell had gone off to do man things, which basically meant sitting about with his young warrior friends, boasting about the animals they would hunt when fall came. The familial resemblance between Lane and her sons was unmistakable. All three shared a distinctively high brow, deep-set eyes, and short nose. For the rest, they shared brown eyes, black hair, sturdy muscular build, and heavily tanned skin with the rest of their tribe. Ah, these are what I wanted, Keisha said, when she finally turned over a protective layer of cloth to reveal the skins she was looking for. How many do you think it would take to line the hood of a winter cloak? Six, Lane said instantly, the fringes of her leather dress swaying as she reached for one of the furs. She spread it over her arm, displaying it to Keisha, ruffling up the fur with her breath to show how thick and plush the hair was. Yes, six, no less. You will not want the fur about the hindquarters, you see, and the belly fur is thin. And were I you, I should have some wolverine as well to put about the edge of the hood. The wolverine is so hot-blooded that the virtue goes even into the fur, and your breath will not freeze upon it. Keisha very much doubted that virtue had anything to do with it, but she did know that the rest was true. She started to agree when Lane spoke again. And here... I think that clan brother Darion might well like one of these, Lane continued, taking a cloth off another pile of what had appeared to be pieced and worked goods. She picked one up and shook it out. It was a vest, made of leather, but not tooled, dyed, or decorated in the usual fashions of the ghost cat tribe, but actually embroidered with designs. When Keisha examined it further, taking it from Lane's hands, she saw that it had been embroidered not with thread or yarn, but very cleverly with tufts of dyed fur of some kind. The designs themselves were nothing like those the northern tribes used, although they seemed faintly familiar. But try as she might, Keisha just couldn't place them. They were more like some sort of foreign designs that the Northerners had tried to adapt to their own style. I think you're right, Lane, she said, as she held the vest in her hands, admiring the workmanship. Darion will like this quite a lot. He's not the lover of decoration that Firesong is. I, and who is, Lane interjected, giggling, hiding her mouth behind her blunt-fingered hand, as was the custom among ghost-cat women. No one, Keisha laughed. But Darion does like to dress handsomely now and again, and this is just his sort of clothing. She and Lane bargained spiritedly for some time, and eventually arrived at a price they both liked. Ghost Cat craved Keisha's dyes and the food spices she raised. She would never bargain with medicinal herbs, but she had no compunction about using her spices as currency. The tribesmen had learned that spiced food was a fine thing. It was a taste they quickly acquired, for the spices gave their plain meals a savor they had never had before. In the cases of garlic and some peppers, it was quite good for their health, too. 
in exchange for spices and dyes to be delivered by Dai Heli, Keisha carried off enough furs to line her hood and make mittens, and she also bought the handsome vest. She had stowed them away in her saddlebags by the time Shandi and Anda were ready to leave. Darion is usually the one getting things for me, she reflected, very pleased with herself. It'll be fun to see his face when I surprise him with a gift for a change. It was at that moment that Anda's companion picked up his pace, leaving Shandi and Keisha lagging a little behind. Shandi did not trouble to catch up, and the Daihili Keisha rode was in no great hurry either. Anda disappeared around a turn in the road, and only then did Shandi turn to her sister. Shandi wore a stubborn expression, her golden brown eyes narrowed as she regarded Keisha. All right, the young herald demanded. What exactly is going on, or not going on, between you and Darion? Nothing, Keisha responded before she thought. That's exactly the problem, Shandi retorted, and I want to know why. You said you'd talk about it later. Well, this is later, and we can't get any more privacy than we have now. Except for two pairs of four-hooved pointed ears, Keisha thought, looking resentfully at Carlos's head. His ears were pointed back toward both of them, although the Daihilis weren't. She didn't relish the notion of having any witnesses at all to this. Come on, Keisha, you know I won't give up. I know you too well, Shandi persisted, turning in her saddle to face her fully. You've got a situation here that's hurting both of you, whether you'll admit it or not. She sounded very sure of herself. Too sure, Keisha thought. I don't see how you can claim that, Keisha said sullenly, looking straight ahead and not at her sister. She couldn't, didn't want to meet Shandi's eyes. I'm not in the least unhappy. I have a terrific life. It couldn't possibly be any better. Ha! Huh. You might be able to convince anyone else of that, but not your sister and not an empath, Shandi retorted energetically. What's the problem? He's not discontent, and you aren't interested in anyone else. Are you afraid he's inevitably going to lose interest in you and go chase some other girl? Since that was precisely what had been troubling her, Keisha's head snapped around and she stared at her sister in shock. How did... It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Shandi replied, staring into her startled eyes. You never believed that anyone would ever think you were pretty enough to bother with when we were at home, and you don't believe it now. In your heart, she continued ruthlessly, you're sure this is all some kind of accident on Darion's part, and one of these days he'll wake up and realize it. Shandi sounded calm, collected, and utterly unruffled, the very opposite of the way Keisha felt. In fact, you're actually planning on it happening. Put that way, so badly and unadorned it sounded ridiculous, and Keisha felt as if she'd been caught doing something very stupid. Embarrassed, resentful, full of chagrin, but it hadn't seemed foolish all those times when she'd been feeling alone and so unhappy. You haven't done anything stupid, Sib, Shandi said gently, her eyes softening, but you almost did. It's one short step from being sure that something good can't last to sabotaging it and making your fears come true. You can't let things that you know don't make sense get in the way of a wonderful relationship. But empath or not, Keisha was not about to admit anything to her little sister. Shandi was, after all, her little sister, younger, presumably less experienced. How dared she sit in judgment on her older sister? Besides, Shandi had no idea of the stresses on her. Look, that's not all it is. It isn't even most of it. I have my duties, my responsibilities, and Darion has his. They aren't the same, and we're apart more than we're together. 
I can't trail around after him the way a wife is supposed. Oh, please, Shandy groaned, interrupting her, while Carlos snorted in obvious scorn. What god came down and told you exactly what a wife is supposed to do? Who set up rules like that? Keisha's temper flared as her resentment mounted. Just because Shandi was a herald and didn't have to go along with the kinds of conventions that normal people did, she had no right to make any kind of judgments for her sister. Keisha wasn't about to flout conventions. Everyone knows what... That's ridiculous, Shandi interrupted again. When has Darion ever told you or even hinted that he expects you to sit home and bake and spin? You aren't everybody. You probably have more wits than any two of my old friends put together, and you don't have to put up with the small-mindedness of village gossips if you don't want to. They won't even know what you're doing if you live here, for one thing, and for another, no one but you should be allowed to make any decisions about how you live and who with. Keisha opened her mouth and closed it again. She had no answer whatsoever for that, because Shandi was right once again. So when did Darion demand, or even hint, that if you two got married, you had to become a so-called proper wife, Shandi demanded. You can't answer me because he hasn't, right? Shandi shook her head. Listen to me and think. What kind of couples has he had for comparison of what a good pairing is like? I'm not talking about the villagers, either, because he doesn't really think of himself as one of the villagers. He thinks of himself as a hawk brother. He had his own parents, who worked together as a team. His mother certainly didn't sit at home and wash floors. He has the Hawk brothers, who are very careful about getting into a marriage, or whatever they call it, but who don't make any demands that one partner be subservient to the other. So why should he suddenly demand that of you? Shandi was too logical, and fired off her arguments too quickly for Keisha to respond. She felt a headache coming on, a shaft of pain coming from her temple, even as she felt flushed and very uncomfortable. Why wouldn't Shandi just drop the whole subject and leave her alone? Now, Shandi changed her tone to one of coaxing. She lowered her voice and cocked her head to one side. Keisha, just because you get involved with someone, even marry him, that doesn't mean one of you has to get swallowed up by the other. Darion doesn't want that. If he did, trust me, you'd know it. And you have a good sense of self-preservation. You'd be running away as fast as a Daihili could carry you. She laughed. Shandi certainly did that when Mother tried to swallow her up. But Shandi didn't make that comparison, which was probably just as well. You say that you and Darion are apart more than together now that you're both taking on your full responsibilities. Well, things change, and you have to change with them. You ought to know that by now. You'll probably have to work some things out, maybe make some alterations in how you work, but... Me? Why should I be the one to have to change? I don't think it's fair for me to have to make all the compromises, Keisha said, and cringed when she heard the whining tone in her own voice. So don't! When I said you, I meant both of you, exasperation crept into Shandi's voice. Listen to what I'm saying, and don't keep jumping to the worst possible conclusion. You make some compromises. He'll make some. You'll work out what's acceptable to both of you. But don't undermine your own happiness because you think you haven't got anything to offer him, and don't drive him away just because you're afraid of a commitment." I'm not afraid, Keisha wanted to snap, but she knew instantly that it would be a lie, so she didn't say anything at all. Fortunately, that seemed to be the end of Shandi's lecture. Shandi left her alone then. She didn't ride ahead or lag behind, but she didn't say anything more. Finally, Keisha thought of something to say. She couldn't help it. She sounded sarcastic. 
How did you become such an expert on, on, on romance? Shandi looked over at her and winked, taking her question at face value and ignoring the sarcasm. Forced into it, between all the boys that chased after me in Errol's Grove and all the trainees who came to me with boy and girl problems, I got to be an expert fairly quickly. She sighed heavily. Everybody goes to an empath for a shoulder to cry on. Don't I know it, Keisha said involuntarily, thinking of the number of times that Shandi's disappointed suitors had done just that to her, and that broke the uncomfortable stalemate. They both laughed, Shandi heartily, Keisha weakly. By unspoken consent, they did not discuss anything remotely uncomfortable after that. Shandi changed the subject to something completely innocuous. They spent the rest of the ride talking about trivialities, nothing that used up an awful lot of brain power, which was just as well. Shandi had given her a great deal to occupy her thoughts. Darion woke in the late morning, feeling just as much turmoil and confusion in his mind as he'd had when he went to bed. In fact, he hadn't really expected to sleep, but his exhausted body had decided otherwise. He turned himself out of the hammock he'd awakened in, in one of Silver Fox's workrooms, and found, as he'd expected, a fresh set of his own clothing waiting for him beside the window and cleaned boots. The Herr Tassi were busy this morning. Getting dressed, he hurried up the staircase to Firesong's Ekele above, certain that he would find his mentor there, probably engrossed in a magical text. He was not wrong. Firesong looked up as soon as he poked his nose in the door. Get over here, Firesong ordered, pointing to a low chair. In a moment, his teacher had Darion sitting down with food in front of him. Firesong turned his apparent attention back to the heavy book from which he was making notes. Don't say anything just yet, Firesong cautioned, without looking up. Eat first. And he sat there with his arms folded across the pages, drawing delicate diagrams, while Darion did just that. Darion obeyed him, even though the food had no more taste than old leaves and kept catching in his throat. When he'd finished enough to satisfy the adept, Firesong allowed him to set the tray aside and get down to a serious discussion. I've been doing some research, but I haven't found anything that was of much use. Charting the change circle against our maps put it on a proper arc, in line with others we knew of already, but since no one has yet been able to find a provable correlation between source and destination circles when they change places, I have no prediction of where what was initially in that circle went. I also did a little more work this morning, when I was fresher, with Starfall's help, Firesong told him. Unfortunately, we got pretty much the same result. Your father is somewhere north and west of us. How far, and in exactly what direction he is, we simply can't tell, except that it's a long way. Farther than a hawk would fly in a week, he sighed. There still isn't enough clean, clear power about for us to be able to point to him with any more accuracy than that. Best scrying we can do at present gives us a general feel within a quarter compass at this distance. It is like target shooting in a dense fog, when you haven't even seen where the target is placed first. We'd either have to have more power, or be a great deal closer to him to find him. And there's an awful lot of north and west to be searching in, Darion sighed. Firesong, don't make any decisions yet, Firesong cautioned. We haven't begun to exhaust all of our resources. There may be someone among the tribesmen coming here for healing who can give us clues, or even a real direction. 
Darion grimaced. And this is where you counsel me about patience. My head knows you're right, but I don't want to sit around and wait. I want to be up and doing something. He unclenched a fist he wasn't even aware he'd made. I have been patient. I've undergone trials, travels, and ceremonies until my ears could bleed. I've been in fights that scared me to death and done responsible things for others enough to be knighted, and even that was to better do the duties demanded of me. Firesong nodded, and a lock of his snowy white hair fell over one eye. He said nothing in agreement, but also said nothing disapproving. I've given and given to this vale, and to the village, and to Valdemar, and even the northerners. I have had some wonderful times and great benefits, and I don't have too many regrets. I have not done these things so I could stack up favors to call in. Darion paused for a long, deep breath, then continued. It is just that the things I have done over the past few years have been almost all for others. But this is for me. Firesong brushed the stray hair away from his face, still seemingly impassive as he listened, then said levelly, Go on. Darion set his jaw and then concluded, Firesong, I want this one. I want this one for me and for my family. I'm horribly afraid that if we wait too long, something will happen to them. His voice faded as he contemplated that terrible notion, that he would learn his parents were alive only to discover they'd perished just days before he could reach them. Firesong shook his head slightly while he steepled his fingers. I understand, but Darion, they've survived this long. Surely they can survive the summer. If I knew where they were and what the situation was, I'd be more inclined to agree with you. But what if they're alive now only because they're being kept as a death sacrifice by Bloodbear or some other tribe like them? Darion protested. That is as may be, but it could as well have happened two years ago as not or never, Firesong replied blithely. What needs to be done is for you to balance and measure the likelihood of results with the risks to be taken, with what powers can be brought to bear with the time you have. Darion looked unhappy with such an objective assessment, but he knew that Firesong was right. What they did know was that his father was in passable, maybe excellent health. The first spell had told him that much, and he had to presume that Starfall and Firesong working together had confirmed that. If a man lacking a foot and marooned in the far north was in any health after all these years, that argued for his continued survival. But it was hard so hard to simply sit there and discuss logistical possibilities with Firesong when what he wanted to do was to get a score of Daihili volunteers and go north as fast as they could carry him, carrying whatever food and equipment he could gather in a dash through his quarters, trusting that luck and his own magic would give him a direction." but even at his most optimistic and foolhardy, he knew that such a plan would be ridiculous. Luck only favored those who didn't need it, an old saying went. Besides, Keisha deserves to hear about this. That was another consideration altogether. He couldn't just go herring off without telling her. Of all the things in the world... I think being patient is the hardest, he moaned, and Firesong nodded. I know quite a few people who would agree wholeheartedly with that sentiment, his teacher replied, with true sympathy. That includes the man I was for the first half of my life. As the Shinayin shamans say, though, every scar is a lesson remembered. 
His face wrinkled in pits and creases as he smiled sideways. I think that while we plan and prepare for what you will do about your parents, you ought to go find something useful that will occupy your mind. He closed the book firmly, caressing its spine, before looking to Darion. I think you're right, Darion said after a pause, and got to his feet. Have you any suggestions? But when Fire Song also rose, a wicked gleam in his eye, Darion knew he had asked the wrong question. Of course, my dear student, Fire Song said in tones of silk. After all, just because you've become a master, that doesn't mean you've stopped needing to learn, does it? The next several hours of magical work left him exhausted in mind and body. Firesong's idea of something that would occupy his mind was a set of exercises that took every iota of his thoughts and left him nothing to devote to his own problems. He found himself juggling multiple ley lines plus heartstone power while fending off little stinging annoyance attacks from Firesong, and meanwhile he had to accomplish his stated task, which was to create a second outlet for his hot spring, since there was more than enough water flowing from it to supply two sets of hot pools. Aishan had already voiced a wish for a supply of hot water for the kitchens so that they didn't have to use the smoke-belching, wood-fired boiler that everyone considered a dubious compromise. Adding blocks of native hickory sweetened the smell, but still was not ideal. So Darion just had to make a channel for the water from his spring. Just. Ha! What he'd actually had to do was find a series of cracks and weak spots through the bedrock leading to the kitchen, seal them from side pathways, then coax a tendril of the hot spring to take those cracks as he slowly forced open the weak spots, melted and sculpted the stone into a sealed channel, and finally bring the spring out near the boiler itself, so that Aishin could use the existing boiler as a hot water storage tank instead. And meanwhile, hundreds of little wasp-like attack stingers came at him from every possible direction. Any he didn't deflect gave him a sharp reminder of his inadequacy. Twice, Firesong even lobbed physical rocks at him, as he had during his master trial. He deflected both away, the second one directly back at his mentor, earning a chuckle from him. When he was through, Fire Song laughed, congratulated him, and sent him back to his own Ekele to bathe and change again. For a few hours, at least, he had been far too preoccupied to think of his father, but as soon as he set one foot on the path outside the workroom, it began again. And mother, how is she? I don't know anything about her, but if father survived having his foot taken off, she had to have been with him. He could easily imagine her standing by and guarding him, hunting for both of them until he recovered, taking care of him. They worked together as seamlessly as a hand inside a glove. They'd both been hunters, but had switched to trapping so that they could include Darion in their treks. Trapping was no less work than hunting, but the danger was a bit less, and it had been something that they could all work at together, even when Darion was an infant. A crying baby wasn't much use on a stalk, but didn't make much difference in working a trap line. He opted for a quick shower, using a spigot high up on the wall, perforated with many tiny holes— it was his own idea to have a way to get clean quickly in his own quarters rather than having to head for a hot pool or falls. Keisha liked it for washing her hair. He was just pulling his clean shirt on over his head when he heard hoofbeats coming toward the open front door. He hurried outside, still barefoot, hoping to be able to catch not only Keisha but her sister and possibly Harold Anda as well. He wanted to tell all three of them what he had discovered himself. 
By now, the news had certainly spread all over the Vale, and when any story spread, it tended to get changed, sometimes out of all recognition. He was in luck. All three of them were together, and he managed to wave Anda and Shandi in before they rode off to the guest lodge. Keisha looked faintly puzzled, but she said nothing. "'Listen, I need to tell all three of you what's just happened,' he said, when the other two had dismounted. Then, when the companions shook their heads and snorted at him, he quickly revised, "'I mean, all five of you.' The companions looked mollified at his acknowledgment, and he quickly outlined his search, the results, and the information that had come out of the magical investigation afterward. "'And that's all I know.' he concluded, looking mostly at Keisha for her reaction. It's driving me frantic, because there really isn't enough to make a search on. But you have to keep working on it, Keisha exclaimed passionately, interrupting him. Of course you have to. How can you come so close and just leave it at that? And when you do find out where they are, you've got to go looking for them. I wouldn't advise undertaking a full-scale search on so little information, Harold Ander cautioned. This was what Darion had expected out of him, but suddenly Ander dropped his dignity and his caution and burst out with, But, oh, hang it all. We'll all help you get a better idea of where to look, and the Taledras and the Northerners too, no doubt. Surely as many good minds as we have can come up with something. Darion stared for a moment as Shandi nodded energetically. I absolutely agree, Shandi seconded firmly. No doubt at all. Carlos feels the same. We'll all work on this together. It seems to me that with all the best minds of Valdemar and the Vales working on it, we'll surely come up with a way to figure out exactly where your parents are and bring them home again. Darion did not know whether to laugh or weep with relief. He'd been sure that Keisha would support him, but he'd been half convinced that the two heralds would oppose any attempt to find and bring back his parents, since it would mean his absence from Valdemar and all his duties. I... all I can say is thank you, and that hardly seems adequate, he managed, after two tries to make words come out had failed. Thank us when we've got some results, Anda said simply. Just know we're not going to oppose you, and we'll help you any way we can, starting by putting our own minds to work on this. Remember, I was trained in a couple of different schools of magic. I might be able to think of something new to you. He and his companion exchanged a glance. Then he and Shandi traded looks. We all need some rest and a chance to think, so we'll see you later, Shandi said by way of farewell. Then she and Anda mounted again and rode off toward the guest lodge. While they had been talking, Keisha had taken a bundle down off her Daihili, who then left them to find a hair Tassi to rid him of his tack. Keisha had held it clutched tensely to her chest all the time she'd been listening to Darion, and only now did she remember it. Havens, she said, looking down at the bundle in her hands in surprise, I'd forgotten all about the present I got you. It doesn't seem like much after your news, but Darion was deeply touched. I beg to differ, he replied. Thank you for remembering me. I'm hardly as exciting as the potential to see a brand new disease, after all. He saw by the gleam in her eye that she understood he was teasing her. Oh, is that what you think, then? Well, you might be right, she teased back. Maybe someday I'll leave you for a nice, exciting plague. He caught her up in his arms and felt a new relaxation about her that delighted him. Whatever had caused this change, he hoped it would persist. She hadn't been this easy around him for months. How about if I give you a fever instead, he murmured into her ear as he nuzzled her neck. She turned her head and bit his ear, not hard, but it startled him, and he let her go. 
You'll have to earn it by catching me first, she taunted, and ran into the ekele. He ran after her, and for the next fever-warm candlemark or so, they were too busy with each other to think of anything else. After a much more pleasant shower bath, this time shared, and yet another change of clothing, Darion stumbled over Keisha's bundle in the middle of the floor of the outer room. He picked it up, saw to his relief that it was undamaged, and looked for a place to put it down. Oh, good. I was afraid we might have trampled that, she said, emerging from the bedroom and tying her hair back as she walked. Here, let me. She held out her hands for it, and he obediently handed the bundle to her. She sat down and began to unwrap it in her lap, first the outer square of cloth, which he realized had been her scarf. A scarf was something no modern healer was ever without, since a scarf could be put to so many useful purposes. Inside the scarf was a bundle of soft, dark brown furs— they looked rather like weasel or muskrat, but were much softer, and the fur was more plush. Keisha put the furs aside and brought out something made of leather and lined with a coarser fur. She shook it out and held it up to him, beaming. Yes, that fits. Have a look. Do you like it? He took it from her and turned it around and almost dropped it, stepping back involuntarily. He stared, struck dumb, as familiar patterns of embroidery branded themselves on his mind. Keisha's smile faded, and she looked at him with uncertainty. You... you don't like it? I'll... No, 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 that's not it. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. It was only a superficial resemblance, surely. But he put the vest down and went straight to the storage chest where he kept the few precious relics of his childhood that had pleasant memories attached. He opened it, reached in, and brought out a small, cloth-wrapped package of his own. This he took over to Keisha and opened, laying out the embroidered leather vest that lay inside next to the one she had brought him. Though the colors of the second vest were faded and stained, the leather worn, though the motifs had been embroidered using wool and flax threads rather than tufts of dyed hair, and though the older vest was barely half the size of the new one, there was no doubt, in all other ways, they were identical. They stared at the vests, then into each other's eyes, and finally Keisha managed to speak. Havens, she exclaimed involuntarily, they're the same, but how? I don't know, Keisha, Darion breathed. Where did you get this? Twelve. Wait, Keisha said, feeling that she had to slow all this down at least a little. Things were happening too fast for her. This could just be a flower, and flowers are a universal embroidery motif. But it's not a flower, Darion interrupted. It's a radial repeat of the Trapper's Guild symbol, see? He blocked off all but one quarter of the spiky circle, and sure enough, Keisha had no trouble in recognizing the stylized trap. It's mother's own design, making it repeat like that. I've never seen anyone else use it. So much for it being an accident or a coincidence, Keisha thought. Well, I got it from Ghost Cat. They got it in trade goods from one of the tribes that came here looking for healing. Darion started to move, and she put out her hand and pushed him back down into his chair. It will keep for half a day, she told him. If you wait until tomorrow morning, you'll be able to actually talk with someone. If you go now, you'll only have to wait until morning when everyone wakes up. But Darion was looking a bit wild-eyed, and she was in complete sympathy. I know. You need to do something, and the smartest thing to do is take these vests to Firesong. 
Maybe he can make some sense out of them. Then, well, I think we should talk to the Vale Council and see what everyone else says. She was actually grasping at straws, but he nodded, agreeing with her, and she sighed with relief. The last thing she wanted was for him to go running off into the darkness to find a Daihili and ride off to the Ghost Cat Village. Kuari or no Kuari, the mental state he was in was conducive to mistakes. Suddenly, she had a nightmare vision of Darion, his Daihili, or both, falling on the night-shrouded trail and breaking a leg. Or both legs. Or worse. But at least she had managed to come up with an idea that made him feel that he was accomplishing something. She followed him out the door and down the trail as he set off at a lope for Firesong's Ekele, knowing that it was going to be a very long night. It turned out to be not quite as long for her. She kept dozing off, first while Darion and Firesong worked over the vests, then later while Darion and most of the Vale Council of Elders discussed possibilities in endless detail. In fact, the last thing she remembered was half waking as someone picked her up and laid her on a pile of pillows, covering her with a soft lap rug. She woke a second time when Darion shook her. When she raised her head, she saw from the thin light outside that it was dawn. Darion looked tired, but by no means discouraged. In fact, he appeared to be ready to set out for the north on a moment's notice— Ready to go to Ghost Cat? he asked, taking it for granted that she would want to be with him. She caught herself, just as she started to feel resentment. There was nothing to feel resentment about. She didn't have patience, except the ones at Errol's Grove, and they weren't due to see her for a few days, and he knew that. He kept as close an eye on her schedule as he did his own. As soon as I change, she agreed, rubbing her eyes and yawning. Then she looked critically at Darion's clothing. You ought to also, she chided gently. It won't take more than a moment. He looked down at his rumpled, stained clothing and blushed with embarrassment. He might not be a peacock like Firesong, but at least he isn't as slovenly as a great many men I've known. You're right, and I will. Firesong once said to me, Dress your best. Heroes in paintings always look terrific, and you never know when it might be your turn to become a legend. Perfect Taledras reasoning, isn't it? Come on, then, he said, and offered her his hand. Before the sun actually crested the horizon, they were in the saddle and on their way past the Vale entrance. But Darion looked odd to her when Keisha glanced over at him. He was preoccupied with something. His forehead creased, his eyes narrowed as he concentrated. The tension suddenly around him made her muscles clench. "'What's the matter?' she asked sharply, wondering what had him so nervy all of a sudden." Both the Daihili flicked their ears back at him. They sensed something strange as well. "'I'm trying to remember something,' he murmured, rubbing his temple. "'Something about dreams.' His voice had a distracted tone. Whatever the dream was, his mood was odd, as if the dream had overwhelming significance and he had to recall it at all costs. "'It can't be that.' It's just that he's not thinking clearly. What, have you been dreaming that the northern spirit cat has been trying to send you messages? She asked, trying to put a chuckle in her voice. She meant it teasingly, to try and get him out of his mood, but he responded as if he had just sat down on a tack. Even his Daihili stopped dead, ears flattened, as he jerked around to stare at her, eyes wide, pupils dilated. What did I say? That's it, he shouted. That's it! But without bothering to tell her what it was, he bent over the Daihili's neck. In response to an unvoiced command, the young stag launched into a full gallop, 
and Keisha's followed, leaving her no choice but to stifle her curiosity and hang on for dear life. They reached the ghost cat village in half the time it would normally have taken. The Daihili staggered into the village on their last bit of energy and stopped, sides heaving. Unlike horses, they were in no danger of foundering, or Keisha would have been more worried about them than she was about Darion. Darion jumped down out of the saddle as he sprinted for the shaman's log house with the bundle containing the new vest clutched in one hand. His dihili began its own slow, careful cool down. Keisha took her time dismounting and followed, noting the curious looks that Darion attracted as he ran. A small part of her hoping that he hadn't lost his wits. The rest of her full of a faltering anxiety. The second surprise of the day came. The shaman must have been expecting Darion, for he flung his door open before Darion even reached it and beckoned him to come inside. And when he looked up and saw Keisha standing beside her Dahili, he waved to her as well. The two men disappeared inside. She entered the door in time to hear Darion say, "So is there a Raven Clan?" I don't know, out of my own knowledge, but the meaning of your dream and mine is now clear," Shaman Selen said somberly, and looked down at the vest spread out on the bench between them. This, however, this comes from Snow Fox tribe. There are still folk from Snow Fox among us, cured, but not strong enough yet to travel, for the cure itself exhausted them. Let us speak with them, and perhaps they can give us the last piece of what we need to know. Darion was on his feet immediately, so completely focused on the shaman that Keisha might not even have been there. And strangely, this didn't trouble her. She was too relieved to discover that whatever all this was about, Shaman Selen obviously knew all about it as well. As she trailed along in Darion's wake, she felt a real sense of relief and even anticipation, which completely replaced the anxiety she'd felt on the way here. This was real, something she could deal with, and a perfectly reasonable and understandable obsession. If it had been her parents rather than his, she would have been just as focused as he was. Absolutely, they may drive me crazy, but they're my parents. I know how he must feel. There was a log house in the farthest circle that had no tribal totems ornamenting it. Instead, the house was decorated in stylized carvings of Daihili. Once again, the holy Daihili identified those who had come to seek a cure from Ghost Cat and the sanctuary. Here, they encountered a slight difficulty. For the Snow Fox tribe spoke a different variant of the northern tongue. It took Darion and the shaman several tries before the most senior of the men left in charge of the invalids understood what they were asking. Keisha couldn't follow him at all. He spoke so much faster than the ghost cat folk that he almost seemed to be speaking a different language altogether. He wasn't all that old either, just out of adolescence, and probably newly come to full warrior status. He was in charge of a band of young men his own age who had remained behind to guard and protect the three women and gaggle of youngsters who had not been strong enough to travel back to the tribal lands with the rest. The shaman stood beside Darion as he and the young warrior sat facing each other on a bench just outside the door, with the morning sun full on them. Keisha stood by and watched, rather than listened, as Darion grew more proficient in the Snow Fox dialect with each passing moment. She suspected, from the faint tingling she felt along the surface of her skin, that he was using magic to help speed his acquisition of the tongue. The young warrior, biting his lip earnestly, was a bit alarmed. He must know it's magic, but it isn't Daihili magic, and Darion must look completely alien to the young man with his Taledras clothing and lighter hair and eyes than the Northerners had. 
The shaman saw this as well and stopped the conversation to reassure him. After a few words, the youngster became quite charmingly cooperative. Darion stooped and took a bit of charred stick from the ground to draw a crude map on the bench where they both sat, but the young man shook his head and put his hand over Darion's. Clearly, he didn't understand maps, or at least he wasn't able to translate what he knew to map form. They do so much by rote. Keisha bit her lip, hoping Darion's memory was up to this. Darion listened to him with fierce concentration as he described what must have been the journey here, committing every landmark to memory, frowning so, his eyebrows almost meeting in the center of his forehead, that Keisha knew he'd have a headache before this was over. At last, Darion sat back, his frown fading and being replaced with a smile. He thanked the youngster. That much, at least, Keisha understood, made some polite comments. Then he and Selen took their leave. Darion reached out and took her hand as he passed her, giving it a gentle squeeze. I'm sorry if I seem to be ignoring you, Kechara, Darion said apologetically, as soon as they were out in the open again. I... You were trying to get as much information as you could in the shortest possible time, Keisha interrupted and smiled at his relief. Havens, did you think I couldn't see that? But you had better give me a full explanation later on and not leave anything out. She squeezed his hand back and his smile turned so warm she almost blushed. I will. On the way back, I promise. Darion turned then to the shaman, squinting against the sunlight. Selen, I can't begin to thank you. Nay, do not thank me. It is the ghost cat's doing, and nothing of mine. If he wills you to this task, then I do no more than my duty to aid you, the shaman said solemnly, and you will be wanting a guide. Darion was now the one looking surprised at Selen's words. Selen laughed. What? Did I not tell you this was the ghost cat's will? You shall go northward into the white. This he has told me. You will need one of us to guide you. I have thought upon it, and I believe your guide should be Hywel. In doing this, you will permit him to discharge his life debt to you. Darion and Keisha both knew better than to argue with the shaman when he used that phrase. A life debt was a serious thing among the northerners, and it was not something that any northerner wanted hanging over his head. By Keisha and Darion being instrumental in saving Hywel's brother, Hywel had incurred a life debt to them both that would hold him back socially and personally in many ways until he repaid it. He could not marry, could not even court a young woman, and could not incur any other major responsibilities until this one was discharged. Besides, Hywell would have been her first choice as a guide. He might be young, but he was sharp, intelligent, and observant. What you have done for us would oblige us even to your whims. This is more than a whim you have conjured as a game. It is a personal imperative. You go now to the Vale and make your plans, Selen continued. I will see to Hywel and Hywel's mother, making her easy with the journey her son must take with you. Darion sighed and accepted the shaman's words without any argument, since it was obvious that Selen had made up his mind about all this or the ghost cat made it up for him. We'll head back, then. We've borrowed two more Daihili. I don't want to impose on the two we rode on before. They practically broke their necks to get us here quickly. He must have already asked the Daihili, for two volunteers had joined up with the two cooling down, waiting for someone to come take the tack off the first two and put it on them. Go, 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 the shaman said, making shooing motions at them. Send one of the holy ones to come for Hywel when you are ready.
There didn't seem to be anything else for them at that point but to take the saddles from the backs of their weary original mounts and transfer them to their new volunteers. They were out of sight of the ghost cat village before Darion took a deep breath, shook himself out of his reverie, and turned to find her staring at him expectantly. I definitely owe you an explanation, he began sheepishly. Definitely, she replied, with just a touch of acid, enough to let him know that she was more than tired of waiting. I have been incredibly patient, understanding, noble, forbearing. Enough, I get the idea, he cried, holding up his hands as if to fend her off. I guess the place to start is, I've been having these dreams, except I couldn't remember them afterward. I know. When he looked at her oddly, she added, it was like sleeping with a kicking Daihili fawn, or rather, trying to sleep. He blushed. Anyway, he continued valiantly, when you said something about the spirit cat talking to me, I remembered suddenly what those dreams were about. He shook his head ruefully. I don't know why I couldn't remember before. Maybe you were afraid, she said slowly, remembering the aura of fear that had hung over him during those dreams. It had been the fear and not the restlessness that had awakened her. He looked very thoughtful. Maybe. Especially since I didn't have any notion that they were supposed to help me. They were weird, through and through, he shrugged. The point is, they all involved the ghost cat and a different totem, an enormous raven. Not only that, but the day I was made a clan brother, the ghost cat appeared at the ceremony and left a raven feather at my place— Nobody seemed to have an explanation, and no one thought it was a bad omen, so I just dismissed it in favor of everything else that had to be done. Until I triggered your memory. Now she understood why he'd acted as if she had jabbed him. I just had this inspiration. No, that's too mild. I suddenly knew that the ghost cat was trying to tell me something, that I needed to find the raven tribe— so that was why I wanted to see Selen, because you wanted to find out if there is a raven tribe. She nodded slowly as all of the pieces began to fit together for her. And he didn't know for sure, but the vests came from Snow Fox, so he figured the Snow Fox people would know. I take it that there is? Yes, and here's the best part. They make the vests as trade goods, usually to order, with someone's own totems on them. But sometimes they make the ones like I got, and what's more, they only started making them a few years ago. He looked at her in triumph, and she felt her eyes widen. So we're going? she asked, feeling breathless all at once. If he goes, I go. I have to. Is this one of those compromises? Maybe. If so, it's one I know I have to make. We? You want to go? He looked at her with doubt and hope mingled in his glance. I thought, I can turn Erald's Grove over to the oldest of the sanctuary trainees. They're about to make him a full healer anyway, she said resolutely, a thrill of pleasure running through her at his reaction. Yes, this is a compromise I have to make. You don't think I'd let you go traipsing off into the howling wilderness on your own, do you? You might get hurt, and then how would we both feel? Armed with this new information, Darion asked for an informal meeting of all of those who might be at all concerned with his proposed expedition— Shandi and Anda invited themselves to the meeting. He was pleased, but not surprised, given their earlier positive reactions. He asked Tercel, because he would have to have Daihili if he expected to get from here to who knew how far north in any reasonable length of time. The elders of the council were obviously concerned, given that he was supposed to become an elder himself eventually. Shaman Selen and Hywel both arrived when he sent a polite invitation by Daihili. 
Hashi came because he wanted to, and Kel came because Kel wanted to know everything that was going on. Aishan was there because he would have to see that the expedition was properly provisioned. Winter Sky because his friend already knew what was planned and had no intention of being left out. There was an addition who was entirely unexpected. Steel Mine. Why the plant expert would care where he went and what he did, he wasn't certain, but Steel Mind and his buzzard were both in attendance. He finished his summation of everything he had learned and looked around the table. I want to go north to find them, he said. I know that's obvious. It should also be obvious that I can't do this alone. Shaman Selen and Highwill both think that Highwill should go as my guide, and I agree. Also, Keisha wants to go. I want to leave now. I want to get there and back before winter, and winter probably comes earlier there than here. So, he spread his hands, are you going to let me go? And have you any ideas of your own? Firesong burst into laughter as Snowfire grinned and Nightwind cast her eyes upward. Do you really think we could stop you? Nightwind demanded. Whether we like it or not, this is something that's too important to you. You'd claw your way through a mountain if it stood between you and your parents, now that you know at least one may be alive. You might have some really pressing reason why I shouldn't go, and I am supposed to be the Valdemaran representative here, Darion pointed out mildly. I wouldn't like it. Be truthful. You'd be miserable and angry, Nightwind interrupted. So the best thing we can do is not only agree, but give you everything you need to get you there and back safely. Which is what? Me, Kel interjected eagerly. I am a formidable foe. I am an outstanding scout. You need me. I am fierce. I will frighten enemies just by being there. Kel seemed to take a great delight in being fierce. He was doing his best to look the part, too, head up, eyes bright with a predatory gleam, beak slightly agape, talons slightly flexed. Agreed, Starfall said immediately, to the delight of both Darion and Kel. Since Keisha is going along, she can serve as Kel's Trondirin. Keisha, Nightwind can show you how, enough anyway to handle most problems. You'll all be immensely safer with Kel along. What next? I believe I should accompany him, Hashi offered diffidently. You know that what Kel cannot see or scent on the ground, I can. I can work well with Kuari after dark. I am eager to have this saga at first hand. I am not vital to this veil. There are others who can serve as the Kyrie representative as well as I. The fact that I have remained so is mostly habit on our part. Any objections? Starfall looked around the table and saw none. So far we have Darion, Kel... Keisha, Hashi, and Hywel. Tercel, I take it that you can supply as many restless young stags as need be. Ha! Huh. I would have difficulty holding them back. This will be a high-status expedition for our eager young stags. The young does will be greatly impressed. Tercel's dry amusement at the expense of his younger counterparts had them all chuckling. But Tercel hasn't had to exert himself to impress Doze in a very long time, Darion reminded himself with rising sympathy for those eager young stags. The only way a young stag became a father and potential harem leader was to do something impressive— do you have to ask? Winter Sky said. I'm going, of course. It's too dull around here. If I spend another summer shooing those northern pilgrims onto the right trail, I'll go mad. I swear I will. 
Starfall laughed at him. All right, all right. I think you can be spared. That's Darion, Keisha, Kel, Hashi, Wintersky, and a herd. Who else should we ask to volunteer? No, Hertasi, Aishan said reluctantly. It is very cold in the north, even in the summer. Not that cold, the shaman protested. You speak as if there is snow upon the ground everywhere at midsummer. But Starfall shook his head. No, I agree. This is not like our foray into Valdemar, where the Heratasi were protected, and we were in no great hurry to cover ground. This expedition will move too quickly, and have too many risks for any Hertasi to go along safely. Aishan, your people are fine fighters, but only in large numbers. And what's the point of asking for fifty Hertasi to go and be chilled solid up north, when they're needed more in the warm vale? No argument here, Darion agreed, nodding. Aishan, I agree with you completely, even if it does mean I have to eat my own cooking. That brought a laugh, as he had hoped, and the talk turned to provisioning for a little while, until Shandi cleared her throat. That brought silence, and all eyes turned toward her. She flushed a little, but said into the quiet, Carlos and I want to go along. Actually, Carlos and I think we need to go along. Now that was a surprise. Of all of them, only Steelmind nodded, as if he had guessed as much. Anda and I talked this over very seriously before Darion went to the village and spoke to the Snow Fox people, she continued. Anda would like us to see what conditions are like up there. It is not intended as a slight to any of you, of any species, but depending upon what was encountered, it could be very advantageous to have an official Valdemaran presence there. No offense meant, Shaman Selen, but we need to know if there are any more— She paused to pick out the least offensive words— Any more aggressive peoples, like the Bloodbear tribe. You need to know— you are not the only ones, the shaman replied. We stand between you and any armies, recollect, and we have pledged to guard this place, have we not? Well, there you have it, Shandi shrugged. Carlos and I put our necks into this too, then. Anda traded a look with her, then spoke to the rest. This is something that is very important to us. I would have hesitated to send her and Carlos alone, but this is going to be a group that is large enough not to protect her, but that she can work with. This was not the first time that Darion had gotten the feeling there was a great deal going on between the two heralds that was not spoken aloud. There was an entire conversation taking place, probably in personal mind speech that no one else was privy to. My gift of empathy can be pretty useful in figuring out if someone is telling the truth without having to use a Vrondi, based truth spell, you know, Shandi pointed out. And I probably know as much about rough camping as any of you, and I can do one thing that none of you can. Through Carlos, I can keep in touch with Anda and the Vale. Darion raised an eyebrow at that, but said nothing. He could read between the lines easily enough. Valdemar and the Hawk Brothers were friends and allies, but it was always better to have a pair of your own eyes along. He couldn't find it in his heart to feel resentful either. He'd have felt the same if the shoe had been on the other foot. In fact, I don't think any of us here at the Vale would want a set of heraldic spies going up there without one of us along. After all, we're the ones who'd be getting the arrows and spears in our teeth first. But the greatest surprise of all was that Steelmind then said, And I would go too, if you will have me.
From the startled look that Shandi threw at him, this was a complete surprise to her as well as everybody else, except possibly Silver Fox. Why was the question on the tip of everyone's tongue, Darion suspected, but no one asked it, in part because it was, frankly, no one's business but steel mines. We can certainly use you, Darion said gratefully, and left it at that. Well, there must be a great deal more going on there than I had thought, and Steelmine's decision to come took Shandi by surprise, too. I wonder why, unless it's that she's closing off that empathy of hers when it comes to Steelmind, maybe because she didn't want to know what he was feeling. Hywell and Selen had gotten their heads together, and now Selen said, we too believe that it would be well if you went as traders. Traders have some protection among our people, more than any other outsiders. They tend to be left alone by all except wolfheads and outlaws. For if the traders were molested, who would bring new goods in the coming year, or pretty things for our women? He chuckled. I tell you, our women would take our scalps for that if the traders were frightened off. Darion didn't much like the idea of posing as traders. He didn't want to end up weighed down by a lot of clattering goods, and he certainly didn't want to be a target for outlaws because of those same clattering goods. Could we trade in dyes? Keisha asked instantly. I know your women really like the ones I have. Oh, good thought, Kechara. Dyes are light, and a little goes a long way. We'd have a reason for not carrying much baggage. He had not liked the idea of being loaded down with pure mass to maintain the ruse, or perhaps even being forced to bring a wagon for trade goods. Dyes would be good, the shaman ruminated. I tell you what you may ask for. Earth amber— gold and carved ivory. Dyes are valuable. We weigh them out weight for weight with such treasure. Those things will not weigh you down. You will look like proper traders, but wise ones who are willing to move quickly and venture much for much gain. Darion privately had decided that if anything threatened to weigh them down, he would discard it without a moment of hesitation. This was not a real trading expedition, and he had no intention of looking for a profit. With that decided, the planning began in earnest. When they finally returned to the Ekele, very late that night, Keisha looked around with a sigh. If I'd had any idea what this expedition was going to be like, she began, you'd have volunteered to come along anyway. Darion replied confidently. He was already selecting clothing for the journey, and curiously, the first thing he picked was his ghost cat outfit. Perhaps I'd better take mine, too. I don't know about that, Keisha muttered, but mostly to herself. It hadn't occurred to her that she was going to be camping rough when she volunteered. She'd scarcely been camping at all, and when she did go, it was with full amenities, tents, cook stoves, plenty of food, and lots of hair tassi to help out. But there weren't going to be any comforts on this trip, no tents, no cook stoves, and they'd eat mostly what they killed or found for themselves. Thank goodness for Steelmind. He'll be able to tell what's good and what's not without our having to experiment with it. An all-meat diet would be very bad, though I doubt Kelvrin would agree. They'd be cooking over the fire without pots for the most part. They'd be sleeping in hammocks, sometimes strung high in the trees for safety. If it rained, they'd each have a rain cape to drape over themselves and their hammock, or they might put up a lean-to if they had time. It could be worse. We could be sleeping on the ground, I suppose— True, there wasn't much danger of anyone becoming sick, not with her along, and one thing was certain, she wasn't going to scrimp on her medicines. Darion could always use magic to keep them warm if he had to, and maybe even sheltered from the weather. 
still. Hela, you'll enjoy it, Darion said, putting his arms around her as if he had been reading her thoughts. He probably didn't have to. Her thoughts were written clearly enough on her face. I know it's not what you're used to, but camping this way can be a lot of fun. You miss sleeping out under the stars when you're in a tent, and you miss waking up to the dawn. Insect repellent, she muttered absently, thinking about the black flies and nocturnal mosquitoes that Hyrule had described. I'd better come up with an insect repellent we can wear. There's a camphor bomb I can mix up. Exactly. It's not as if we aren't clever enough to improvise, or as if we haven't done this before. You're the only one of us who's never camped this way. He turned her around and gave her a winning smile. A little reluctantly, she responded. I'll try not to be a burden on the rest of you, she told him, looking up into his eyes. That's the part I'm really afraid of, that after a week you'll wish I'd never come along, and after two you'd wish you'd never met me. There it was, out in the open. The confession had slipped out before she could stop herself. She pushed away from him as he considered her words. You might say the same thing about me, he finally answered. When it's cold and raining and we haven't had any luck hunting or when we're trying to sleep knowing that there's something prowling around at the foot of our tree just waiting for a rope to snap or a limb to break or when I order you around, you might wish me on the other side of the world. I might, she agreed. She'd meant it to sound teasing. It came out as a bit waspish. So were even. He didn't pay any attention to her sharp tone. He just grinned and shrugged. We'll deal with it when it happens. In the meantime, we've other things to think about. What is going on with Steel Mind? That's certainly changing the subject. Why are you asking me? I don't have any more clues than you do, she replied, making no effort to conceal her own confusion. I suppose it might have something to do with Shandi, but you know that he's far too steady to be doing this on a whim, or half-heartedly. Does it matter why he's coming? Actually, no. He looked down into her eyes. As long as I know why you are. Once again, words came from her mouth that she hadn't intended to say. For you, she whispered. Just... For you, it seemed to be the right thing to say. Thirteen. Keisha fingered the talisman at her throat and stared at the mountains before her in disbelief, drawing comfort from the little clay owl figure on her necklace. Since Owl Knight Darion's induction into the clan, the elder women had been making the talismans along with their Daihili figurines. Each of them in the traveling group had one of the clan's talismans, given to them by Shaman Selen before they left, strung on sliding thongs in the northern fashion— High wills featured cat claws, understandably enough. Both Keisha and Darion had little handmade owl figurines and semi-precious stone beads on theirs. Hers featured the color green in its beads as a reminder of her status as a healer. Shandi's had an odd sort of charm, a taledras-made chiming ball enameled with a white horse— Steel Mines was a silver hawk on a crystal arrowhead shape. Winter Skies was a pair of hawk talons in stone with a stone knot between them. These talisman necklaces were meant to identify them to other northerners as friends to at least one of the tribes. Selen and Vorden had advised them not to wear their ghost cat costumes, at least not at first. The relationships among the tribes were complicated, and it was better to be thought of as traders and healers first, and allies of a particular clan second. 
They were now altogether out of familiar territory. For the past several days they had been taking a barely discernible track through hills that had been plenty tall enough for Kisha, but today they had come up over a particularly lofty range to see the real mountains. Kisha could only sit slackly in her saddle and stare. Between the top of the hill where they were and the beginning of the mountain range was a wide river valley, a meandering river running through it that they would have to ford. Is there snow on the tops of those? she asked Highwell incredulously, pointing to the white dusted peaks looming against the blue sky. Probably, he replied, shrugging his indifference. It doesn't matter. We won't be going up that high. The young tribesman was in his element now. So far as he was concerned, this trip was the height of pure pleasure. Not that he disliked living on the border of Valdemar, but here he was, ranging and hunting rather than staying in one place and herding, and doing it all by Dihili instead of his own two feet. This was a much superior form of travel, and Highwell very much enjoyed the experience. Keisha had mixed feelings. She was finding more pleasure in this form of travel than she had expected, but that was leavened by the fact that she seemed so much clumsier at rough camping than anyone else. Steel Mind, Darion, and Winter Sky were already part of a functioning team. They had worked and traveled together for four years before Keisha had ever met them. That left Keisha, Shandi, and Hywel to fit themselves into the pattern somehow. Hywel had insinuated himself into the working trio within a day. His role was clear-cut, after all. He was the guide. Between everything that he had absorbed from his elders and the Snow Fox folk and his own memories, he had a fair idea of where he was going. Between Hywell and the sole Dihili Doe that had come as Tercel's representative, who served as their scout, they had clear courses marked out for them every day. Shandi had learned the essentials of camping all through her two years at the Collegium, by going out with Anda on a regular basis with little more than a bow and arrows, a fire starter, and a few essentials in a saddlebag. Within three days, Shandi also had fit herself into the regular rhythm of things. It was Keisha who had remained out of step for the longest, much to her chagrin. It took her a couple of days to get the hang of putting up her hammock so that it didn't fold her in half, nor slip down on one side or the other. She'd never cooked over an open fire before, so she watched, feeling useless, as Shandi and Steelmind made meals. About the only things she could do competently were to fetch wood and water. At least I'm good at fetching wood and water, and Steelmind can cook. The others were already starting down into the river valley below. Keisha's Dihili took it upon himself to follow— she stared at the mountains with the same fascination that she usually reserved for poisonous snakes. Beautiful, yes, but how far are we going to have to climb into those peaks? She'd heard all sorts of horrible stories about mountains, trails that ran out, leaving you on a tiny ledge too small to stand on properly, avalanches that swept down in white, roaring walls of death, storms that came up out of nowhere, air too thin to breathe, and the dreaded mountain sickness. The latter wasn't an illness as such. It was caused by the thin air. The symptoms ranged from simple shortness of breath to vomiting and delirium. And the only way to cure it is to get off the mountain, which could be a bit hard to do if you're vomiting and delirious. Nevertheless, that was where they were going, and she had volunteered to go. The river valley was pleasant enough, at least, and they couldn't get farther than the very foot of the first mountain before nightfall. Highwell, aren't there any northern tribes around here? she called to the front of the group. This place looks deserted. Oh, yes, this is part of Grey Wolf territory, he said cheerfully. 
They are usually farther upriver this time of year. I do not know if we will see them. They do not herd at all. They hunt and plant some. They had encountered two tribes thus far, Black Bear, not to be confused with Blood Bear, and Magpie. The latter, allied with Ghost Cat in the past, had welcomed them with great enthusiasm for the dyes that Keisha had brought with them. The Northerners, like the Southern Shinayin, had apparently never seen a color they didn't love, and combined colors in ways that made Keisha's eyes water. Black Bear, however, had been wary and careful. The travelers saw only their warriors and never had been invited to the camp. Keisha had asked about their shaman and healing woman and had been greeted with blank stares and no information. Still, Black Bear had not been actively hostile, or else they hadn't wanted to take on a formidable enigma like Kel and had let them pass. Kel was up above now. Hashi and the Daihili Do Neta were somewhere ahead, acting as advance scouts. Neta was years past the age of breeding, but was just as agile as a doe half her age. More to the point, she was wary, clever, and experienced. The young stags were half afraid of her, since she had acted as a disciplinarian to each of them at some point in his life. Keisha was very glad to have her with them. As her mount, Malcolm, began picking his way down the hillside, Keisha scanned the valley below. There were no thin streams of smoke from possible campfires, nothing moving through the small clearings among the trees, nor along the banks of the river. The air was so clear that everything stood out in sharp detail, and the scents were more like those of early spring than of early summer. "'We'll camp early, on this side of the river,' Hywell called back over his shoulder, then urged his mount on ahead to pick out a good campsite. "'Good. Steelmind and I can look for edible plants while a couple of the others hunt.' Now that she'd gotten the hang of things, she'd be able to help with setting up camp, too. In next to no time, they were under the trees again, and the branches cut off all sight of those intimidating mountains looming over them. The Daihili continued to pick their way down the slope in single file, with Steelmind taking rear guard just behind Keisha. There was no discernible track, but the rocky slope didn't support much underbrush, so the way was clear between the trees. It was a lot farther to the river than it had looked from the top of the hill. They were still making their way toward the river long past the time Keisha would have figured that they would have already been in camp. They heard the water long before they saw it a deep rumble that alarmed Keisha, though she saw no signs of worry in any of the others. When they finally came out into the sunlight, just on the river bank, she saw why. To her right, on the downstream side, a smooth and silky expanse of broad water passed into a much narrower and rockier channel. Instead of rolling placidly along, the river leaped over boulders the size of a house and roared along a series of descending cascades. Yet to her left, there could have been nothing more peaceful. The channel was three times the size of the one to the right. The water was placid and relatively slow-moving. It should be no great problem to ford or even swim it. Darion and his mount had already turned to the left— Shandi and Carlos followed. There was no sign of Hywell, who must have gone ahead to a campsite upriver. He had, and it took several more furlongs of moving westward before they caught up with him. Hashi, Kel, and Nata were with him, acting as perimeter guards while he made some of the initial preparations for the camp. The rapids were no more than a far-off rumble, not disturbing, but the noise might cloak the sounds of anyone or anything approaching. Keisha dismounted, pulled off her Dahili saddle, and set to work. 
Her job was to make a fire pit, while Darion and Hywel went in one direction to hunt. Kell took to the air to find prey for himself. Steel mined to the woods to find edible plants, and Winter Sky took fishing tackle to the river. That left Keisha to take care of fire and water duties, and Shandi to get out all their camping gear and decide how she was going to prepare camp for this night's terrain. By the time the hunters, fisher, and gatherer had returned with their bounty, or lack of it, Shandi and Keisha had the camp set up and the fire ready. By sundown, everyone had been fed except for the Daihili, who would graze on and off all night. Tonight they had eaten better than usual, since Winter Sky had successfully hooked and netted a nice lot of fish. The ones that hadn't been eaten yet were smoking over the fire, along with strips of meat from the small rabbit-like animals that Hywel and Darion had killed. That would give them tomorrow's breakfast and lunch, that and whatever else Steelmind gathered in the morning. Tonight, with one side guarded for them by the river, Shandi had strung the hammocks at ground level and downwind of the fire where the smoke would drive away black flies and other biting insects. Keisha brought in a last armload of wood before darkness closed in completely, and she and Darion set themselves up for the first watch of the night. Hywel and Winter Sky took the second, and Shandi and Steelmind the third. The arrangement suited everyone well, except Winter Sky's bird, and that hardly mattered, since the handsome falcon was ideally suited for daylight scouting. While everyone else went straight to their hammocks, Keisha carefully turned the strips of meat and fish fillets to make sure they cured evenly and Darion made the first of his many rounds of the periphery with Kuari. When he returned, Keisha made a space for him on the pile of leaves she was sitting on, leaves that would eventually end up on the fire to make more smoke. "'Is there a ford, or are we going to have to swim tomorrow?' she asked, as he put his arm around her and held her close. It might not have been a very romantic question, but he didn't seem to mind that." There's a ford. Ghost Cat used it coming here, he told her. Hywell doesn't think the water is much higher than it was then. It is bound to be some higher, since they came through in summer, not spring, and there's still snow melt coming down off the mountains. I know about the snow melt, she replied with a wry smile. I gave up on the idea of a bath the moment I dipped out the first bucket of water. It feels cold enough to have been solid ice a candle mark before I dipped it out. That's why we're crossing in the morning. It'll give us the full sun to dry out in once we're across. Darion looked toward the water, and Keisha knew he had planned every moment of the crossing and just beyond. Then we spend a full day hunting and fishing. Oh, she craned her neck around to look him in the face. Why? Because when we reach the mountains, there won't be much worth hunting, he said. At least, that's what Hywell says. There's supposed to be a big pass going right through the range, but Hywell never went through there. Ghost Cat's traditional territory is in the mountains, but east of here on the other side of the river. We need to go west, though. Once we get across and into that pass, we'll be following Snow Fox directions. Hmm. She put her head on his shoulder and tried to listen for noises beyond the distant thunder of water. Well, we knew that was going to happen at some point. He didn't seem at all tense or worried, so she made up her mind not to worry either. How much farther do we have to go, she wondered. All that she knew for certain was that the Raven tribe was said to be living near or on a large body of water, but also in the mountains. I suppose it could be both, she decided, and got up to put more green wood and leaves on the fire. They spent the rest of their watch making rounds and tending to the smoked meat, then took to their hammocks when Winter Sky and Hywell awoke to take over. 
And yet, in spite of that, or was it because of that, she felt more relaxed and at ease with Darion than she ever had before. Their hammocks were strung within easy touching distance, though not so closely that they would bump into each other, and they twined their fingers in one hand together every night before they dozed off. That little ritual had come about entirely by accident, but they'd fallen asleep that way every night since. And she fell asleep tonight the same way, taking and giving comfort with that simple, Holy natural connection. Well, this is deeper today, Highwell said dubiously, eyeing the fording place. We should have crossed yesterday. Something must have happened up in the mountains. A storm, maybe, or massive snow melt. Highwell was right. The water was higher by a significant amount, and faster, too. It licked at the rocks, just beneath his feet now. If he stepped down to the point where yesterday's water line had been, he'd be knee-deep in the torrent. Too late now. Let's just swim and have done with it, Darion replied with a shrug. It's not that wide. We're in good shape. We can get across. No, but the current is swifter than yesterday, Highwell pointed out. He peered upstream. Look there. If we're going to swim anyway, let's pick where we want to come ashore, then go upstream from there and cross diagonally. That way we won't have to fight the current as much. Darion nodded and sent Kuari up into the air ahead of them. The owl often got a better vantage from above than they had. Looking through Kuari's eyes, he examined the riverbank on the other side. Kuari perched in a tree just above the ford and looked down at the river bank. Water swirled treacherously among rocks, creating turbulent eddies and vortices. I don't much like the look of the ford, he said. Now that the water's high, there's a nasty current right there at the bank and a lot of rocks for hooves to get caught between. But... This time he asked Kuari to land right on the bank, as he spotted a much better candidate for a landing point. Look where Kuari is. We've got a nice, shallow slope going up to the shore and no loose rocks. Yesterday that was a stone shelf leading down to the water. There's quite a drop-off at the end of that shelf, but that won't matter since we're swimming anyway. Highwell considered what he could see of the bank from here. All right, that's probably the best we're going to get. Let's go upstream and see what we can find for a starting point. They checked spot after spot. They had Kuari drop chips of wood into the river at various points to gauge the current. It took the better part of a candle mark to find what they were looking for, which was another shelf to allow them to walk into the river, but by mid-morning everyone was ready to make the crossing. Half the Daihili would carry baggage only. The other half, and Carlos, had handhold straps fastened to either side of their saddles. Like it or not, the larger creatures were better equipped to make the crossing, and the humans would have to take advantage of that. Those carrying the baggage went over first, and Darion ran downstream as they were carried by the current, anxious to see them safely on the other side. He was just as anxious to see how their initial guesses panned out. Not well. He knew that as soon as the Daihili were halfway across. They fought the current every bit of the way, necks stretched out, eyes fixed on the farther shore, legs pumping, nostrils flaring as they panted, and they were the strongest of the mounts. One by one they clambered ashore where they stood with heads hanging and sides heaving. They had barely made it to the assigned landing spot. If any of them had been any weaker, he could have gotten swept along to a point where there were no more places to climb out. And after that came the rapids, which were certainly much worse by now. Darion came back to the group on the shore and looked from steel mind to Highwell and back. What do you think? he asked them. Shandi had already disavowed any experience in these matters, as had Winter Sky. We can't rely on the Daihili to help us. 
They're going to have enough to do to get themselves across. Steel Mind spoke first, and Highwell nodded. I think we can get across all right anyway. We're all strong swimmers. Highwell didn't sound as certain as Darion would have liked, though. I can help. It was a mind voice, but it wasn't any of the Daihili, nor was it Hashi. As one, they all turned incredulously toward Carlos, who bowed his head and pawed the ground. I can stay downstream. If anyone begins losing ground to the river, I can come to help him. Darion and Keisha, alone of all of them, knew how astonishing it was that Carlos should begin talking to everyone. Darion decided not to make an issue of it. If Carlos continued to speak to the rest of the group, all well and good. Maybe he had decided to take his cue from Nata and Hashi. I can tow from the air, Kel pointed out. I can have a rope ready to drop to anyone who needs help. But that gave Darion an idea. We can put up a catch rope across the river at the crossing point. If the water carries any of us off, we can save ourselves with that. Carlos and Kel can stand by in case that's not enough. That's three kinds of rescue, and that ought to be safeguards enough. It would have to be enough. There was no one to help them here except the members of their own party. Three tries or a freezing, sure death in fast water that would batter them against the rocks, and still they were willing to see Darion through on his quest. That seemed the best plan. With Kel's help, they strung a rope across the river from bank to bank. The unladen Daihili went over first, with Hashi paddling madly beside them. Then Carlos, who had no difficulty getting across, unlike the Daihili. It occurred to Darion at that point that the companion's strength must be enormous. He already knew that Carlos's stamina was incredible, but his strength must have been incredibly greater than a horse for him to get across with such ease. Then, one by one, the humans crossed. Steelmind, oldest, tallest, and strongest, went first, and instead of using the rock shelf, he dove directly into the water a little farther upstream beyond the shelf. If he had trouble... They were going to have to rethink their plan. Like the Daihili, Steel Mind labored every bit of the way, but did make landfall at the proper place. Without a pause, once he waved from the bank, Winter Sky followed him from the same point that he had used. Meanwhile, Steel Mind gathered tinder, partly for a quick warming fire on the other side, and partly so the activity would generate more body heat. The two girls went next, one at a time. Keisha, who had been swimming every day in the Vale Lake, just barely made the landing spot. Shandi overshot and had to catch herself on the rope, lest she go farther downstream. Steelmind and Carlos both waded in to help her over the last bit. Hywell and Darion went in together. Hywell was not the swimmer that Darion was, and Darion wanted to pace him just in case. Due to the life debt, or perhaps friendship alone, Hywell did not want to be away from Darion. The river was unbelievably cold. Darion gasped as he hit the water, shocked by the temperature. He rose, spluttering to the surface, and struck out for the shore, but the shock had driven most of the air from his lungs, and he had to fight to get another full breath. Darion realized that it was the life-sapping cold that they had not figured into their calculations. In no time, he was numb and shivering uncontrollably. It was hard to get air as the muscles of his chest clenched from the cold. He was too busy watching out for Hywell, swimming and fighting for air to think. The swim was a nightmarish experience that required every fragment of his attention. His focus was split between Highwell thrashing along beside him and his own next breath, the next stroke of his arms and kick of his legs. Then he was on the other side. Steel Mind and Keisha hauled him out onto the sloping shelf of stone. 
Beside him, Shandy and Winter Sky pulled out Hywel. They both staggered to the land and dropped to the ground, shivering and coughing. But as soon as Darion could manage to think, despite gasping like a stunned fish, he seized the nearest ley line and used the magic, unshielded, to create heat. Without the shielding, the spell created more heat. The Daiheli crowded close, steam rising from their coats, and the humans relaxed and stopped shivering. Hashi moved out of the way and shook himself vigorously, then trotted back into the zone of warmth. The heat made an enormous difference. As it soaked into them and they stopped shivering, it was easier to catch their breaths, easier to regain lost strength. Steelmind returned with an armful of driftwood and twigs, quirked a smile as he realized what they were doing, then dropped the bundle in place to join the group. It was while they were still drying off that Kuari hooted a warning from somewhere out of sight. Darion's head snapped up, and the Daiheli snorted in alarm. Men coming, he told Darion, with bows. They all scrambled to their feet. Darion dismissed the spell and readied a trip-up, a variation on the first bit of magic he'd ever used in combat to make people's feet stick to the ground just long enough to trip them. With their backs to the river, they waited for the strangers to approach, weapons to hand, but not at the ready. Would they approach, or would they slip up to the newcomers to their land? And if they did, would it be with intent to examine or to ambush? The warriors must have realized immediately that the strangers had been alerted to their presence, for they did not even try to approach unnoticed. They came openly, but very, very silently, by northern standards. Not by Taledras standards. Darion, Steelmind, and Wintersky heard them long before they appeared among the trees. The crinkle of dead leaves and the sharp snap of a twig betrayed them. The Daiheli snapped their ears forward at each sound until the northerners emerged from the forest. Then they parted to show Kelvrin lying at his ease in their midst. The northerners froze in mid-step, one by one, as soon as they saw the griffin. They were clearly taken aback to see what to them must seem a monster lying like a pet dog beside the strangers. Before anyone could move or speak, Hywel suddenly brightened and stepped forward. hi -o, warriors of Grey Wolf, I greet you, he said cheerfully. I am Hywel, a warrior of Ghost Cat, and these are my friends, come to trade. That made all the difference. Some of the tension ebbed out of the group, and one of the warriors stepped forward. What, then, is that? asked the warrior, who boasted a headpiece made of a wolf's mask, with the rest of the fur serving as a cloak. He pointed to Kel, who stood up slowly. I am Kelvrin, a warrior of the tribe of Silver Griffin. We are allied with Ghost Cat, Kel said genially, and cupped his wings. The warrior of Grey Wolf looked dubious, but wasn't inclined to dispute the word of anything as large and dangerous-looking as the griffin. Finally, though, the Grey Wolf fighters came forward. Although the Grey Wolf tribesmen still walked carefully around Kel, giving him wary glances, it appeared that they were ready to give conditional welcome to everyone. "'What have you to trade?' asked one, looking at their saddlebags curiously. Die, said Hywel, and grinned. Your women will bedeck you in colors of scarlet and blue, if you have amber or gold to trade for it. That got their interest. Northern men were even more color-mad than the women, if that was possible. Hywel extracted samples of thread dyed with Keisha's colors and passed them around, causing the stalwart warriors to croon like happy girls over the brilliant shades. 
That loosened the mood considerably, and when Highwell remarked casually that they were trying to find the Great Pass to get to the North and Raven tribe, one of them commented that it would be no great matter to show them the way. In fact, once roughly a candle mark had passed, they were ready to do what no other tribe thus far had been willing to do. They offered to guide the group to their own encampment. From thence we will take you through the mountains to the Great Pass, one of them said to Highwell, if that will serve. Good. Snow Fox told us that the Great Pass will lead us to Raven, Highwell replied, as the others gathered up their baggage and the saddles that had been removed for drying and began tacking up the Dihele and Carlos. Darion was very pleased with the way that Highwell was handling the contact and had decided to leave him nominally in charge, at least for now. If Highwell hadn't been there, he might have hesitated in accepting the offer of Grey Wolf hospitality, but Highwell was perfectly confident with these folk. He even asked about specific individuals and got answers, something that increased Darion's comfort level. And Shaman Rogar, a wise woman Awani, Highwell continued with his interrogation as they took to their saddles and the whole cavalcade started out. Have you had more trouble with the summer fever and wasting sickness, and have they learned of a cure? That certainly captured the Grey Wolf folk's attention. The fellow who appeared to be the leader, with a headdress made of an entire wolf head, skull and all, and a cloak of several wolf skins, and who hitherto had held himself somewhat aloof, suddenly addressed Highwell directly. Is it true, then, that Ghost Cat has found the cure for the wasting sickness? He asked sharply and anxiously. Highwell started to answer, thought better of it, and looked to Darion. Darion motioned to Keisha to come up to the front of the group and replaced Highwell himself. Warrior of Grey Wolf, I am Darion Kevaldemar, adopted of Ghost Cat, and it is among my people that Ghost Cat found their answer to the wasting sickness, he said. What is it that you would know? The eyes of the northerners widened to hear him claim kinship with Ghost Cat and to see Highwell nod to confirm his claim. You have a cure? the warrior asked sharply, showing no sign of surprise that Darion knew his tongue. Darion nodded to Keisha, who answered the warrior with no sign of fear. Star-eyed, I'm proud of her. She acts as if she did this all the time. We have a cure only for the early stage of the sickness, she said gravely. Once the fever has fled the body, little more can be done. But we have the means of that cure with us, and we'll share it gladly. The warrior sighed, a mixture of relief and disappointment. And are you then a wise woman? he asked Keisha, with the aloof interest most northerners gave to the female healers. It was beneath their dignity to give females any notice outside of the home, but at the same time the status of wise woman was nearly equivalent to that of shaman. I am, she acknowledged, and the holy Dihele have decreed that I am to impart what cures we have to your shaman and wise woman if they are able to master those cures. The warrior nodded, then turned back to Darion, relieved that he no longer had to pay direct attention to Keisha. I am Cholka, the chief hunter of Grey Wolf, he told Darion. You will be very welcome among our people, with such gifts to impart. The rest of the journey was made in silence, as the warriors of Grey Wolf spread out into the forest around them, leaving only one walking beside Highwell as his guide. The two young men, for the one that had been left was, if not Highwell's age, certainly very near to it, spoke with animation to each other. Darion didn't bother to try and listen, since it seemed to be mostly a mixture of boasts and hunting stories. 
Darion knew that they were near the Grey Wolf camp when the warriors began appearing again, most carrying game to close in around the strangers as a precaution against overreaction by their own folk. By the time they reached the encampment, there were curious children running alongside them, and women peering at them from the shelter of their bark-covered houses. This was a temporary camp, not the kind of permanent village that Ghost Cat had established in Valdemar. Grey Wolf did very little in the way of husbandry, and as a consequence moved as they depleted the resources around their camp. In winter, they moved to a place where there were many caves that they used for storage and for living space during the cold months. What they had here were movable shelters, made of flexible willow branches and covered with slabs of bark and pine boughs, intended to keep out rain, give a certain amount of privacy, and not much more than that. There were cook fires in front of each of these homes, with pots half buried in the ashes, much like at Ghost Cat. The one striking difference between Grey Wolf and Ghost Cat was the presence of enormous dogs everywhere, huge, easy-tempered dogs who paid no attention whatsoever to the newcomers, even Hashi, who was about their size. Darion made a mental note to ask about the dogs later. As was the case at Ghost Cat, the homes of the most important people in the encampment were nearest the center, so the chief, the shaman, and the wise woman had plenty of time to assemble to greet the visitors. Their guide stepped back so that the chief hunter could make his introduction. Hywell introduced everyone, including the Daihili and Kyrie, And Kel, of course— Kel came to the fore of the group and bowed to the three leaders of the tribe. "'Have no fear of me,' he said, with a serious and sober inflection in his voice. "'And do not fear for the game hereabouts. I shall hunt upon the opposite side of the river.' "'That is good to hear,' the chief replied, just as seriously." but it is best of all to hear that our allies of Ghost Cat have prospered in their new home. So, friends of our friends, before there is any talk of trade, will you share salt with us? A bowl of salt was duly brought forward, and everyone tasted it ceremoniously, even Hashi and the Daihili. That ceremony was all it took to break down the last barriers— the wise woman and the shaman immediately took Keisha aside to interrogate her, Shandi went with them, and Darion, Hywell, Steelmind, and Wintersky found themselves seated at the men's fire, taking turns describing the journey they had taken and the condition of the land they had traveled through. Truly, the rumors we have heard are not rumors at all, then, but truth— the chief said with unvarnished satisfaction. Blood bear is no more. Having brought the wasting sickness upon us, they have finally sickened of it themselves. Had there been even a single war party, you would not have traveled past Magpie unmolested. The warrior with the wolf mask headpiece spat. All the better, say I, he growled. The others nodded. "'What rumors did you hear?' Darion asked, grimly curious to hear the details of the downfall of his oldest enemies, the people who had nearly destroyed Erald's Grove and who had succeeded in killing his first teacher. "'After their war band failed to return, they set to breeding sons on the orders of their new shaman,' said the chief, his expression grim." Girl babies they exposed, that their women waste no time upon them. They sent out parties to capture more women, to breed more sons. Then the wasting sickness at last struck them, and their new shaman had not the cure for it. I heard that at the last they had taken to sacrificing any who were stricken, offered the chief hunter. The warriors took to eating the flesh of those warriors who had fallen, to take on their extra strength after their death. 
and that the women began to run back to their own people. And so they are no more. There was no doubt as to the satisfaction in the chief's voice, a satisfaction that Darion shared completely. But he did not permit himself to indulge in it. An old Shinayin saying was that it was one thing to take pleasure in the defeat of an enemy, but gloating over it for very long made you no better than he. So, he said, allowing himself a single smile, let us talk of more pleasant things. Permit me, chief, to show you the colors that we have brought, and let me never have to think of blood bear again. 14. Take slow, deep breaths, Keisha told her sister, who was struggling to get enough air. She wasn't feeling all that well herself, but it was Shandi and Winter Sky who had been hit the worst by what their guide assured them was not a sickness, but due to only the height of the mountain. This was mountain sickness, the illness of which Keisha had heard such unsettling tales. Safe to say, no one was making light of it. Shandi leaned on Carlos's shoulder, visibly taking calm from her companion's presence. She was dizzy, felt as if she were choking and nauseated, all symptoms, so their guide said blithely, of what he called mountain fever. He insisted that coming down off the mountain would cure them, and since Keisha had not been able to find any signs of disease using her healing gifts, she was forced to take his word, and the word of all the tales that she had heard for it. Of all of them, Keisha seemed to have suffered the least. Steelmind, Highwell, and Darion were very short of breath and had killing headaches. Winter Sky had both problems and was looking a bit green. Shandi had all of these and shook with cold. They'd bundled her up, but she still shivered, besides being sick and half-blind with headache. The non-humans all showed discomfort in some way, to a varying degree, except for Calvrin, who seemed invulnerable to it all. Keisha only suffered from the headache, which was bad enough— I suppose I should be happy with that, she thought, and tried to will more air into her lungs. We must get over the pass, their guide insisted. It will only get worse if we stay here. Worse? Shandi moaned. This can get worse? I can't see how— It will, the grey wolf warrior said firmly. Fever dreams or unconsciousness. We must get over. It will be better then. All right, Shandi managed to gasp and climbed into her saddle. Let's go, while well, I can still ride. With her head feeling exactly like someone had tied a wire around it and was tightening it more with every passing breath, Keisha got into her Dahili's saddle and waited for the rest to mount. How was the guide managing to be so healthy? I suppose he must be used to being this high, she decided. It hardly seems fair, though. They had been traveling through these mountains for three days now, but it was only today that they had started to feel so sick. It was a pity they were all so miserable, because the scenery was spectacular. This last of the passes was actually above the clouds, though still below the snow line. It was about as cold in the shade as a late fall day in Erald's Grove. The full sun was intense and quite hot, and the little white puffs of cloud floating just below them looked like heaps of newly shorn fleeces. Below and behind them lay one of many valleys, green and tree-filled. Farther back, more mountains, growing blue with distance— Ahead of them lay the notch between two mountains marking the pass, mountains that in turn towered so far above the pass that it made Keisha dizzy to think about it. This, so the guide assured them, was the final obstacle they needed to cross. Below this lay what the guide called the Great Pass. I can't imagine how Snowfox got this far, laden with sick people, she thought. 
they must have been truly desperate to undertake the journey. But then she remembered the children of Ghost Cat, so ill with wasting sickness they could hardly even feed themselves, and she knew that no parent could see that and not try everything to make it better. With the exception of the now extinct blood bear, these people cherished their children no less than the parents of Valdemar. She held on to the saddle grip, enduring the jarring of her head with each step her Dihili took. She knew it was worse for everyone else, most of all for Shandi, who was as white as Carlos's coat. Carlos himself looked positively pale, even for a white horse. The trail they followed was a slender track threading its way between enormous rocks tumbled from the higher slopes and clumps of brush. At this height, colors had been leached from everything by the intense light of the sun. The bushes and grasses were gray-green, the trunks of the tiny trees gray-brown, the rocks around them pale gray. Here and there were spring flowers, pale blue, pale pink, and white. Only the sky held an intense color, a blue so deep and pure that Keisha longed to be able to dip fabric in it and capture it forever. The only other place she had ever seen a blue that beautiful was when she had looked into Carlos's eyes, just before he had chosen Shandi. They plodded upward, and the top never seemed to get any nearer, then suddenly they were there, at the top of the pass, looking down— and down, and down. Hywel whistled his astonishment. Darion shook his head in disbelief, and Keisha gasped. Even Shandi forgot her misery for a moment and stared. Havens, it must be a league or more to the bottom, and it goes on forever. The great pass, their guide said simply. And here I must leave you. The track down is plain, see? You no longer need my help. He pointed to a much clearer track than the one they had used to climb up here, one that zigzagged down the steep slope, more of a cliff than a slope, from where they now stood. The Great Pass, that was far from being any kind of a descriptive name for it. Keisha had pictured a mountain pass like any other, perhaps deeper, certainly longer, since it was supposed to go straight through all the way to Raven territory. What she saw, however, beggared imagination. It was as if someone had taken a giant knife and carved through the mountains to form a passage— the bottom was as level and flat as a good paved road, and it disappeared in either direction into the mists of distance. Right now the sun was high above them, so the bottom was in full light. She caught a glint of water down there, shining between the branches of trees made so small by distance that she could scarcely make them out. "'Gods of my fathers,' Darion murmured. Who could possibly have possessed the kind of magic needed to make such a thing? Only then did Keisha realize that it was magic and not nature that had created this place. Ha, huh, Shandi said, rousing herself out of her misery. I guess you don't know your history very well. The northern mage that Harold Vaniel fought, that's who— and I guess Vaniel must have had even more than he did, since Vaniel stopped him. She peered off into the south and east, following the gash with her eyes. It'll come out just north of the Forest of Sorrows, or it would if Vaniel hadn't blocked it. I had no notion this thing still existed. Nor had anyone else, except the northern tribes, who clearly knew very well it existed, and provided easy access to the south. Only luck and Vaniel's curse had kept them from taking it all the way into Valdemar in the past, and now, save for that final blockage, the north stood open to invasion. Now it was more imperative than ever to find out what sort of state the rest of the northern tribes were in. They had joined together once to invade Valdemar, and only Vaniel had stopped them. What if they should band together again? 
They wouldn't need a great mage this time, only a strong leader and a good strategist. All the work of creating an easy path to the south had been done for them. She was the first to break out of the trance of fascination that the great pass exerted on them and ask her Daihili to start down the trail before them. Darion quickly shook off his own bemusement and followed her. One by one, the others did the same, as their guide remained on the top of the pass behind them, watching them solemnly as they began their journey downward. It took them all day to make their way to the bottom, and once there, the great age of the place was self-evident. Far from being the barren cut it must have been for years after it had been made, a hundred thousand different plants and animals had taken advantage of the shelter it provided to move in and flourish. A stream ran right down the middle, fed by the runoff of the mountains above it, and where there is water there will always be life. Leafed trees and evergreen trees had taken root here, and a variety of plants flourished along the banks of the stream. There was game in plenty, too, which was just as well, since the mountains cut off the sunlight and night would come very quickly here. There wasn't a lot of time left to set themselves up for the night. So they didn't hesitate when they reached the bottom. They made camp immediately. They still had some provisions in the form of dried meat pounded together with dried berries provided by their hosts of Grey Wolf. That would do for now. In the morning, they could hunt. "'How are your heads, all of you?' Keisha asked the others as they quickly gathered deadfall for a fire. She got variations on fine now from all of them, and Shandi in particular looked much more like her old self— Evidently their guide had been right. There was something about going up very high that made people sick. Unless they're used to it? That must be it. Keisha didn't want to contemplate what it would be like to try and become accustomed to the heights. How long would the sickness last? How long would I be willing to bear it before I gave up? That's the real question." Perhaps it would be possible to become accustomed gradually, without the symptoms. But I don't care to be the one to find out, she decided, and went back to gathering very dry twigs to serve as kindling. Steelmind found a real windfall, in that he found a tangle of wood piled up against a rock, dry and ready to burn. But that very find raised the possibility of another danger— Flash floods were always a possibility in the mountains, and they were in a particularly hazardous and vulnerable place. A cloudburst could cause a flood leagues away, a flood that would sweep everything before it all the way down the pass, and they would have no warning. Weather-watching, Darion said to Steelmind, as they all came to that realization after a short discussion. Have you ever done it? Not often, but I can do it, the older man replied, unsheathing a hand axe, adjusting its waiting slide, then stooping to chop up the battered brush and limbs. Hywell and Winter Sky helped him as Keisha, Shandi, and Darion gathered up the armfuls of wood. Darion limbered up and hacked skillfully at some branches with his heavy brush knife, while Kelvrin helped in his own way by standing on long branches or small trees and snapping through them with his beak, even if they were as thick as a man's upper arm. It was getting dark fast, and even though the tops of the mountains above them still gleamed golden with sunlight, it was twilight on the floor of the pass— Winter Sky and I can watch, too, Darion said with satisfaction. Good. There won't be a night watch when we won't have a weather watcher, too. During the day, we can take turns. Kel will know more than any of us during the day. He'll be up in the weather we're watching. It is likely that we and Hashi will also be able to hear a flood before it reaches us. "'Well in time for us all to climb to escape,' Netta said diffidently. "'So we will have twin defenses.' 
but Keisha wondered how well she was going to be able to sleep with the specter of a flood sweeping down out of nowhere, hanging over her head every night. Maybe we'd be better off trying to find caves above the waterline each night, she suggested, dropping her armload of wood beside the fire and going back for another. We would, if we can find any, Darion replied. He didn't have to add anything. She'd seen the condition of the walls on the way down herself. There didn't seem to be much in the way of caves. If I have to, I can use magic to enlarge a cave or fissure that is already there, depending upon the conditions at the time. I could maybe make us a shelter, before there were any rains, but that would put out an easily readable magical signature— it's best if we just make a camp as usual, though, because I'd rather not advertise to whatever may be out there. They could camp on the trail itself, but that carried its own risks, and how many more trails would they find as they made their way up the pass? She resolved not to think any more about it. They would be vigilant and improvise— there had been too many surprises on this journey already to try to anticipate all the possibilities and plan for them. Meanwhile, she could gather wood and water and do what she could to make certain that none of them would suffer any long-term effects from their mountain sickness. Steady marching brought them to the end of the pass in three days, and they had pressed themselves to do so in that short a time. The terrain, at least, provided nothing to impede them. It must have been an easy trip for that long-ago army that Vaniel defeated. The tall mountains around them never grew lower, but the valleys between grew broader and wetter. More of their time was spent crossing valley floors, some of them thickly greened valleys that were filled with plants that were entirely new to steel mind. Here they did find furtive signs of people, but never saw any. Kuari reported that the tribes he saw were all small, no more than twenty or thirty people altogether, and they kept away from the travelers and their strange beasts and stranger allies. More streams joined with theirs, and they started to see fish more abundantly. With that, Winter Sky began throwing his line in every time they camped, and they enjoyed the results of his labor. The end of the third day brought them to the end of the pass. It opened out into one of those broad valleys, heavily forested, green, and wreathed with mist— all that day, Keisha had noticed the clouds becoming thicker overhead and the air growing more humid, although there was no sign that it was about to rain. Hrrrr, Kel said as he landed beside them. This is like the highly forests, except that it is not so hot. He looked about with interest. The trees are as big, and it is damp there, like this. Moss and lichen grew thickly underfoot and on the trunks of the trees, and moss hung from the boughs high overhead. All of the trees were varieties of conifer or evergreen, and some were awe-inspiring in their size, even to someone who was used to a veil and the huge trees that grew there. These giants towered above their heads, so high that their tops were lost to sight among the branches of lesser trees. Those trunks were like great, smooth columns, without any branches for such distances that Keisha couldn't see how they could possibly be climbed. This was how they differed from the veil trees, which branched out no more than two or three stories above the ground. These trees went on forever without branching out. It was unlikely that anyone would be using these trees to house an ekele any time soon unless they built from the ground up. But the raptors and Kel all loved the new surroundings and cheerfully went out on scouting forays while the rest moved away from the mouth of the pass and found a secure site to set up camp. 
They all returned at sunset, Kuari last of all, and as they ate fish caught by winter sky and grilled over the fire, each hawk brother related what his bird was telling him. And in the end, even Kel looked troubled by what they had not seen. Where are the people? Kel said finally. We have flown here and there, and there is no sign of people. No sign that anyone has traveled the pass recently either, Darion pointed out, frowning. There were tiny tribes in the other valleys. Shouldn't there be some sign of people here? Could another sickness have come through here and wiped everyone out? If it had, why wouldn't Snow Fox have brought it with them? Keisha asked. They only had wasting sickness and a few other things we already knew how to clear up. Highwell poked at the fire with a stick. People do things differently up here, he said at last. It could be that they are off fishing. Fishing, Winter Sky said incredulously. Fishing? What is that supposed to mean? Highwell looked uncomfortable. I have heard, heard, that on the other side of that mountain there is a great expanse of water so far that you cannot see the other side, and it tastes of salt. This is where the peoples round about here get salt with which to trade, and I have heard that in the spring there are torrents of fish coming up the streams. People gather at the rivers and catch these fish for as long as they come, and it is said that the fish are so thick in the rivers that one can walk from bank to bank upon their backs and keep dry feet. It is said that they can thus dry and smoke enough of these fish to serve them the rest of the year. That sounds like some sort of fable to me, Winter Sky said skeptically. Hywell shrugged. It is only what I have heard. Also, I have tasted of this fish. Traders brought some back with them as provisions. It is good, very rich, and the meat of it is red, not white. Huh, Winter Sky still looked skeptical. White griffin lies beside such a salty water, Kel observed, tilting his head to the side. We call it an ocean or sea. Could this be the same sea? I don't know why not, Steelmind replied. There is no reason why the coastline here could not be much farther to the east than it is where the highly lands lie. It could be a larger lake than we can even imagine. But that doesn't address the question of where the people are. No, it doesn't. But we've only looked close to the mouth of the pass, Darion said. Now, if I were living up here, and I knew that this place existed, and might be used by war parties or even armies, I certainly wouldn't want to live near it. Nods all around the campfire showed that Darion had come up with a reasonable explanation for now. But Keisha had the shivery feeling that this was not the real explanation. After half a day's travel, they had finally come upon signs of people, but the signs weren't good. I don't like this, Darion said, staring at the remains of the village. This place had been more like the permanent village that Ghost Cat had built in Valdemar before it had been deserted. Deserted? Maybe. Maybe not. However the village had become untenanted, it had been too long ago to tell if the people had left, died, or been taken away. All that was left were the moss-covered remains of the log houses, the carved poles, the other artifacts of life. The roofs had fallen in, but that could have happened in a single season. Darion had seen how the kind of roof the ghost cat folks built needed constant attention. As wet as it was here, moss would have started to grow inside immediately. Grass was knee-tall, but there were no possessions, nor the remains of any. Highwell, Darion said, turning to their only expert. 
Highwell looked just as troubled and just as puzzled. I do not know, he said, looking around at the tumbled houses, the fallen poles. There are no bodies and no belongings. Perhaps they... Then he shook his head. No, I do not think they walked away, and it would be foolish to say so. I do not know what happened here. Darion scratched his head. Do you see any signs of attack? he asked reluctantly. What would we be looking for? There would be no signs, Highwill told him. If the tribe was under attack, the men would go out to meet the enemy, and the women and children would remain here. And if the men did not come back, he paused. Well, until Blood Bear began taking other tribes' women, the women and children of the defeated would have been left in peace to rebuild their tribe as best they could. But now we don't know, he considered for a moment. If they were attacked by Blood Bear, wouldn't the victors come here and carry everything off? They certainly tried to do that at Erald's Grove. What if illness killed most of the people here? Keisha asked. Would the survivors just pack up and walk away? They might. Highwell brightened a bit at that. It is tradition that girls go to other tribes to wed, and warriors take wives from other tribes, so there are alliances created all the time. It could happen that they would pack what they had and go, if there were too few hunters to feed the people, or too few people to make a tribe. But this settlement had been huge, larger than the Ghost Cat village was now. Could sickness have wiped out that many people? The ruins held no answers for them now. It had been too long since whatever it was had happened. We move on, he decided. We're nearly to Snow Fox territory anyway. We know that they're all right. Maybe they can tell us what happened here. He didn't have to add that they would have to be wary. They already knew what to do. With Nata taking point, the birds spread out to either side, and Kel watched their back trail. Hashi ranged out in a fan shape in front, filling in wherever another scout wasn't. The one advantage they had was the forest itself. It was damp enough that scent lingered, giving Hashi plenty of information. The scant undergrowth and lack of low branches kept a relatively clear line of sight for them down on the ground and a clear flight path for the birds. But the forest was not continuous. There were huge meadows to cross, with acres and acres of waist-high grasses. They were beautiful, but dangerous. Crossing them meant coming out of cover. They had another one of those meadows ahead of them. This time, though, Darion was fairly certain that they would be safe, for a herd of deer grazed there, and Nata's probe of their minds showed that they felt perfectly comfortable here, which meant they hadn't been hunted recently. Darion was tempted to ask Kel to take one down for them, but decided against the idea. It was too early in the day to stop, and they would have to stop in order to take care of that much meat. So they were the ones who spooked the herd into flight when they came out from under the shadows of the trees. As the deer disappeared, the party moved warily out into the sunshine. Only now could they see the mountains towering on all sides of them, mountains with snow capping their peaks, rising through the thin clouds. It was Darion's turn on weather watch, and he sensed that there were storms moving in from the west. There would be rain tonight. Again. He didn't know what the natives called this land, but he had a few choice selections. When they'd packed for this trip, he hadn't counted on facing rain practically every night. They'd been improvising with limited success. Rain shelters made from boughs and rain sheets didn't keep the precipitation out all night long, and by dawn, everyone was damp. He used magic to dry them out, driving the water from clothing and hair. 
He had no choice. Even though this simple act might signal their presence to an enemy, they could not afford to get sick or pick up something that would rot feet or infect skin. Keisha had to preserve her own strength for things that could not be prevented. Carefully, with all the birds in the air, they crossed the meadow. Steel Mind gathered plants as they walked, stooping over now and again to snatch something that his peculiar gift told him was useful. Already he had a dozen different herbs that he wanted to try cultivating some day. For now, he was content to add flavor and variety to their meals. This time, he walked practically bent over, pulling up bulbs that looked exactly like wild onions, brushing them off and stashing them in the bag at his waist. Darion knew that Hakan, Steel Mind's buzzard, was keeping a sharp eye out for trouble. Hakan circled highest above the clearing and had the widest view. Hakan's type was not the same as the scavenger vultures. It was closer by far to the hawk families. Buzzards had fully feathered heads, mild tempers, and sleepy dispositions. They never exerted themselves if they didn't have to, but that mild and sleepy outward demeanor concealed a determined nature. Hakan would fly through fire to protect steel mines. Winter Sky's little sharp-shin hawk, Kriok, by contrast, was a bundle of nerves. Never able to stay still unless he was asleep, Kriok was making a circuit of the meadow while Kuari stayed in the trees at the point where they would re-enter the forest. Kel was above with Hakan, in position to attack if he was needed. Netta and Hashi kept their noses in the wind, staying beside the humans. The rest of the Daihili spread out all around them, for they were on foot, deciding that it would be better for the humans to present less of themselves above the grass as targets. It was Kuari who sounded the warning before they were a quarter of the way across the vast meadow, but through Kuari's eyes, Darion saw that the hunting party, drawing cautiously towards the meadow, wore the emblem of the snow fox. It's Snow Fox, he shouted, and got into the saddle of the nearest Daihili, the rest no more than a fraction of a moment behind him. Highwill, on Netta, took the lead. Although he was riding on an unfamiliar animal, he wore the familiar clothing of another northerner. And more, he carried with him a token from the Snow Fox women and children and the young warriors still with Ghost Cat. Darion let him race ahead of them. When he came close enough, he dismounted and finished his approach on foot. At that distance, he and the others were no more than dots against the shadow of the trees, but through Kuari's eyes, Darion saw that the meeting was going very well indeed. With that as encouragement, he led the rest on at a brisk lope. By the time they reached Highwell and the hunting party, Highwell and the strangers were acting like old acquaintances. This was a party of young men his own age, which certainly helped, and the faces that they turned to the approaching riders were friendly and smiling. But they soon sobered after the introductions were made, and the initial excitement of the meeting died down. We must make a kill and return quickly, the leader of the hunting party said, with a nervous glance to the east. We are too near to Wolverine territory. They didn't elaborate, and Darion figured that questions could wait until later. We will help, he offered. We should not come to your home empty-handed after all. The Snow Fox hunters were too young to hide their skepticism well, but politely said nothing. But of course, the moment that Darion had offered his help, he, Winter Sky, and Steel Mind had sent off their birds to scout for those deer that they had frightened off earlier. Kel, he called upward. These are snow fox hunters. They need to make some kills and get out of here. When the birds find those deer, can you help out? Ha! 
easily, came the cheerful reply. I will dive at them so that they run toward you. It will be your task to see that at least one or two do not get by you. Creoc located the deer at just that moment, and Kell gave them time enough to get back across the meadow and in place before he began his flush. Darion felt his blood begin to heat and his heart speed up as they approached their ambush point. I beg your indulgence, he said carefully, but there will be a herd of deer running here in a moment. Will you make ready? Now the hunters exchanged thinly veiled looks of amusement. Of course they were amused. This was their land, and they knew the habits and movements of the animals here. How could strangers presume to predict that a herd of deer would come through a particular place? Nevertheless, they were polite young men, and they did indulge this ridiculous foreigner. So when, after a short period of waiting, the herd of deer did come charging through the trees, as if a terrible enemy was on their heels, they were understandably startled. Only two or three of them actually got shots off, and of those, only one hit. Darion and the rest, of course, knew exactly when Kell spooked the deer, and knew that Kell had managed another of his infamous double kills as well— small wonder that the deer fled. Darion and Wintersky targeted the same deer that the snow fox hunter had hit, and the three of them brought it down. Shandi held her fire, as did Steelmind. Hywell brought down a fourth deer by himself. That was more than enough to make them welcome at the snow fox village. One for Kel, three for us. That's generous enough. Darion signaled to Wintersky and Steelmind to come with him. They found Kell, with his two prizes, terribly proud of himself. Ha! Did I not tell you? he shouted happily, holding his head high, his eyes shining. I am as good as my word. Indeed you are, Darion laughed. Would you like us to wrap it up, or will you eat yours here? Some of both, Kell replied. You will clean and dress them here, yes? Why waste good food? I want some marrow, too. So as Darion and the others gutted and dressed the deer, bundling the meat into the hides, Kell gobbled up the entrails and other parts they would normally have left behind— the Diheles flared their nostrils in distaste at the scent of blood, but permitted their riders to load the bundles up behind their saddles. Their attitude toward deer hunting was remarkably pragmatic, considering that they looked so much like Diheli. They didn't like it, but they didn't actually object to it. The general attitude seemed to be, "'Better them than us.' While they proceeded with the messy business of butchering, Darion mind spoke to Neta, the Daihili Doe. Neta, could you ask Hywell to carefully explain Kell to the snow fox hunters for me? he asked, once he had established contact with her. Hmm, yes, I think he had better, was the thoughtful reply. I shall try to help him. When Darion and the others rejoined the rest, Kell came along with them, walking sedately on the ground rather than making one of his spectacular flying entrances. Darion hoped that Hywell and Nada had managed to explain Kell adequately. Then again, knowing the Daihili Doe, she would have no compunction whatsoever about invading their hosts' minds and making certain that they wouldn't panic when they first sighted the griffin. He had some qualms about that. More than a few. Should I have forbidden her to do any such thing? He could have done that but that didn't mean she'd obey him. Daihili had their own code of behavior, one that set the good of the herd above that of any individual, and that meant she would do whatever she thought was in the interest of her herd, in this case, the entire group she was with. 
She would dispassionately disobey orders and lie to him about it. Of all the known creatures with mind speech, only the Daihili could lie successfully when using it. There was no way to compromise with his conscience. He could only accept what happened and try to make up for it afterward. Whether Neta had a hand in it or not, when they came out of the forest and into the sunlight, although the snow fox hunters looked a bit nervous to see Kel, they didn't seem frightened. This is our friend Kelvrin, Darion said carefully. He has made two kills of his own, and wishes to present one of them to Snow Fox as thanks for your hospitality. Kel glanced longingly at the piles of offal laid to the side, but immediately turned his attention back to the hunters. I am honored to make this gift, he said, with a graceful bow and a broad gesture of his taloned forefoot. It is we who are honored by your generosity, the chief hunter said bravely, and, ah, uh, are your tastes similar to those of the hunting birds? If so, would you care to take your choice of the remains before we leave this place? Darion was extremely pleased and a bit surprised by this display of tact and thoughtfulness and it argued powerfully for the notion that Nata had only helped to explain Kell's appearance and had not taken charge of the hunter's minds. Yes, Kell exclaimed, and I thank you. The hunters tactfully looked the other way as Kell pounced upon the pile of discards with relish. Watching a griffin eat was something that took getting used to. It was all too easy to imagine what else that cruel beak and talons could do. He made very short work of the meal, which was indeed a full meal, even by a griffin's standards, and they were shortly on their way. With the meat that would ordinarily have burdened them, loaded on the backs of Daihili, the hunters set off at a lope that made conversation impossible— very clearly they wanted to be gone from this place, and quickly too. Darion longed to ask them why, but knew that he would have to wait. Whatever the answer was, though, he was fairly sure that it had to do with the Wolverine tribe, and that it would not be good news for them. 15. Keisha wasn't the only one who felt the relief in the hunters as they crossed some invisible line into safe territory. They slowed their pace to a trot from what had very nearly been a run. They began to talk among themselves and even make occasional comments to their guests, and at last they finally looked back at the laden Daihili with the satisfaction and anticipation such a fine take of venison warranted. She decided to talk to one of the young men herself, and asked her mount to take her up to the front of the group. She picked the first one that looked over at her and smiled, thinking it would be easier to approach someone who showed some friendliness from the beginning, rather than trying to coax a reaction out of someone determined to keep a stony visage. How much farther do we go to reach your home? she asked him, thinking that would be an easy way to begin a conversation, and grateful that they had all learned the Snow Fox dialect via Daihili before they left Kevaldemar. Not far, the young man told her. He couldn't be much older than Hywel, and was possibly younger. We are within the range of our sentries now, he added and that was a curious addition, or so it seemed to Keisha. Why should that matter to her? Unless he is reassuring me that no one can move upon his village without warning, she thought soberly, like a war party from this Wolverine tribe, perhaps? Their journey had brought them right up to the foot of the mountains, and soon it was evident that they were about to enter a kind of side valley, a cleft with steep cliffs on either side and a small clear stream meandering along the base of the cliff on the left. If the village had not originally been situated with defense in mind, the setting certainly provided as much shelter as if protection had been a major consideration from the beginning. 
defensive cliffs, a water supply. The only thing they would lack if they came under siege would be food, and if they've stored enough, they might be all right. This is our valley, the young hunter said proudly. It has been the home of our tribe from the time of my grandfather's grandfather's grandfather. The snow fox himself led us here, as the snow fox told our shaman to send our sick to Ghost Cat, and then led our sick ones on the journey. Ah? They didn't say anything about that back at the sanctuary, but then again, they might assume we already knew something of the sort must have happened in order for them to find us at all. It seemed that the tribal spirits of these northerners took a very paternal, or was it maternal, interest in their titular tribes. And the other deities of you humans do not, came the impudent query from her Dihili, other deities have a great many more people to oversee, and rarely go so far as to personally lead their followers to help or safety, she pointed out wryly. Perhaps it is easier when your worshippers number less than a hundred to intervene directly in their lives. I am called Benden, the hunter continued diffidently, looking up at her but not meeting her eyes directly. May I know your name, wise woman? Hywell had found a way to get the tribesmen to grant both Keisha and Shandi better status than merely female. Keisha was always introduced as the wise woman, and Shandi as something that translated as woman whose soul is a man. Apparently there were a few female warriors in the history of the tribes, and they'd had to come up with a category to fit them into. Man-souled women, who passed the boys' initiation trials, could become hunters and warriors, but they sacrificed the traditional role of wife and mother in order to attain that status. They were considered neither male nor female, rather like the Shinain sword-sworn, in a way. At any rate, that was Shandi's role, and she went along with it, since taking on that persona at least allowed her to sit at the men's fire with the rest of the party and not suffer a lonely exile to the company of the clan's women. It said something for the status of wise woman that Benden gave Keisha his name. A mere woman would have had to learn it obliquely, by overhearing it or learning it from one of her friends, for he would never have addressed her directly if she had not had that rank. I am called Keisha, she said. Has Snow Fox a wise woman of their own, or does the shaman conduct all healing? We have only the shaman, and he has no healing magic. That is why the snow fox sent to us to take our sick into the south, Benden said eagerly. Have you been sent by the fox to teach our shaman in the ways of southern healing? Boy's a quick one, isn't he? chuckled the Daihili. I have. Your people reached us safely, as you know, and I came in answer to your need, she replied solemnly, taking the question as the gift it was. That we bear trade goods is as a protection, so that others will not interfere with our passage. It is wise, though I do not think it would avail you with Wolverine, he replied, then shrugged and changed the subject, trotting along at her stirrup with no sign of effort. We have some sick still with us, too ill to travel. I hope you will be able to help them. I hope so too, she said sincerely. When they reached the village, it was apparent that this was a permanent enclave, unlike some of the other hunting camps they had visited. Here were the familiar log houses, decorated and carved, roofed with slabs of bark. The characteristic poles stood prominently before each house with totemic animals and spirit representations carved into them. Even more than at Ghost Cat, there were piecework blankets on display made of felted and dyed fur, and the costumes of the inhabitants were covered with embroideries made with tufts of dyed fur. 
It was clear that this was a prosperous tribe. It was also clear that the invisible sentries had already alerted the chief and shaman that visitors were being escorted in. Women and children clustered at the entrances to the log houses, craning their necks and straining their eyes for a good look at the strangers, but also ready to bolt inside at a hint that there was something amiss. The chief and shaman marched forward to meet them, surrounded by armed warriors older and more experienced than the young hunters. Hywell bounded from his saddle, and together with Benden came forward to speak with the leaders of Snow Fox. He displayed the token that the Snow Fox folk back in Valdemar had given them, and soon the faces of those around him were relaxed, even smiling. The warriors lowered their weapons, and with that sign that all was well, the women and children began to ease closer. The shaman headed straight for Keisha once the formalities were over. She dismounted rather than tower over him as he approached. Gray-haired and bearded, he was a handsome old fellow by anyone's standards, with strong features and lively eyes. Knotwork was layered down the front edges of his mantle, with points of antler serving as closures alternating from side to side. The colors picked for the tufting between the antler tips exactly matched his eyes. Wise woman Keisha, I am Shaman Henkir Told True. I am warmed to see your presence. May your spirits bless you for coming to us, he exclaimed, seizing her hand. The chief's woman and children are ill, as are several more too ill to send to Ghost Cat with the others, and I have had no success with them. The Snow Fox told me I must wait for a healer out of the south. Benden told me, she replied, clasping the old man's hand. Is it the wasting sickness, summer fever? Those were both names for the same illness, the disease that struck the channels that carried the commands of the mind to the body, causing weakness and paralysis. Nay, it is something else, another new sickness out of the times of evil magic and heart-sick skies, something that chokes the breath but does not weaken the muscles. So short of breath are they that we dared not send them over mountain, for the mountain sickness would have killed them. When they move with any forcefulness at all, they become unable to breathe, but they cannot stay completely still, he told her, and she felt a little thrill of excitement, though she immediately was ashamed of being excited at someone else's misfortune. Still, the prospect of seeing something new— let us go to them, and I will see what may be done, she said instantly. All else can wait. The old man's eyes lit up. Ha! Ah, you are a true wise woman, he exclaimed, leading her to think that perhaps he had encountered those who had not been as dedicated to their duty. Come, and I will show you. The sick folk had been isolated from the others in a separate log house, Although there were no windows, the roof had actually been propped up here and there to provide fresh air and ventilation. But the patients were bundled up near the fire, all of them weak, feverish, and thin. An effort had been made using thick slabs of bark set upright in an overlapping edged ring to make sure that the smoke from the central fire was at a minimum— Nevertheless, there was constant deep coughing coming from nearly everyone around the fire. The shaman told the stricken ones who this strange woman was, and in response there were murmurs of relief between rasps and coughing fits. Keisha examined the child nearest to her at the shaman's urging, opening her shields and sinking her awareness deep into the body before her. It didn't take her long to identify what was wrong, and it was a disease new to her, something that lived in the lungs, scarring them and turning them from a healthy honeycomb to a useless solid mass. But for all its toughness, for all that it was, if unchecked, absolutely deadly, it was no match for the forces she could wake in the body of its host with her power— 
It thrived because it walled itself off from those forces with scar tissue. She could break that wall down. She gave the child a good first treatment before she emerged from her healing trance to see the shaman staring at her with intense interest. "'Have you the mastery of this magic?' she asked him, "'the way of seeing inside the body and going to war with sickness.' "'Nay, but my student has,' he said instantly. "'I could not teach him, and he has been doing the best that he could "'without any learning, trusting to instinct. "'I shall go to fetch him, if you would deign to teach him. "'That's a relief.' Please, that is why I am here, and if you would call upon the spirits as well, while we help the sick ones, it would be well, she told him. It is not good to treat only the body and leave the spirit untouched. He grinned broadly and got to his feet, leaving the log house only to return in a few moments with a very young man, perhaps fourteen or fifteen, and a bundle, which proved to be a set of drums, wrapped in a charm-bedecked cape. The boy bobbed his head awkwardly at her, and she smiled in a way she hoped would encourage him. She could tell already that he had used his healing powers in much the same way that she had at that age, crudely, because he never had a real teacher. The shaman at least recognized his power, but he was unable to teach him. Instinct and necessity had given him some direction, but to go any further he needed proper instruction. "'You've done well by yourself,' she told him, as the shaman donned his cape and cast cedar on the fire. "'You are like a carver who has been making good images with only an axe. I will give you fine knives as well, with which to do your work.' He brightened at the praise and nodded enthusiastically at her explanation. "'Yes,' the boy all but shouted. "'That is exactly how I have been feeling. "'I know that there is a way to do things, but I cannot make them happen. "'Oh, wise woman, but show me the way, and I will speak your name to the spirits forever.' "'Exactly,' she patted his hand and placed it on top of hers, "'for the physical contact would help her make mind-to-mind -mind contact. "'Now, prepare yourself.' and let me show you what I know. Keisha worked with the young student until they were both exhausted. By that time, all of the people suffering from the illness that the shaman had termed hammer lung had been given their first treatment. The disease was treacherous and tenacious, and would need many more treatments to be eradicated. The young student had gotten his bearings, and Keisha was certain he would make a fine healer in time. Tomorrow I'll ask Shandi to give me a hand, maybe Darion too. We'll get these people over the worst of their illness before we leave. Something in the back of her mind teased at her. There had to be a way to give this young man more of her own knowledge, but she couldn't make the thought come clear. Finally, she let it go. If she didn't work so hard at it, it would probably surface by itself. That was how things seemed to work for her. When there was a problem that could be solved with quick thought, it would be at the forefront of her awareness. But if it would take a long time to solve a problem, then it would be mulled over behind her consciousness until finally popping up as a clear solution. The patients were already feeling and looking better. She'd been able to advise some other things that let them breathe more easily, things that the shaman could do in addition to his spiritual ministrations. Although, I have to wonder, I've never been able to work alone for quite so long before. Time seemed to move slowly for me, but it never dragged on. I am tired, but not as completely exhausted as I would normally be. Maybe those spirits of his were helping out. The student stumbled off to his bed, glowing with the satisfaction that only comes with accomplishment. The shaman packed up his gear and offered to conduct her to the men's fire. Please, she said gratefully. It was very dark outside the log house, and she really wasn't up to stumbling around looking for the men. I would appreciate that. 
Henkir beamed his pleasure, his beard practically bristling with cheer. This had been a good day for him, status-wise. The foreign wise woman, sent by the tribal totem, had deferred to him, requested that he specifically tend to the souls and spiritual needs of the sick ones, and now had asked him to escort her to the men's fire. If he had feared the possibility of losing status because of her appearance, those fears had been totally put to rest. Completely aside from her personality, for those reasons alone, he would have liked her. He led her out of the log house as the patients settled into what must have been their first restful sleep for many weeks. Soft calls of thanks and well-wishes faded away behind as the pair walked. Even though there hadn't been a lot of light inside the house, thanks in part to the smoke shielding around the fire pit, it was incredibly dark outside it. The cliffs on either side cut off most of the sky, and the moon was not yet up. Mist wreathed among the trees, the smoky air, cedar-scented and damp, penetrated Keisha's clothing and made her shiver. She was quite glad that she had accepted his guidance before they had gone more than a few paces, for the men's fire, as was the custom at Ghost Cat, had been sequestered in a remote pocket from the rest of the village. By contrast, the women's fire, which they passed as they walked between two more log houses, was right in the center of the village, with the women and young children clustered about it, laughing, talking, and eating. There was a wonderful smell of roast meat and some sort of bread, of wild herbs and onions. Her stomach growled. The fire they sought was in a little pocket carved into the cliff when an enormous boulder came crashing down from above some time in the far past. The boulder itself, the size of one of the log houses, shielded the sight of the entrance to the pocket from the rest of the village, and even hid the reflected firelight. The pocket canyon was as welcoming as a conventional hearth in a Valdemarin home. Firelight warmed the air and the stone walls, and if there was no roof, tonight at least there was no need of one either. The men welcomed her to the circle simply by making space for her beside Darion and passing a wooden platter loaded with roasted tubers, onions, and venison to her. She was famished, and with a nod and a word of thanks, set to her meal. She ate as they did, with her fingers and a small, stubby eating knife, keeping her head over her platter so that the juices from the meat dripped back down onto her food. The shaman immediately took command of the conversation, telling the chief the good news, both that his wife and children were on the way to being cured, and that the shaman's young student would soon have the special healing magics of the southerners himself. The chief would not rush to thank Keisha here, in front of the rest of the men, but the look of gratitude he threw at her told her he would definitely be approaching her in private. She sensed that before their arrival the conversation had taken a dark and foreboding tone, and that the chief had welcomed the change their good news brought. Meanwhile, the food warmed and filled her, and tasted wonderful, especially after the somewhat meager meals of the past few days. As her hunger eased, she started feeling how tired she really was. Tired, not sleepy. She was content to sit beside the fire and listen to the men and Shandi talking. She had closed her shields in tight around her, knowing that she would be oversensitive after all her work, and as a consequence felt as if she were wrapped in a cocoon that kept the rest of the world at a comfortable distance. She had her footwear off, and her soles baked deliciously from their proximity to the slow fire as she lay back and closed her eyes for a while. The earnest conversation that her entrance had interrupted resumed after the shaman described with great pride the work of his apprentice. He's right to be proud. The boy outdid himself, and he's a fast learner. He's one I certainly won't forget. 
but already the conversation had gone back to bleaker subjects. There is no doubt that Wolverine has taken up what Bloodbear left off, the chief said, with a glance over his shoulder into the darkness, as if he feared that a spy from Wolverine tribe might be lurking there. The difference, though, is that they raid, not destroy. Their raiding parties come farther south every moon. They take everything of value, male children less than five, widows and unmated females of breeding age. If a tribe dares to resist, they cripple the warriors after they have won. Ah, but first they come all smiles and offer alliance, or rather encourage their servitude to Wolverine, the shaman interjected. It is only if the tribe fights that they raid. Keisha was too tired to feel anything for herself and too protected behind her walls to feel what the others felt, but the tension and concern beat against her protections and would flood her if she let it. Oh, but alliance means to surrender half of the provisions and goods, and all of the unmated females, and all boys down to the toddlers, the chief scoffed. I do not call that generous. They have not found us yet, the shaman confided to Keisha. That is why we are unmolested. Our valley hides us well. She nodded. She had not seen the mouth of the valley until they were practically inside it. Your sentries are to be given credit too, I would think, Winter Sky observed. Steel Mind nodded, even as he frowned, and Shandi spoke up. It isn't just your location or your sentries, is it? she asked, and looked directly at the shaman. You are concealing. You are hiding the tribe, honored one, using your powers, aren't you? Not I. The snow fox hides us, as he himself hides in winter, the shaman protested, but he looked pleased. Darion raised his eyebrow at Shandi and smiled at the shaman in a conspiratorial fashion. The shaman gave Darion the same smile, mage to mage, exchanging the compliment of recognizing each other's handiwork. I do what little I can, the shaman said modestly, but too much done to hide our people would reveal rather than conceal them. Wolverine has a shaman too, whose power is of the eclipse, and he will see the use of power should I overstep myself. That's why the hunting parties are on their own, Darion made it a statement. He sighed. I can't think of any way of concealing them that wouldn't betray them just as readily. You are perfectly right to be cautious. Our skill will conceal us, the chief hunter spoke up, with all the arrogant certainty of someone who has never met with failure yet. We can outwit any wolverine scout. This time it was the chief who exchanged a raised eyebrow with Darion. For all Darion's apparent relative youth, it was clear that the chief of Snowfox realized he had a great deal of experience, and Keisha hid her own smile of pride. Why is it that you have no wise woman of your own? Shandi asked, knowing now, after seeing so many other tribes, that when the shaman was not a healer, his work was generally supplemented by a wise woman. She went to the ancestors before she could find a successor, the shaman told her, sighing heavily. That was many years ago. My pupil has the healing touch, and there is another boy who I will train in my own work when he comes to his manhood trial. But it is not fit that I seek out a girl child to become a wise woman." In other times, the wise woman of one of our allies would have found and trained such a girl, but we have had little contact with our friends since Wolverine began raiding. We have not had the great midsummer gathering for two years. Even as tired as she was, Keisha knew that was a very bad sign. Even at the height of the mage storms, the midsummer gatherings had taken place— they were the only time that all the tribes came together under a truce banner, 
a time for trading, finding mates in other tribes, exchanging information, making alliances. If they had not been held for two years, none of these things were happening, and the peaceful tribes were becoming more and more isolated from each other. He looked hopefully at Keisha, who grimaced. We have another task, she said reluctantly. It has been put upon us by both the ghost cat and the raven spirits that we seek the raven tribe. She did not say why, but no one would ask if she did not volunteer the information. It would be assumed that it was private business between her people and the spirits. The shaman's face fell. He had probably been hoping that she had been sent for the benefit of Snow Fox alone, and would remain until both his apprentice and a new wise woman had been chosen and trained. Keisha felt badly for him, and added, I will do all I can to leave you with all that Snow Fox needs. Not that I have any idea how to do that, she added to herself. Healing isn't like a language that can be dumped entire into someone's head by a Daihili. Or was it? Could Neta extract everything that Keisha knew about healing and deposit it in the minds of the young apprentice and anyone else who needed to have it? And if she could, would it be more dangerous to do that than leave them on their own? Having so much information dumped into his mind at once might drive the poor apprentice mad, unless there was a way to keep it out of his conscious mind until he needed it. I don't know. There has to be some terrible price hidden in it somewhere, inventive or not. It seems too easy somehow. In this world, we sometimes get lucky, but we never get things easy. The best creature to ask would be Neta herself, and that would have to wait for morning. Now she was sleepy, and a warm fire and full stomach were contributing to that. For the moment, it didn't matter how much anxiety the rest of them felt, it couldn't penetrate to keep her awake. She wasn't the only one. There were plenty of hunters and warriors, blinking their heavy eyes trying to stay awake. It wasn't long before the shaman excused himself, and the chief offered to send his guests to his own log house for rest. Darion accepted for all of them, and Keisha was glad. Beyond the fire the mist was getting heavy, and there would probably be rain before morning. At least tonight they'd sleep dry. And she was too sleepy now to care about anything else. Morning brought the unfamiliar sounds of children chattering like a tree full of birds near at hand, and Keisha woke all at once with no intermediate drowsing between dream and wakefulness. She remembered at once where she was, partly because of the rush of unfamiliar smells, and stretched happily beneath her bright and borrowed blankets— there was rain pounding on the roof above her head, and from the sound of it, the storm was good for the rest of the day. If they'd been outside, they'd have started the day soaked again. Would rain keep raiding parties stuck in one place? Now that she wasn't so tired, she remembered the conversation last night, and it wasn't just the chill and damp draft sneaking under her chin that made her shiver suddenly. Wolverine tribe. They sounded too much like the tribe that had almost destroyed Erald's Grove. Not good news, and we'll have to get past them to get to Raven. That was worse news. Would they have to skulk across the countryside from bit of cover to bit of cover? These raiding parties, how many were there? I wonder if Darion wants to use magic to hide us— the existence of another enemy mage made that potentially as dangerous as going unhidden. How did these people rank mages anyway? And how strong was he? How skilled? Journeyman? Master? Worst of all, adept? Would they be unfortunate enough to encounter some sort of mage they had never even thought of, whose powers would be a total surprise? She felt anxiety starting to get hold of her and fought it off. 
There was no point in getting worried about something that was in the future, something she couldn't affect, for that matter. It was not that she disliked planning or even speculating, but there was such a thing as pointless worry in a case like this. This wasn't her problem, or at least it wasn't her problem unless and until Darion asked her opinion. For now, her problem was to work with the shaman, and she really ought to find out what his name was. Uh, no, wait. Hank. Hank. Hankier. Hankier told true. That prompted the recollection of her thoughts the night before about enlisting the help of the Daihili in transferring healing knowledge directly to the young apprentice, and possibly, if she could find one, a potential wise woman. Language was at least as complicated as healing. The problem with transferring it all at once was that healing involved the use of power, a power very like mage energy, and it involved using techniques that could leave the healer's mind perilously open. But what else did I think of last night? Ah, I remember now. Would it be possible to transfer the knowledge in such a way that it only becomes available when the person needs it? But no, that wouldn't work, because they might need it before they were ready to handle it. Perhaps it becomes available when the person masters something keyed to that. No one had ever tried anything like this before, not that she knew of. But just because no one has ever done it before, that doesn't mean it can't be done. Once again, though, she knew only that she didn't know enough. She would have to ask the Daihili Neta, as she had thought last night at the very least. Perhaps the shaman might know something out of his own traditions that would help. It would be so nice just to go back to sleep and forget this for a little longer, she thought wistfully. It had been so long since she'd had the luxury of sleeping until she felt completely rested. But now that she was awake, her restless mind wouldn't let her go back to sleep again. Too much to do. She shoved the thought of drowsing away resolutely and pushed the blankets aside. Like the log houses of Ghost Cat, the log house of the Chief of Snow Fox had little cubicles around the walls used for storage and sleeping in a modicum of privacy. Presumably, because Snow Fox was a very prosperous tribe, the barrier between the cubicle and the rest of the house was not a simple curtain, but was one of the beautiful piecework felt blankets— it cut off the light from the central hearth fire much better than a cloth curtain would have. It was as dark as a cave in their cozy nest. She sat up and swung her legs over the edge of the platform bed she shared with Darion, and he stirred. Getting up, he asked. He didn't sound sleepy, and she wondered if he had been awake and thinking as long as she had. I've got so much I need to do, she began. Anything I can help with? He sat up, too. I knew you were really concentrating on something, and I wondered what about. You seemed tense. I don't, she began, then stopped as a thought interrupted her. Hadn't she been thinking that the power she used in healing was like magic? And hadn't he added his power to hers in the past? Maybe he had an answer, or part of the answer she was looking for— Quickly, she explained what she had been thinking of doing. Do you know of a way to keep that knowledge locked up until the person is ready for it? She asked. He pondered her question, giving it full attention. She couldn't see his face clearly, but she sensed he was concentrating, trying to remember something. I think it can be done, he said finally. You'd have to be awfully good, though. I... Don't think I could do something like that. Maybe an adept could. She grimaced, disappointed but not surprised. I'll see if their shaman knows of something that would work. You never know. I might as well get up too, he said, levering himself up out of bed beside her, his long hair strung across his face in tangles. There's a lot to get done. 
I think that we'd better stay here until the sick are healed, so we can have Snow Fox's full support when it's time to move on. It can only help. He sounded as wistful as she was, though. Sometimes I wonder if the only time we'll ever get to be lazy is if we get sick ourselves. Don't even think that, she chided, and reached for her clothing, handing him his. We can't afford to be sick. They both got dressed, and Keisha pushed aside the partition blanket, stepping out into the central room. The shaman's wife hurried to greet them, handing them bowls of porridge made with crushed nuts and sweetened with honey. It was very good, and a nice change from the breakfasts of cold meat they'd been having. They were the first ones awake from their group, although some stirring and muttering indicated that the rest weren't too far behind them in getting up. Keisha finished her breakfast quickly and got her rain cloak, heading out to find the shaman and begin the morning's treatments. The shaman was waiting for her at the house holding all the sick, and before she and his apprentice began work, he made a point of offering her a second breakfast, this time of a kind of bread or cake made of the same crushed nut mixture. She was not at all averse to having more to eat, knowing that she would need all the energy she could get. As they ate, the shaman introduced his apprentice as Lothar, Henkir's wife made all the meals for the sick isolated here in this house and had sent extra for Keisha, her husband, and his pupil. "'Your wife is extremely accommodating,' Keisha said dryly, thinking how much work a woman of the tribes did just to keep her own family fed, clothed, and cared for, never mind adding on the care of a dozen sick people.' My wife tells me just how accommodating she is on a regular basis, he replied, just as dryly. But I agree with her, even when she is not nearby to hear it. Keisha covered her mouth with one hand, stifling her giggles. Young Lothar laughed outright, and Henkir grinned behind his beard. I think that this may be the case with all worthy spouses, Henkir told them. Perhaps they fear that if they are too silent, we will come to take them for granted. He put aside his cup of hot herb drink and stood up. Are you ready for the morning's work? More than ready, she told him, and the three of them approached the first patient of the day together. After rest and a noon meal that she ate so fast she didn't even taste it, Keisha went out in search of the Daihili. She was altogether gratified to learn from the shaman that the Daihili and Carlos had been housed in the communal storage house, rather than forced to spend the rainy night and day out in the weather. The children, who shed the water like so many ducklings and evidently considered this to be balmy weather, were making a great game of going out and tearing up armloads of grass to feed to the four-legged guests. She spotted a group of them running into the storage house, shrieking with laughter, so laden with long, wet bundles of grass that they looked like so many little walking haystacks. She followed them, and soon discovered why the sport of feeding the Daihili was so popular. The Daihili were earning their dinner by taking turns telling stories. Of course, when a Daihili told a story, it appeared in the listener's head, complete with pictures, sounds, and smells. The children were absolutely enraptured. This was better entertainment than anything they'd ever encountered before. It was not yet Netta's turn to tell a story, so Keisha was able to take her aside and quiz her on the possibility of transferring knowledge rather than language. Netta considered the question, then diffidently asked Keisha for free access to her mind. Keisha sat down on a pile of furs and obliged, sitting in case this turned out to cause the kind of reaction that a language transfer did, and she passed out cold. 
She didn't drop over, although Netta's explorations left her with the oddest feeling, as if her mind was a box whose contents were being meticulously turned over and examined one bit at a time. It felt strangely like the mountain sickness, crossed with being intoxicated on very bad wine and then being flattened thoroughly with a rolling pin, but not minding it at all. I think the transfer can be done, Netta finally said, when she'd withdrawn her mind from Keisha's. The problem would be that healing involves development and exercise of mental powers— rather like training muscles for strength. If a young one tried to use the knowledge before he had the strength, it could harm him, worse than another healer could fix. Keisha ground her teeth in frustration. Not that she hadn't already been afraid that would be the case, but it was disappointing in the extreme. Let me think of this and consult with Carless, Netta added, responding to her frustration with a sympathy that surprised her. There may be something that we can do. The Daihili Doe looked across the room at the companion, who responded by joining them immediately. Carless regarded Keisha with an unreadable, deep blue gaze, then turned his attention toward Netta. While the children in the corner giggled and exclaimed over the story one of the young bucks was telling them, Keisha watched the silent colloquy going on between the companion and the doe, and wondered what they were talking about. Finally, Netta turned back toward Keisha. If we think of knowledge as something to be held, then what you need is a container from which a little can be taken at a time, yes? More like a smart container that knows how much to dole out, but yes, something like that, she replied, intrigued by the analogy. Carlos suggests that we ask the snow fox to be that container. Shaman Henkir was at first surprised speechless, then briefly appalled, then intrigued by Keisha and Netta's suggestion. It has merit, he said cautiously. If this could be done, it would mean that we need never fear the loss of a wise woman, for the snow fox would always hold this wisdom in its keeping. The old stories hold that the people give knowledge to the gods. That is why we do not become like stagnant water, for we can create and give that knowledge to benefit the totem. The snow fox might be pleased by this, yes. Keisha did not ask why the snow fox didn't already have that knowledge to dispense. The tribal totems didn't seem to be so much gods as benevolent overseers and benefactors. They certainly weren't all-seeing and all-knowing, or they would have been able to protect their own tribes from the depredations of others. It was said, even in Valdemar, that gods received power and support from their followers, and they in turn helped those followers prosper. She wondered if there was a kind of spiritual warfare going on among the totemic animals, with the stronger paving the way for the conquest of the weaker as the totemic spirits defeated each other. It was actually a rather frightening thought. If that were the case, it was no wonder that the tribes spent so much time in strengthening their totems with prayer and worship. How would we find out if the snow fox was willing to be the vessel for this knowledge, she asked aloud, and the shaman's eyes widened as he looked over her shoulder. She felt a cool breath on the back of her neck, and turned to find herself staring into a pair of amused, milky blue cat-like eyes. She flinched backward, which elicited a look of frank amusement from the manifestation. The eyes were set in a head with a sharply pointed muzzle and a pair of blunt, pointed ears. The head was attached to a body the size of a small pony, but it was a resemblance in scale only. 
The furred body was a misty white and translucent, just as the shadowy spirit of the ghost cat had been. Tiny sparkles of white light, like twinkling stars, fell away from the apparition in all directions as slow as falling dust motes in sunlight. Time seemed to slow for Keisha, and there was only one thing that she could think. I guess we have our answer. Sixteen. Another day, another deity. On the whole, even after hearing from Keisha about the bizarre manifestation of the snow fox itself and its subsequent absorption of her healing knowledge, Darion regretted leaving this latest tribe. But there was no choice. Something strong and true and part of him drove him on. If he gave up now, how could he remain himself? They left Snow Fox better provisioned than they had arrived. Dried meat, nut meal, and dried berries made their saddlebags bulge, and in the packs of trade goods, gold nuggets replaced packets of dye. Keisha now wore two token necklaces instead of one. In addition to the owl, she wore a string of tiny carved foxes of mother of pearl. The snow fox shaman had given her that just before they left. Keisha tried to think little of what she had done, but inside, Darion figured Keisha knew she had just given an entire tribe of people an edge against the cruelties of the wild world. The customs of the tribes made effusive thanks from a male to a female unlikely. Given everything she'd done to heal their sick, he figured she more than deserved that necklace, and it was one of the few ways that the shaman could show his gratitude. In fact, by rights, she should have been bedecked by a dozen such necklaces by now, one for every tribe she'd helped, and for every wise woman and shaman she'd tutored in the Valdemarin use of the healing gift. I think that Keisha is blissfully unaware of what a huge impact she is having upon an entire culture by what she gives so selflessly. The tribes may worship or thank the holy Daihili now, but it is Keisha and the others in green they talk about plenty among each other, I'll wager. They had good instructions on how to reach Raven Tribe, and the origin of the Vests had been confirmed. One more stretch of mountains lay between them and their goal, one more stretch that just happened to be claimed by Wolverine. Every time he thought about Wolverine, an odd chill touched him for just a moment. This is as far as I can take you, their guide said at about noon on the second day after they had left Snow Fox. He looked out over the valley that stretched out before them with some regret, you wish to aim for that pass between those two peaks, he said, pointing. On the other side is the bitter water and the raven tribe. And between us and them is trouble. He didn't give any sign that he was worried, though. He just thanked the hunter with as much sincerity as he could show and watched as the man trotted off into the shelter of the forest that Snow Fox called its territory, melting into the undergrowth almost like a Taledras might. He looked back over his own group. Keisha was worried, but he could hardly blame her for that. Hywell was as confident as any young and untried warrior. He happily bore the arrogance of ignorance. Steelmind was as calm as one of the mountain peaks, winter sky impatient to be gone, and Shandi unreadable. The non-humans displayed a similar mix of emotional stances. It's probably going to take us twice as long to cross this stretch as it's taken before, he said, mostly to Keisha and Shandi. If you thought we were being careful before, you were wrong. We're truly going into enemy territory now, and we'll be moving accordingly. Shandi nodded alertly. Kel overhead, the birds out in front, the Daihili, Carlos, and Hashi behind them, then us following on foot. Right? Absolutely right. 
He felt rather gratified that she had caught on so quickly, but then she was a herald, and heralds got some military training. The only difference between this group and a group of the guard or local militia was that their scouts had wings, paws, and hooves. He dismounted, and the rest did the same, taking time to tighten every baggage strap and harness fastener so that the hooved ones wouldn't be hindered by loose baggage. Then every stirrup was tied up so that they didn't dangle free either. If they had to run for it, having the stirrups out of the way would make mounting and riding harder, but not impossible, especially not since their mounts were Daihili and a companion. He gave the mental signal to Kuari that the owl had been waiting for, then called Kel. All right, Silver Griffin, we're moving out. Take high point. I am ready, came the reply from somewhere aloft. The way is clear to the next stretch of trees. Dodge to your left to make use of the runoff ravine and follow it to the light gray stack of boulders. The Dihili and Carlos spread out, trotting down through the waist high meadow grass, heading for the trees. Hashi was with them, but invisible in the grass. He could have left a wake in the grass, but he didn't and wouldn't. The Kyrie were masters of moving invisibly. Now it was the humans' turn, and despite having been given the word that there were no enemies in the immediate vicinity, they moved cautiously across the open stretch, hunched down near the tops of the grasses. Those who had bows had arrows loosely knocked to the strings. Winter Sky and Darion, as the two most experienced in this sort of movement, took point. Highwell took right flank, Shandi the left, and Steelmind the rear, putting Keisha in the relatively protected middle. Darion wondered briefly if that rankled with her, then centered all of his attention on scanning the territory ahead. It was hard to remain on the alert when from all the signs there was no need to be. Tiny birds flitted through the stalks of the grass or skimmed ahead of them, chasing the insects they scared up. Occasionally they kicked up a rabbit. Other than that, the meadow drowsed in the warm late spring sun, with some puffy clouds around to the west beginning to develop darker bottoms that might promise more rain. Darion figured that as long as he remained in a posture of readiness, the others would take their cue from him, especially Hywel, who might well need reminding. The greatest danger was that because the meadow was at least a league wide, enemies might appear before they had crossed it. The Daihili and Kairi, Kel and Carlos ought to be able to spot them in time to take cover in the grass, but that would leave them horribly vulnerable. But they made it into the shelter of the forest again without mishap, and Darion relaxed a little, but only a little. There was one advantage here. The giant trees were interspersed with normal trees, and that gave them an escape route and a hiding place into the boughs of those trees. They had gone about another league into that forest, relying on Kel and the birds to guide them towards the mountain pass that was their goal, when Hashi sounded a warning of his own. I sent a party of humans, many smelling of fear, the rest of fighting. They come from the northeast and are coming straight for you. Darion had been planning escape routes all along as they moved through the forest. Steelmind, you and Shandi, up that tree, he shouted, pointing to a cedar. He turned and pointed to another, Winter Sky and Hywel, up there. He grabbed Keisha's hand and ran for a third tree, a black pine. All three had the advantage of very thick foliage as well as branches near enough to the ground to be hooked by the climbing stick, a hooked half-weapon and half-tool device that all three Taledras carried. 
He pulled his own climbing stick from the sheath on his back as he ran, slung his bow over his shoulder, and shoved the arrow he'd had ready back into the quiver. In a practiced move, he aimed the hook of his climbing stick at an overhead branch as he ran and used his momentum to carry him up the trunk. He went hand over hand up the stick as he scrambled over the bark of the trunk and once lodged securely on the branch he had hooked, pulled the climbing stick loose and extended it to Keisha. She grabbed it and he pulled her up beside him, then repeated the process with the next branch. Once they were high enough that the branches were closer together, Keisha could climb up by herself without his aid. At that point, he stowed his climbing stick and worked his way up the trunk until they were both well hidden from below. Kuari, I need you, he called. I come, the owl replied immediately. As he waited for Kuari, he made contact with each of the outliers, making sure that the Daihili stayed well out of the way, the Kairi hid himself, and Kel stayed high overhead. Kuari came into land just as he heard the most distant sounds of forest disturbance, the scolding of corvids. Go perch where you can see the enemy, Darion told the owl. Then let me use your eyes." Kuari hooted softly and ghosted down out of the tree, choosing a branch a little lower, with nothing else between it and the ground. He perched there and set his feet well onto the branch, then relaxed, and Darion saw what he was seeing. No doubt Winter Sky and Steel Mind were doing the same with their birds. A bit higher on the trunk than he was, Keisha tied herself into place as a precaution against becoming unbalanced. Darion was so comfortable in trees now that he didn't need such helps. He could fall asleep in the fork of a tree without losing his balance, and had in the past. He still preferred to live in an ekele firmly planted on the ground, but that was just a preference. The scolding of crows came nearer, and through the owl's eyes, Darion got his first sight of the warriors of Wolverine. There were more than twenty, perhaps as many as thirty of them. They were more heavily armed and armored than any northerners that Darion had seen since his last encounter with the fighters of Bloodbear. Most had breastplates of boiled leather and arm guards and greaves of hammered bronze. All had bronze helmets and iron swords. They also carried javelins or short spears with iron points and long daggers. A few were also armed with bows. But they were not alone. They had taken prisoners, many prisoners. The captives had been divided into three groups, young women, young boys, and girls. The prisoners within each group were strung out in single file, and the women and girls, though not the boys, were tied together at the waist by a rope that led from one to the next. In addition, the older women were also tied at the wrists. The boys, all under the age of five, were allowed freedom of movement. There must have been a hundred prisoners, and by the decorations on their costumes, they were of some fox tribe— were they allied with Snow Fox, or even related to them? Their captors were, without a doubt, of Wolverine. They bore the insignia of their tribe on everything, but they also bore the sign of the Eclipse. The sight of that symbol, even though it was through Kuari's eyes, made his blood run cold, and a sour taste came up the back of his throat— the last time he had seen that symbol, it had been terrifyingly close, on a pendant around the neck of the blood bear shaman. But this time there was no sign of the weird, half-human creatures that blood bear had counted among its warriors. These were no more than humans. Very well armed, very large and muscular humans, who seriously outnumbered Darion's group and much as he longed to drop down out of the tree, slashing at them with his climbing stick, he knew better. He wouldn't stand a chance, and from the cowed and beaten look of the women, they wouldn't even be able to muster the spirit to use his attack as a distraction to make a break for freedom. 
but it was hard to hide in safety and do nothing when he watched one of the warriors trip one of the women with his spear butt and laugh to see her stumble. Then, when he saw the fear in the eyes of girl captives barely into puberty, they knew what their fate would be as soon as they arrived at the Wolverine village. Darion had to repeat to himself that there was nothing he or his friends could do, but his hands clenched so tightly on the tree trunk that the bark bit into his palm and his fingernails were white. He felt another's anger as well, and realized that Kel, circling high above, was also looking through Kuari's eyes, and was just as enraged as he was. Griffins had always had an inherent hatred for slavery as a matter of principle, and this was making the griffins' hackles rise and quickly. Kel, he called immediately, don't attack. This is an order, Silver Griffin. Stay aloft. He felt Kel's wordless protest, and from the way that Keisha turned pale and clutched the trunk, so did she. It was the anger surge of a great predator, immensely larger and more powerful than Kuari, a predator that needed to kill. Kel clamped it down after that first surge, but it left both Darion and Keisha shaking with reaction in the aftermath of the experience. Poor Keisha. She's never seen him this way. I have. I know him for what he is. He is a killer with civilization. Kel was the sweetest and most genial creature alive, until his killing instincts were aroused. At that point, there was no creature Darion knew of that was more murderous and less stoppable. They clung to the tree, silent, each alone with his thoughts, as Wolverine paraded their captives past them and on to their own village. Darion tried to concentrate on memorizing everything he could about the warriors, and that was when he noticed something odd. The Wolverine raiders were treating the women and girls with casual brutality, but the little boys, who were allowed to run free, were being indulged, even petted and spoiled. Any time that a boy made any kind of overture toward a Wolverine fighter, it was immediately reciprocated with a smile, a pat, a treat, and already a few of the boys were trotting at the heels of some of the men, looking up at them fearlessly. Of course, they took these boys to make them into future Wolverine fighters, and the campaign to win their loyalty began the moment they left their own village. Brutal they may be, but they are not stupid. Those boys would respond to the petting and spoiling just like any child of that age. In six months, they would be strutting around and imitating the warriors' contempt for the women, even their own mothers. In a year, they would belong to Wolverine. He wondered what the others were thinking, if they had seen what he had and knew what it meant. This was a harvest of breeders and future warriors. The women were no more nor less than walking wombs, valued only for what they could produce. Whether the Wolverine fighters treated the women of their own tribe any better remained to be seen, but Darion had an idea that they might. Putting their own women higher in the social scheme gave them an extra set of guardians for their captives— Making the captive women the slaves to their own women virtually ensured that every Wolverine woman would regard the slaves as property rather than as a fellow. The only reason we defeated Bloodbear was that they underestimated us. The only reason that Bloodbear is no more is that they made stupid mistakes. All the evidence pointed to one thing. Wolverine was of the same ilk as Bloodbear had been but they had paid attention to all the things that Bloodbear had done wrong, and that made them all the more dangerous. Kel was doing everything but frothing at the mouth with rage. He paced, he snapped his beak, he mantled his wings, he bristled his crest. Just one, he hissed, tearing up the sod with his four talons. Let me have just one, Darion. 
Kel had been like this since he landed. He wanted to launch an attack on the raiding party right now. No planning, no waiting, no thinking about it. He could not bear what he had seen and wanted to fix it. After all, he was Kelvrin, the brave, fierce Silver Griffin. He should be able to fix all of these things by shredding those responsible for them. Keisha had all of her shields up and still felt the heat of his anger blazing against them. She just hoped that time and Darion's soothing would calm him down. Right now, no one was arguing with him. They were just letting him vent his emotions, agreeing, when confronted, that it was a horrible situation and should not be allowed to continue. Hywell was as angry as Kel, but was handling it better. He was white around the eyes and mouth, but hadn't said or done much. "'Why aren't you frothing at the mouth?' Keisha asked him quietly. "'Because it would not do good,' he replied, with a maturity she had not expected. She might have forgotten that he was a native of these parts, but he hadn't, and he was well aware of the harsh reality of life here in the north. Darion is right. We are too few to do anything. But he didn't complete the thought. He looked back along the trampled underbrush where the party of captives had passed, and anger flitted over his face. Perhaps he was well aware of the harsh realities of life up here, but that didn't mean he was inured to them. Or this is beyond what even he is used to. Shandi had one hand on Carlos's shoulder, and Keisha guessed that she was sharing her thoughts with her companion. Winter Sky and Steelmind were impassive, and Keisha could not guess what was going on behind their masks. These aren't our people, she reminded herself. I am sure that they care, but we can't help the captives. But she had an idea, and it might take Kel's mind off his anger, or at least give him an acceptable outlet for it. Shouldn't we... she began. Kel stopped tearing the helpless grass, and all eyes turned toward her. She swallowed, looking up into Kel's golden glare. Shouldn't we go back that way? She pointed in the direction from which Wolverine had come. After all, the trail was clear enough. There may be people where they came from that need help. There may be survivors. They stared at her in silence for a moment. Then Kel leaped into the air without another word, powering purposefully upward, but remaining below the canopy of the mammoth trees so that he could follow the trail. There seemed nothing else more appropriate to do, so without further discussion, the rest of the party mounted up and followed in his wake. Keisha heaved a sigh of relief, which no one but her Daihili noticed. A bit difficult for you, are they, healer? he asked dryly. Not the easiest lot to deal with. She snorted. He knew as well as she the kinds of strain all those angry people were putting on her shields. Not that she wasn't angry, but perhaps because she was a healer, she'd learned to be pragmatic. You couldn't save every patient, although you tried. You couldn't solve every problem, though you did your best. She knew from the moment that she saw all the armed fighters that there was nothing they could do for the prisoners— much as she and everyone else would like to. Turning their attention to something they could do something about had been the one thing she could do about the situation. She was just glad that her attempt at redirection had worked for Kel. He needed an outlet, a constructive outlet, before he flew off and did something foolish. Now she steeled herself for what they would find at the end of the trail of trampled vegetation— Whatever it was, she knew that it would surely put a different set of stresses on them all. It was dusk when they reached the village that they would later learn belonged to the Red Fox tribe, a group that long ago had split from Snow Fox. Kel had gotten there long before, had given them a grim summary of what they would find when they got there, then flew off on a mission of his own, and an important one, second only to the healing Keisha would be doing when she arrived. Kel went hunting, 
for there was nothing left to eat in the village, and at the moment no one capable of hunting or gathering. Absolutely nothing edible of any kind had been left. The village had been scoured right down to the spices. Even leather, curing hides, and scraped skins had been taken. They did not need to follow the trail to find the village. The wailing of women led them there. But there was no heavy scent of smoke, for the raiders had not troubled themselves with burning any of the log houses. It was not their intention to leave the survivors without shelter, because it was not their intention that all of the survivors should die. It had been candle marks since the raiders hit this place, long enough for the women to gather their dead and lay them out for mourning on a single rough pyre, long enough for the wounded to receive the rough tending that was all a tribe without a shaman could give them. The shaman, much younger than the shaman of Snow Fox, had been laid out with the rest of the dead by his wives, who were the source of the wailing. The rest of the women were too numb for anything but silent mourning, and at a single glance Keisha knew they had their own internalized wounds to deal with. No one had touched the shaman's three wives, possibly for fear of a curse, but by the condition of the other women, clothing torn, faces bruised, and the vacant look of someone who has endured too much, they had not shared this protection. Forewarned by Kel, Keisha was armored against their pain, emotional and physical, as the group rode into the village. Hywell preceded them afoot, calling to the survivors that help was coming. By the time the rest rode in, it was too dark for the northerners to see what they were riding, which probably spared them the fear that would have come when they saw the unfamiliar mounts. They had already endured too much, and even a little more fear might well push them over the edge of sanity. Keisha left the organization of the survivors to the others, and went straight to work on the most seriously wounded, concentrating only on pure healing with her gift. Shandi and Carlos supported her, lending her new strength and energy when hers faltered. Then, when they were exhausted, Darion took their place. It was very, very late when she finished with the last woman. The moon was high overhead, though obscured by thick clouds, and all she wanted to do was eat and sleep, not necessarily in that order. She blessed the darkness that hid the ravaged village, with no fires outside tonight, and all of the inhabitants drugged into a semblance of sleep in their own homes. There was finally a measure of peace in this shattered place. Darion led her into a log house, which by the trappings had belonged to the shaman. When they entered, and all three of the shaman's wives descended on them, pressing food rations, venison, and a hot herbal drink on her, she was too tired to be surprised, but she was very grateful. The women left them at the hearth fire where the others had gathered, including the Daihili, Carlos, and Kel, which did surprise Keisha, Kel most of all. What are you doing here? she asked, staring at him stupidly. The folk of Red Fox are not inclined to treat a gift bringer as an enemy, he replied simply, and left it at that. Judging by the fact that all of the party were eating chunks of well-roasted venison, Kell's gifts had been generous indeed. What can you tell me? she asked, knowing by Darion's rigid expression that he had learned far more than he really wanted to know. Darion's voice was tight with suppressed rage as he answered. This wasn't just a raid, he said. They hit this place at dawn. They took out all the sentries just before they were going to be replaced by the dawn crew, then hit the village itself. When they had taken the village, they started harvesting. She was startled alert by the odd word. Harvesting? she asked incredulously. He nodded, his lips white with anger, a vein in his temple throbbing. 
The warriors that survived, they crippled. Or didn't you notice all the missing index fingers on their bow hands? They did the same to the older boys, so they couldn't possibly grow up to be warriors. Without an index finger, they can't pull a bow or use a sword. But harvesting? she repeated. You were healing them. You know the secret wounds they had in common. The invaders did their best to make certain that every woman here would be left pregnant, regardless of her age. The ones that still had husbands were left behind. The ones that had infants were left behind with their babies, and girls too young to breed. The rest were taken, along with the older girls and younger boys, as you saw. They took every scrap of food and anything that was valuable, but they left the bare essentials and they left the houses intact. She actually heard his teeth gritting as he snarled silently. They intend to come back, Keisha. They intend to come back as soon as these people have started to recover. They'll take girls old enough to breed and young boys and strip the place again. And they'll keep coming back. As long as there is anything left of Red Fox. These are not our people, Darion, Steelmind said, in that slow, deliberate way of his. We have already done more than they would expect from an ally. She reached for his hand and clasped it as he controlled his temper. Kel hung his head wearily. The griffin was just as angry, but they all knew that Steelmind was only telling the truth. We've done more than our share, Shandi added, her voice flat. Remember why we're here. It's not to fight a war with people who don't even know we exist. It's to look for danger to Valdemar and find your parents, Darion. If we take the time to get involved in this, we may never do those things. He didn't answer. He didn't have to. Keisha felt his upset, even though her shields were up and tight, as a sick feeling in her stomach and a dry lump in her throat. No one else said anything. There didn't seem to be much that anyone could say. Eventually they all went to their sleeping rolls in silence, but Darion held her very tight for a long, long time and she cradled him, projecting peace, until he relaxed and finally slept. But the only reason she slept was because she was too tired not to. She was the first to wake the next day, and after a sketchy meal that she ate only because she needed the energy, went straight to her patients. They were doing better than she had any reason to expect. The women had mustered the tattered remains of their courage and were tending to the wounded men. Each man had his own wife taking care of him, and usually at least one other woman as well. It occurred to Keisha that this might be in self-defense. Wolverine had not taken the wives of any man who lived through the raid, so obviously the best way to keep from getting taken was to become someone's second or third wife. But whatever their motives, they were working as hard as the real wives, which was giving the wounded men some excellent care. The shaman's widows had fired the funeral pyre and were chanting and drumming the farewell to the dead. They might not be wise women themselves, but they knew the ceremonies, and no one was going to dispute their right to see that the dead were properly taken care of. All three of them sat on the upwind side, two playing a large drum, the third playing a counterpoint on a smaller drum. Whatever they had built the pyre out of, it had gone up like an oil-soaked torch, and was burning hotly with very little smoke. Keisha was very glad that the village was upwind of the pyre, as it was the unmistakable too sweet scent of burning flesh made her stomach lurch, and she had to fight her breakfast back down. Slowly, the tribe of Red Fox was reclaiming its village and its life. 
A few children had recovered enough spirit to play a counting game quietly together, and the prepubescent girls were restoring order to the open spaces between the log houses by the simple expedient of throwing anything that was of no use into a rubbish pile and dividing the rest among themselves. There wasn't a great deal to divide. Although the raiders hadn't taken common clothing and domestic utensils, that was about all that they had left. Finished furs and trade goods in the storehouses were gone, as were show blankets, weapons, and every bit of dried meat and fish. The women had been too traumatized to go out gathering, and the stocks of perishable foods hidden away was low. Unless the remaining men could recover enough to hunt soon— they would be starving in a matter of weeks. As Keisha made her rounds, she noticed Shandi and Carlos watching the villagers thoughtfully, as if they were making some kind of assessment. Shandi glanced over at her once, but said nothing, so Keisha left her to her thoughts and continued taking care of the wounded. She finished around noon and returned to the shaman's house. The pyre was nothing but embers now, for which she was very grateful, and the widows had thrown great heaps of green cedar, white sage, and juniper on the coals. The scented smoke had overcome the stench of the pyre. A line of gutted deer carcasses hung upside down by their rear hooves in the trees just outside the shaman's house. Kel and some of the others must have been very busy this morning. Ordinarily, it wasn't like Kel or the Taledras to take out an entire herd of deer, but under the circumstances, it was the right thing to do. Maybe Red Fox won't starve, she thought with a little more hope. This looks like enough to keep them going for a while. Shandi met her at the door as she approached, stopping her with a look. How long do you think that will last? she asked, nodding toward the line of carcasses. Keisha counted the deer, made a quick mental estimate of the number of people left and how much they would need to eat, added a bit more for generosity, and said, About a fortnight? Shandi nodded and sucked on her lower lip for a moment. That was what I figured. How long before most of the injured can hunt for themselves? About a fortnight? Pretty much, she said truthfully, wondering what Shandi was thinking. I've got them about half healed. If we left now, it would be about a fortnight before they could do anything strenuous. There was something going on in her sister's mind, but what? Darion pushed the blanket over the door aside and joined them, looking sharply at Shandi. What's on your mind? he asked abruptly, the same question Keisha had. These people used to be in Snow Fox, Shandi told him. They split off about three generations ago, but they're still a Snow Fox sept. Netta can put the directions to Snow Fox right into the heads of as many people as we need to. We can leave them with enough food to get them healed up, and they can make it to safety before anyone from Wolverine comes checking on them. There's your solution. Keisha heaved a sigh of relief as the tension eased out of Darion. There's our solution, he agreed, nodding, the worry lines in his forehead smoothing out. They won't burden themselves down with possessions because they don't have any to speak of. Snow Fox has to take them in. They're related. There's nothing keeping them here, so I doubt they'll make any objections. But let me check and see what Hywell thinks. Keisha went back into the log house while Shandi, Carlos, and Darion went over to the butchering area where Hywell was working to turn the deer into strips of jerked meat. She ate without tasting what she was eating, stayed a moment to rest, then went back to her patients. Now she had helpers, helpers who were dealing with their own pain by giving themselves something to think about besides their own ordeals, and they were very good at obeying her directions. She gave the same instructions so many times she could recite them without thinking about it. 
Wash your hands in water that's been boiled and cooled. Pull the dressing off carefully. Don't touch the wound with your hands. Sprinkle the mold powder on the wound. Check for the signs of infection. Take a new dressing that's been washed and boiled. Rebandage the wound. One man had the start of an infection. She used the occasion to call all the women together to give them a lesson in what infection looked like and how to deal with it. If they aren't wise women, they'll certainly have half the training by the time this is over. By nightfall, she was as exhausted as she had been the previous night. But when she returned to the group around the fire in the log house, the mood there was so much more cheerful that she nearly wept with gratitude. She didn't, but she quietly basked in the positive feelings while she ate, listening to the discussions of what to do to prepare Red Fox for the journey. The shaman's widows joined in the discussion, not with animation, but with a determination that surprised and pleased her. They were ready to leave now, and anything they could do to hasten the date of departure would be dealt with. Netta already gave Gwynver, Rhynan, and Daedron the directions to Snow Fox, Darion told her in an aside during a pause in the discussion. They're going to tell the rest of the tribe tomorrow that their husband and the Red Fox spirit came to them in a dream tonight. The Red Fox turned white, and their husband showed them the way to their allies. Nobody will argue with that, Hywel agreed, looking more like his old self. And who knows? Tonight it might well happen that way. If I were the Red Fox, I would certainly choose to do that for my people." "'Young man,' called one of the three women, who was certainly no older than Hywel, in an imperious tone. "'Tell me again where in the stream to place the fish trap?' Hywel rolled his eyes, but turned back to her with all the deference due that rare woman who ranked higher than a young warrior, and the conversation resumed. Keisha leaned against Darion and closed her eyes. There was no more tension in the air. Even Kel was satisfied with the solution. No longer having to keep her shields reinforced, she relaxed further. Then she heard the word sleep in a Dihili mind voice, and the next thing she knew, Darion was putting her into her sleeping roll. She murmured her thanks, and unable to even get her eyes open, gave up and fell back into dreamless slumber.